Hi, welcome to the CSS Zero to Hero course. In this course, you're going to completely learn how to use CSS from the ground up. We're going to cover every single concept or every major concept in CSS and really build up our knowledge of it. So before we move on, I just wanted to give you some motivation uh, on what you're going to be doing in this course so you can you know, really get uh, excited about the course and start jump. You just jump straight into learning. So first of all, let's look at some of the stuff that we've done over the course. Now we start with a base website and over time we style this and change up the website using every technique that we've learned. So you can see that we've created multiple grids, colors, we've changed this completely and transformed the website in every single way. We've also created things like gradients and we've also styled, changed our custom fonts, colors and backgrounds. We cover all of this in depth throughout the course and we do it step by step so that you don't rush through and forget anything. At the end of the course, there's also a little challenge here where you try to bring all your skills together and style the website from scratch. Now, there is a solution video if you need it. Maybe you just want to see uh, another opinion on it. But pretty much, you're going to bring all the skills you learned in this course together and create this nice website. It's responsive, it's got all sorts of layout features, and it also has animations. You can see just like that. So. That's some of the actual website stuff we're going to be doing in the course, but why don't we look at some of the code that we've written. So I created this file from the start. I didn't have it at the start of this course, but at the end, you can see that we've written now well over a hundred lines of code here. And I, although it may look intimidating now, I do explain every single part of it so that at the end, you can just read this straight away and understand what's going on in an instant. There's also the styling for our solution video or for the solution to the challenge here. So you can see we've got a bunch of stuff here. And like I said, it may look confusing, but once we move on, this will make a lot more sense. So that's pretty much it for the little achievements video for this course. I hope you're a little bit motivated and excited to go forward and start learning about CSS. It's a pretty exciting topic and it can really advance your web development if you don't already know it. All right, let's get straight into it. So in this video, I'm going to be giving a quick introduction to the syllabus of the course. Now it is quite a long video. So um, if you don't want to watch it, or if you don't really want to know an in-depth analysis on what the course is going to be covering, then you can go ahead and skip this video. All I say is that please make sure that you read the prerequisites lecture um, that came before this. Now, there are some very important details in there and some skills that you need to know to move on with this course. And if you don't know them, you're going to have a very difficult time picking up some of the language. Now, there's only one real prerequisite, uh, which is HTML, but you can go ahead and read that and um, just make sure that you have all the skills necessary. All right, so let's get started. Now, the first thing I want to talk about is the section structure. So the section is just a, it's a bunch of lectures. So these are video lectures uh, and, in, and they're made in an interactive way. So you can see in this picture here, I am coding along with a nice preview on the side showing what, um, what our progress looks like. So at the end of each section is a 10, a 10 question multiple choice quiz that covers all of the skills learned in that section. So it's really encouraged to go and just try it out and see if you know everything. And then that way you can diagnose yourself and see maybe there's some skills that you're fuzzy on or you need to revisit. And on top of that, I really encourage everyone who is following along in the course to not just watch and be a passive consumer, you know, really go out and try and use your skills because other, you're not going to learn it the otherwise. You're just going to end up having the information on your head. And especially when it comes to development, programming, um, you know, experience is everything. You can't just watch lectures and um, just magically be able to do it. So I encourage you to go off and follow the lectures and try and really use the skills that you learn in your own time. And that will make sure that you have the highest retention possible. 
So let's get straight into it. The first section, which is the section we're in right now, is the introductory section. So setting up the course, and we also install all the programs and software necessary to set up our working environment. So you can follow along, it's not necessary, but it is highly recommended because um, if you're using maybe something else that you're not experienced with, you may have a hard time getting used to the program and things like that. So I recommend you follow along and set up the environment just like I do. So the second question, uh, oh sorry, the second section is the introduction to CSS. Now, unlike the first section, this is going to be looking at introducing the actual CSS um, language. We're going to be looking at some theory behind it, where it's used, and what kind of a difference it makes. We're also going to be looking at creating and linking our own CSS document to our page. So the third section is going to be looking at our first real part of CSS. So these are the selectors and properties. Now again, you don't need to know any of these terms. I'm just going over like a kind of a spitball kind of effect here, just trying to just skim over everything. So here we're gonna learn about a very important uh, concept, which are selectors and properties, and how they really play into CSS. We're also gonna be learning about the different types of selectors and where to use each one, uh, depending on the situation. So you're gonna learn that as well. Next section is where we start using the real power uh, of CSS. So we're going to start using colors and we're going to be applying those colors to our page. So we're going to be learning about different color types, how kind of a little bit of how colors are set up on the computer. So things like RGB, um, other color codes, and then we're going to use them and apply them using CSS to backgrounds and text and all sorts of other things. The next section is going to be looking at mainly at text. So we're going to be looking at trying to change the feel, style, and look of text. So we're going to be changing the fonts, the size. We're also going to be changing the bolding. There are so many different things that you can do in this section, and we're going to cover all of them then. So the next section is where we kind of take a turn from looking at styling and looking now at layout. So we're going to be learning some more fundamental CSS concepts related to layout. Uh, we'll talk about those when we get to it. Then we're going to be applying them to actually change the style or the layout of our page. So we're going to be moving items around. We're going to resize them and do all sorts of things with them once we get to that point. The next section we're going to look at is called Flexbox. Now, I'm sure you've heard of this if you've looked into any web development, but pretty much it's an alternate way to mess around with the layout in CSS. And it is quite new, um, but it is a pretty uh, commonly used concept today, especially for responsive layouts, making websites that can work on all devices. So it's a pretty important concept there. So we're going to focus on the theory behind Flexbox first, talking about how it works, how it's set up, and then we're also going to be applying it to real life, talking about, um, you know, where it can be used, some of the benefits, and then actually um, using it in our own uh, project by creating our own Flexbox and messing around with it. So we're going to do that as well. So the next section is pl pretty similar to section seven. It's going to be looking at another uh, alternative to using normal layout features in CSS. It's called grid. And there are a lot of similarities, but we're also going to be talking about the differences. So along with going over comp a comprehensive uh, overview of kind of how grid works, we're also going to be going over some of the similarities and differences, kind of comparing it to Flexbox. And then we're going to talk about, you know, which one you should use in each individual situation. So the next section is probably one of my favorites because it really um, puts all of the older kind of websites from the new sites and separates them, the modern sites from the old sites. And we're going to be looking at animations and transitions. So first we're going to look at transitions and how to use pseudo selectors. Again, don't worry about that what it means uh, to create these nice smooth transitions. And then we're also going to be learning how to manipulate them. So kind of change how a transition looks. We're also going to learn how to create, apply, and manipulate our own animations. So we create these animations from scratch using CSS, and then we can kind of uh, change them and change how they look based on what we want. So the last section is a really interesting section, which kind of summarizes everything and tests your skills. So it starts with a 30 question final exam, which is a bunch of questions from every single section or topic that we've covered. And it is, um, it is a final exam, so uh, there is like a passing grade and everything like that. But again, if you fail, there's no real consequences to it. 
Um, it's just kind of a diagnostic tool to test where you are uh, in your CSS knowledge. And after that, it's followed by a really nice challenge, which can help you, um, you know, really see where you're at, not from a theoretical standpoint, but from an actual practical standpoint. So this challenge is going to be talked about later in, once you get to that point. But pretty much you're going to be styling a website from scratch. You're going to be given a blank HTML document or, well, it's not blank. It's going to have content, but you're going to be given an HTML document with no styling and you have to style it yourself based on a list of, um, based on a list of tasks given in the document. Now, don't worry too much about that, but pretty much there is a solution video that I created to style it based on how I want the website to look. But again, it's not kind of like an iron fist thing. You can go and be creative with it once you get to that point. Because once you learn all that CSS, what's the point if you just have to conform to something? You can really unleash your creative freedom through CSS once you learn all the skills necessary. So again, it will be talked about in a lot more detail once we get to that point. But for now, that's just a quick overview of what it's going to look like um, from here. All right, so there's a quick uh, overview of what the course is going to go over, some of the topics. Now, again, this isn't a, you know, uh, kind of a strict video on, you know, this is what we're going to learn. And if you don't learn it, that's it. Uh, it's just kind of showing you what you're going to be getting out of the course so that you can uh, really get a view into it before you start uh, working on the course. All right, let's get started. So in this video, I'm just going to be talking about some of the software that we're going to be using in this course. Now, there's not a lot of actual software since most of the stuff we're going to be doing is built straight into CSS and HTML, but we do need a text editor. And if you want to go ahead and use Notepad, go ahead. But I wouldn't really recommend that because it is quite um, hard to use when you're developing things. So I recommend this text editor right here. It's called Sublime Text. It gives you all of the color coding and formatting that you need. It makes things really easy for you. So you can go ahead to the website here. It's attached to the lecture resources. If you go ahead and click in the top left corner uh, in the bullet list icon, uh, you can go ahead and find the lecture contents and downloadable resources. So go ahead, check out this website. And depending whether you're on Windows or Mac or Linux, you go ahead and download this. And yeah, that should be pretty much it. So this is what it's going to look like when you're inside. I was just typing a little bit of stuff here, making things, making sure things were working. So there you go. This is what it's going to look like. Uh, once you download it, we'll go through and actually set everything up as we go through this course. All right, let's move on. So before we move on, I just want to talk about finding project files. Now, I do do a lot of code throughout each lecture. And if you want to keep track of those or maybe have some sort of working reference of what's going on, then I highly recommend that you go and check out the GitHub repository um, that I created for all the content of this course. Now, if you don't know what Git is or how to use it, don't worry. Uh, I'm going to show an alternative to that in just a second uh, using this platform. But pretty much this is going to contain all the history of every single lecture. Now, if you know how to use Git, you can download this and check out each state. But if you don't know, then all you have to do is head over to the main page. And right here under commits, it's pretty much going to show um, every single lecture change. So for example, I have seven to eight item alignment. So I can click on it. And when I click on this, it shows all of the changes. I have um, made to both files or any files that I've changed. So for example, you can see here, it has one changed file and you can see I've added a bunch of stuff here. So you can kind of review what I've done over the lecture. So you can just go ahead and check it out. I've attached this to the lecture resources. If you want to go and look at it now, um, this does contain all of the uh, history, all of the things that I've done uh, over the course. So you can go review, maybe look at the code and you can also download it. Um, you can download the actual file or the uh, the uh, repository from here. So you can just download that very easily. And other than that, you can find all of the project files on here if you ever need them. So uh, if you want to, you know, maybe bookmark this or keep this somewhere on a notepad, just to make sure that you have a reference of it throughout the course in case you ever want to uh, go and review the contents or changes of some lecture, you will have it there. All right, let's move on. 
So today I'm going to be giving a quick introduction to CSS. We're going to be going through uh, what it actually is, why it's used, and what actually does CSS do. So before we get started, um, if you're just starting out this course and you don't really know the prerequisites, make sure that you do have a little bit of HTML experience. It's not recommended, uh, sorry, it's not needed, uh, but it's highly recommended because we're going to be using a lot of HTML in this course. And although we're not going to be writing any directly, it would be really helpful to know some. So I do offer a free HTML course. It's really quick, one and a half hours, and you should be go good to go and up and running in just one or two days. So if you don't know any HTML, you can go and check that out. And if you do know HTML, continue watching along. So first of all, let's get started. What actually is CSS? So if you don't know what it stands for already, it's called Cascading Style Sheet. So from that name, you can pretty much assume that this is used to style websites. So unlike HTML, which is used to create structure and actual website content, this is mainly used to give it that visual flair to make the websites look good. So CSS is pretty much what makes a website stand out from websites from the early days, from the two, early 2000s. Uh, and things like that. So that's what really makes uh, a website stand out is the CSS or the styling. So this pretty much goes hand in hand with HTML. As it's said here, they work almost consistently together and they're always used all like all the time together. So let's go ahead and check out some pages that look with CSS and without. So you can see here that this is the page with CSS. So you can change all of the layout options. You can make fonts, font changes, text manipulation, all sorts of things, which we're all going to be doing in this course or learning to do. And then this is the website without HTML. Uh, sorry, without CSS. Looks pretty standard, right? Obviously, this looks just like a normal website that doesn't have any HTML apart from some font changes. But you can see that the difference that something like this makes. CSS will completely change the way a website looks if it's used correctly. So the next slide is just a little bit of uh, information about CSS. We're going to be going way more in depth into all of these points later. So a CSS file is saved in the .css format. We're going to be doing that in the next few videos. Uh, there's some information about selectors and things like that. Like I said, you can just read through this. I'm not going to go through it because we're going to talk about it way more in detail uh, in the next few sections. But for now, this is just a little bit of general information about CSS. All right, so now that you know what CSS is, why don't we go ahead and get started working with CSS. So in this video, we are going to be creating and linking a CSS style sheet. So we're not actually going to be doing with anything with it yet. We're just going to be creating it and linking it so that we can get started and actually learn some of the properties in CSS. All right, let's get started. So the first thing I want to do is go ahead and create my CSS file. So what I'm going to do is go into my Sublime Text or my text editor. Now, if you're not using this and you know how to use the other text editor that maybe you're using some something else like Visual Studio, go ahead and use that if you know all the shortcuts. But for now, I am going to use Sublime Text. So in Sublime Text, to create a new file, you go Control or Command N, depending on what operating system you're on. Once you're there, you can use Control S to go ahead and save the file. And right now I'm here. And what I want to do is create a new folder, a new directory in my course content folder. Again, you can set this up however you like, but the way I like doing it is creating a folder for every type of file so that, for example, when the website gets very big, when you have multiple pages, multiple style sheets, uh, everything stays organized. So I'm going to go ahead and create that directory go ahead into my CSS folder here, and I'm going to name this style.css. So .css is the file format used to save CSS documents, and style is just kind of the standard name you use when you're saving CSS documents. So once I go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and save that, now I have my style sheet created. But we don't actually have anything yet, because right now our HTML page is blank and our CSS file is blank. So this is where knowing a little bit of HTML comes in handy. First of all, I'm going to go ahead and create my boilerplate. I just typed in HTML and hit tab. Uh, again, I talk all about this in uh, my other courses talking about HTML. But there we go. We're going to go ahead and do that. I'm just going to say my website here. And once that's done, I'm going to go ahead and link it. So how do we actually do this? Well, what you want to do pretty much is just go into here and into your head, into the head portion of your website. 
you're going to go ahead and create a link tag. So if you just type link and hit tab in Sublime Text, it's going to create the tag for you. So let's go ahead and break this down here. Rel style sheet is pretty much saying that we're linking to a style sheet, but then type says it's a CSS style sheet. So this is just kind of a more specific identifier. And then we have the href. So in the href, this is where we're going to put uh, the URL to our style sheet. So if you don't already know how to write file URLs, uh, pretty much what we're going to do is first up move back a directory because right now we're inside here and there's no CSS. We want to go back to the top level. So I'm going to go dot dot slash. And now remember we're up here. I want to go into CSS. So I hit CSS slash and then style dot CSS, which is our endpoint. It's our final destination. So this is pretty much your basic link tag. This is how it works. You have all of your stuff here and you created it. And from there you can go ahead and pretty much do whatever you want. So right here, um, I have my style sheet linked and everything's working. Um, but we don't actually know if it works yet. So in the next video, we're actually going to be going through and testing our style sheet. I'm going to so show you a few ways that you can do that. All right, let's move on. So today I'm going to be showing you how you can test your CSS style sheets. So we've already created the file and linked it, but now we're actually going to go ahead and test it because we don't know if this is working or not. So obviously we don't know anything about CSS yet. We don't know about selectors or properties or how to do anything with them. But I just want you to keep this in mind so that when you know how to do them, it becomes very easy to test these style sheets. So for a style sheet to work, we need all of the properties that are in this file to appear on the page. So the easiest way we can test it is just by writing a random obvious property that's going to change the way the website looks. If it's not working, then we know that something's wrong with our link. So I'm going to go ahead and just create a property here. Now, you don't know how to do any of this. Uh, so don't worry about it. We're going to learn how to do all of this later. But what you want to do pretty much is just create a random property. You can go ahead and copy this on for now. I'm going to go ahead and refresh the page and you can see that this is bright red. Now, if I go ahead and make the link wrong, so if I, for example, remove a letter, you can see that it's still white, which means that this isn't working. So this is pretty much the easiest way that you can test your style sheet if it's working. It's just writing some random obvious properties. Don't make them completely non-visible. You want to make sure that you can actually see the difference on the page. And then you want to go ahead and refresh it. And if it's working, you will know that the style sheet is linked properly. All right, let's move on. So in this video, I'm going to be talking about CSS selectors. I'm also going to be going through what they do and what types of selectors there are. So you're probably wondering what a selector actually is because we haven't actually talked about this at all. And it's pretty much one half of everything that you do in CSS. So as you know, you have two different documents. You have your HTML document, which is kind of your structure, gives all of the different text and content of the page. And then you have your CSS document, which is going to be for all the styling. Now, because the two documents are kind of disconnected, you can't just go and type random things and have them appear where you want them. You need a way to actually assign these styles and properties to elements on the page. So the, we do this with something called selectors. So a selector is pretty much a way of grabbing an element from an HTML document and then styling it. So it's kind of like a target in a way. There are many different types of selectors and they all work in different ways and are used for different purposes. So I'm going to be going through three with you in this uh, video. So the first one is the element selector. The element selector is the most basic of all of them. Pretty much what you do is you find the name of the tag that you want to select or target. So in this case, it would be the paragraph tag or the P tag. And then you have the selector here. So pretty much how a selector works is you just type out the selector and then you have curly braces and then you have your properties. We'll go with, we'll go with this in much more depth uh, towards the end of this section. So you go through and you select, uh, you type out your tag name and pretty much what that's going to do is select all of the elements on the document with that tag name. So there we go. That is the first one. The next is the class selector. So the class selector is very similar to the uh, element selector, except it goes by class name. So you can see here that we have some class attributes here where we assign the class. Don't worry, we'll go through with this uh, in the next video. But you can see we assign the class to these values 
And pretty much all we have to do to reference this is type dot, which is the class uh, prefix for CSS, and then the name of the class, and then again, the properties. So you can actually use this, uh, the reason that we use classes over things like uh, element selectors is because you can apply this class to specific items and it's only going to style those specific items. So for example, maybe if you had a subtitle uh, and you only wanted to style that subtitle, you would go through and actually uh, apply that class to your subtitle, your element, whether it's a paragraph or a header. And from there, you're going to go through and add it. So there we go. The next one I want to talk about is the ID selector. So these two, uh, the class and the ID selector are pretty much identical. You have your attribute where you assign the class or ID, but the only difference is the prefix here is a, a hash symbol or an octothorpe or hashtag. So then you type out the name of the ID and it puts it here. Now I am going to go through and actually talk more about why, when we should use classes and IDs, and I'm going to talk about some of the differences between them. And although they look very similar, we actually have different, very different purposes for them, um, based on how you use them in your HTML document. So those are some of the basics of selectors. Like I said, we're going to go through and pretty much use this all the time during our course. So we're going to go through, use them and add the properties. So it's pretty good that you get familiar with these now so that when we move on, this becomes kind of like second nature. So in this video, I am going to be teaching you how to, uh, how to add classes and IDs to our document here and actually start using some of these selectors. Now, I'm not going to teach you any of the properties yet because we're going to cover that in a little bit later in this section and in the next few sections, but I'm just going to be teaching you how to get familiar with classes and IDs because they are by far the most commonly used uh, selectors in CSS. I mean, sometimes, very uncommonly, you would see some element selectors and uh, other types of selectors, which we're going to go over in the next few videos, but the two most common that you're going to see are, L uh, are classes and IDs. So let's go through and get started. Now I have a bunch of HTML content here. We're actually going to be using this and adding on to it for the rest of the course. We're going to be styling this website fully. Uh, but let's actually go through and start adding these classes and IDs. So the first thing you need to note uh, before we move on is that classes and IDs are different. You can't just use them interchangeably. And I'm going to explain why in the next video, but for now, let's just pretend that they are the same and we can use them interchangeably because they have almost the same methods of application. So let's go ahead. Now, the first thing you want to do is identify the element that you want to target. So first of all, let's just say I wanted to maybe make the color of this red. Okay. So the color of this title. Now that we know we've targeted it, we want to actually go through and edit it. So first thing, how do you think we would go through and do this? Now, if you were thinking going through and adding an element selector or maybe adding some inline styles, if you know what that is, then you are right partially. But the only problem is that if there are any other H1s on this page, then it will style all of them as well. And because we only want to style this title, that wouldn't be really effective. So the best way to do this would be to use a class or an ID. I'm going to go ahead and use a class. So the way, the way you would do this is go through and type in class as your attribute. And you would again put this into the opening tag of whatever target element you want to style. And in here you're putting, you're going to put your class name. Now it, this isn't where you put your CSS prefix. This isn't where you put the dot as I explained in the last video. Here you're just going to type the name of the class. So I'm going to go through and type title just like that. And you can name this whatever you want, but I would recommend keeping it short and sweet. You don't want it to get too long because then uh, it's going to be really hard to work with. So once you've applied that and we go ahead and refresh the page, you can see that nothing's actually there. It hasn't started working yet. That's because we haven't applied any styles. So when we go over here, we need to actually select our element. So I'm going to go ahead and add the prefix for a class, which is dot, and then the name of the class, which is title. Then I'm going to open up these brackets and get started. So what I want to do here is now apply all my properties. I'm going to be explaining you to you how to do all of this in the next, uh, in future videos. Uh, but for now, all you need to know is that the first thing you need to do is select an element using some method, and then you're going to add the properties. So I'm going to go ahead and refresh the page 
And you can see it works just like that. Now to prove to you that this works, I'm actually going to go through and style just this about me right here, um, blue. So you can see we have more than one H2 on the page, but there's only one H1. Uh, but let's say we wanted to only style this, the about me, and we didn't want to style every single H2. What I would do is go ahead and add a class of subtitle to our target element. And then here I would select it just like that and give it its color. So you can go ahead and try this if you want. Uh, don't try and do anything crazy. Uh, if you know it, go ahead. But uh, for now, let's just go ahead and stick with that. And there you go, you can see we've styled that blue and it hasn't changed anything else. So that's working perfectly. It seems to be going fine and we're selecting everything. But what if we wanted to use IDs? So let's just say that this right here, this contact us, we wanted to use an ID for it. Now, for now, we don't actually know why we want to use an ID, but let's just pretend that we do know why. So what I would do is go ahead and use the ID attribute. So I'm going to go ahead and add that and I'm going to say contact dash us. Now usually in CSS uh, classes or IDs you would use these um, dashes right here instead of dots or uppercase or any other naming convention. Uh, this is just kind of the standard way to do it. Now in order to style it I can't just go ahead and do this. This wouldn't work. The reason being the prefix here is a dot so CSS would interpret this as a class and not an ID. Instead we're going to have to use our uh, octothorpe, our hash. Then why don't we go ahead and color this one green, okay? Let's go ahead and refresh the page and check this out. And you can see that it has this kind of olive green color. So it's working great. So there we go. You can see that we've worked with some of these selectors and applied some of our IDs. Now, you can go ahead onto the GitHub repository, pull it, download it, do whatever you want. Um, if you don't know how to use Git, I do have a free course on that as well, but, but it's very easy. You can go back to any state and time, check it out and play, uh, play around with these, try and replicate this and add your own classes and IDs and try and, you know, figure out how things work here. So yeah, that's pretty much the basics of adding classes and IDs. In the future, we're going to use some more complicated selectors, uh, which don't actually involve having to directly reference some of these. So those are going to get pretty complicated, but um, we're going to build up to that point. So let's move on. So in this video, I'm going to be talking about a very important concept in um, CSS. So this is a pretty important concept because it's pretty much going to change the way that you use selectors. Right now, we're just assuming that all of these selectors kind of work in, the sim in a similar way. We don't actually know why, they're, why they exist. I mean, why is there a class and an ID selector when they both do the same thing? So that's what I'm going to be explaining in this video. And it all comes down to one concept called specificity. So specificity is pretty much talking about the overriding or rewriting of properties in CSS. And it's pretty much this concept that different selectors are more powerful than others in a sense. So for example, if you had two selectors uh, on one element, one of them said the color was blue and one of them said the color was green. The, the more powerful or the more specific selector would end up overriding the other ones and uh, applying that property to the element. So there's this really helpful article here from W3Schools. Uh, if you need some more help on this or you don't really understand it, you can go ahead and read this. There's a lot of numbers involved like this, um, but you know, you can go ahead and read this, but I'm just going to explain it in word terms because these numbers tend to get really confusing and they end up meaning the same thing at the end of the day. So let's go ahead and get started. Now, I think it's really helpful if we start from the ground up. So I've removed all of the styling that we um, applied in the last video. So first of all, I'm going to go ahead and create an element selector. So on all H2s, I want the color to be blue. Or actually, I'm going to make it red. So there we go. Now we know that every single H2 is red. Okay. But let's just say for our about me right here, I'm going to add a class. Okay. And I'm going to call this about me and I'm going to add it to my H2. Now in my, in my styles here, I'm going to use the class selector and say the color is blue. So this is where we have a confliction. 
You can see that one selector says the color is red, but one selector says the color is blue. So what are we supposed to do about this? Which one do you think is going to prevail? I mean, you can't just have both red and blue at the same time. And you can see that blue is actually more specific. So you can see that elements or actually selectors have different powers. And the more powerful they are, the more specific they are, um, the higher they are, the higher they're going to be on the scale and the higher the chance of having or applying the right um, selector or property. So what we're going to do is actually go through and talk about the different powers or specificities or sp specifics of each selector and we're going to see which one is most powerful. So right now we know that the element selectors are less powerful than the class, but there is actually two more that are, are more powerful than the class selectors. So I'm going to go ahead and apply this about me class to another H2. Now I know it's not really going to make much sense. So I'm actually just going to rename it to subtitle. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and add this to services as well. Subtitle. There we go. Let's go ahead and refresh the page. Oh, whoops. Forgot to actually change the class name on the CSS file. There we go. So now we have two blue subtitles and one red. So you can see that the class will overwrite the header or sorry, the element tag. But there are, like I said, there are still two that are more powerful. The next after the class is the ID. So I'm going to go over here to services and add an ID of services. Whoops. Services. All right. Now what I'm going to do is go into my CSS file and use the ID selector color green. So I'm going to go ahead and refresh now and you can see that it's right here. It's green. So now that we know the ID is going to overwrite the class and the class is going to overwrite the header. So there is still one more that is more powerful and that is called inline styling. So we don't actually know what inline styling is, but pretty much we don't need to use a CSS file to do inline styling. All we need is the element and the HTML file. So why don't I go ahead and use services here because uh, we're kind of on a roll and I want to use this again. So what I'm going to do is say style, which is the attribute. And then in here we add all of our CSS properties, no selector, nothing. So I'm going to say here, the color is steel blue and we don't actually, um, steel blue is part of the CSS color collection. We'll explain all of those in future sections. So if I go ahead and refresh now, you can see that it is blue and it overrides the ID, the class and the header here. So pretty much there are, there's an order here that you need to take away from this video. Headers are the least specific. They kind of apply to everything and they're not that powerful. The class selector is above that. And then the ID and then the inline styling or the style attribute. So if you follow this order, you will pretty much, you can predict, what is going to be the outcome and which styles are going to be followed. So this is a pretty useful um, tool and in CSS and it pretty much allows you to structure your file in a way that makes sense to other people when they're reading it. But there's still one more question we need to answer. What's the difference between a class and an ID? Now, apart from the obvious specificity difference, we actually use classes and IDs in different situations and they're pretty simple. Classes are meant to be used multiple times. So if you have done any programming before, you'll know that a class is kind of like a blueprint. It's made so that you can create multiple objects from it. But the thing is, an ID is supposed to be only for one thing. It'll work for more than one, but the convention is you're only supposed to use an ID for one single element. So for example, let's take this file we have here. We have three subtitles and one for the about me section. In this structure, what we would do is create a subtitle class for every subtitle on the page. Then we'd apply it to it. Now, the reason we're doing this is because we can have multiple H2s on this page. So we only want to apply it to the subtitles. But then for our about me here, there's only going to be one of them on this whole document, which means we're going to use the ID of about me. And then from there, we can go and apply our styles and do all of that. So that's just the main difference between classes and IDs. And now that you know how to use them, you can actually go through and apply them properly uh, in real world scenarios. So that's just a very important thing to keep in mind. You're only supposed to use IDs once and classes can be used multiple times.
All right, let's move on. So in this video, I am, we are going to be looking at pseudo selectors. So this is a special type of selector that is used commonly uh, in interactivity with your website. So this is usually visible only when something is done on the website. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty cool feature and it's used very commonly throughout um, CSS. And once we get to the animations and uh, transitions part, we're actually going to be used pseudo, we be, we're going to be using pseudo selectors a lot. So let's get into it. Now there's a few pseudo selectors I want to cover here. Um, there's a lot of them, but I'm only going to be covering the main ones that are, we are going to be using. So before we go on, I'm just going to show you what a pseudo selector actually is. So usually what you would do is after a selector, you would add a colon and then the name of the pseudo selector. So this is just an example of one of them. And then the properties will apply normally. Now watch what happens when I hover over our H2 here you can see that it's working perfectly. And when we hover over it, it is turning red. Now, obviously it doesn't apply to this subtitle or the services part here, because again, these are uh, separate classes and obviously with specificity and everything like that, they won't apply. So there we go. We have everything working here and that's one of the pseudo selectors, which is hover. So let's move on to some of the next ones. Now there's also two that I'd like to talk about, which is first child and last child. So the concept behind child and parent elements is that right here, if we look, actually this is a little bit complicated example. Let's look at this unordered list here. We have an, a UL unordered list and then we have three LIs, okay? So pretty much this is going to be the first child because it's placed inside of the UL. The second is gonna be the second child and then this is going to be the third child. So you can see here that this is kind of the relationship between child and parent. And what we can actually do is specify which one we want to select. So if I go over here and select all ULs, and then of course the colon for the pseudo selector and select first child. Now I'm just going to say set the color to steel blue as well. Okay. So I'm going to refresh the page and you can see that it's not working. Now, although it might seem like you want to put the UL first, obviously, because Again, you're looking for the first child of the UL. This isn't actually how you're supposed to write it. Instead, you're supposed to write the element that you're trying to select, which in this case is our list item or our LI. So now if I go ahead and refresh the page, you can see that the first one here is going to be blue. It's a little bit of a confusing rule to get around, but once you get used to it, it becomes very easy. We can also change this to last or last child like this. And then what's going to happen is it's going to select the last one. Now there's also one more that I'd like to talk about quickly, which is nth child. So I'm just going to show you how this thing works. nth child, and then in brackets, you put the number here. So what you're going to put here is pretty much what number of the child you want to style. In this case, I want every second LI child to be colored steel blue. So throughout the page, every second LI that is inside of a that is a child element is going to be styled blue. Go ahead and refresh the page. You can see that works there. So there's actually one more um, uh, selector that I want to talk about, at least for children, and that is the only child selector. So I think it makes perfect sense. Pretty much what we're trying to look for is something that there is only one child inside of it. So for example, nothing on this page here actually has one child. But well, why don't we go ahead and add that? So under this list, I'm just going to temporarily remove these here, just like that. All right, let's go ahead and save, make sure it's working. There we go. Now what I'm going to do is go ahead and select this. So I'm going to say LI like that, and I'm going to say only child. So pretty much what this is saying is for every LI that is the only child of its parent. And you can see this, the UL, this only has one child. So I'm going to go ahead and give it a color of purple, for example, and you can see that it works perfectly. But what were to happen if I tried this on, let's just say, for example, the, um, the TDs here. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and add a new one, TD only child. And I'm also going to give this a color of purple, just like that. Now let's go ahead and refresh and see what's going on. All right. So you can see that that TD right here, it's somewhere in this uh, table, nothing's actually happening. 
That's because, as we can see here, there is nothing on this page where there's only one TD as a child. So that's just one thing to keep in mind. Sometimes pseudo selectors won't actually style anything if they don't exist. So there we go. That's pretty much for the basic uh, children kind of pseudo selectors. But let's move on to some other pseudo selectors. Now, there are selectors of this type that are actually specific to certain elements. And one of them is the anchor tag or the A tag. So I'm just going to go ahead and create an anchor tag under this H2 here. Oh, whoops. A. And I'm just going to give it a link or an endpoint of Google. So just like that. Okay, there we go. So in here, I'm just going to say click here to go to Google. Pretty simple A tag. Uh, hopefully everyone knows how to do this. There we go. We have our link there. So I click on it, takes me there. Pretty standard stuff. Now, we can actually create pseudo selectors for this. So I'm going to be giving you two for now. Now, there are many, many more, but these are the two main ones you need to focus on. The rest of them are kind of generalized, and these are the main uh, two that you're going to be using. So I'm going to create them here. And remember, you're using the element name. You can use the class if you want. It's not limited to uh, single element names. Actually, why don't I go ahead and do that? I'm going to give it an ID because, again, we only have one of these on the page. I'm going to give it an ID of Google link, just like that. So now I'm going to go ahead and reference that in here. So remember, it's just the name of the selector, Google dash link in this case, and then the colon. So here I'm going to go ahead and say link. Okay, so this is the first pseudo selector, and then there's also a second one. Now don't worry about what I'm typing for now. I'll explain both of these in just a second. All right, so let's look at the first one here, Google link link. Pretty much what this is saying is if you've ever been on a web page, you know that there is a difference between before you click on the link and after. There's kind of some stylistic changes. So that's where pseudo selectors actually come into play. The website has of those has those defined properties um, and they actually change the way that a link looks before and after it is clicked. So I'm going to go ahead and do it here. Link is the unvisited link, remember? So I'm going to go ahead and give it a color of blue. And then when it's clicked, I'm going to go ahead and give it a color of red. Sorry, I typed blue there. Remember, usually the default is that it is going to be um, purple, like this color here. Let's go ahead and refresh the page. You can see that it's actually red now. Now, obviously, I can't really go back in time and change the link so that it doesn't look clicked. But you can see how powerful this, these pseudo selectors are because you can do so many different things. And once we learn more properties, you can actually change different parts of the page and it becomes... Um, very powerful to use these pseudo selectors. So that's just one thing to keep in mind. All right, so there we go. We've covered most of the pseudo selectors. I'm actually going to go ahead and add that hover property there back in case anyone wants to use the project files. So there we go. We've covered everything here and we've added all of our pseudo selectors. So like I said, there's many more. I've linked a couple articles uh, that help you to look at all of the different pseudo selectors and most of them you're not really going to use very often. Um, they aren't useful in any way because they're usually you just use some basic pseudo selectors like hover and active, uh, which I haven't actually covered, but things like that. So you're not really going to use all of them, but I just wanted to give you an introduction to the main ones so that when it comes time to use them, uh, you have the tools to finish the job or create that effect that you've always wanted. All right, let's move on. Today, we're going to be looking at advanced selectors. So right now, we've looked at our basic selectors, so our class selectors, element selectors, and um, ID selectors. And we've also looked at some pseudo selectors, which is um, very useful. But now we're going to look at some of the more advanced selectors. Now, you're not going to use these every day. They're not used very commonly, but it just shows what you can actually do with these selectors, because there is a lot. So there's a bunch of advanced selectors, and I'm actually going to be breaking these down into two parts. We're going to be looking first at our basic advanced selectors, and I know that sounds a little bit contradictive, but we'll get into that in just a second. And then after that, we're going to be talking about attribute selectors, which are probably the hardest type of selector to uh, get used to. All right, let's get started. So the first thing I want to talk about is how you actually set up these selectors. Now, these sometimes contain one, two, or sometimes even three elements in one selector. So I'm going to be going through these and talking about how they all work. 
So the first selector I'm going to be talking about is something called the adjacent sibling uh, selector. So pretty much what this does is select every single element that directly follows a different element. So I'll show you how to set this up. Let's first take a look at our HTML page every over here. Sorry. Uh, now you can see we have our services, which is our H2, and then we have an A tag. Now, first thing I want to do is actually go ahead and get rid of uh, these two. I'm going to actually comment them out. You can do this with control slash, just like that. So if you type control slash, it comments it, with, which pretty much just renders it useless. It doesn't run or anything like that. Let's get started. So the first thing I want to do is go ahead and set this up. So I want to be able to apply styles to every A tag or anchor tag that comes directly after an H2. So the way to set this up is all you have to do is go the element that you want to be the first element. So in this case, it's going to be our H2. And then afterwards, it's going to be the element that you want after, which is our A tag. So you want H2 plus A. So this is pretty much saying every anchor tag that follows an H2. So then we can pretty much just set the style however we want. So I'm going to say color is red, just like that. Now remember, this isn't any, there is no pseudo selector on this. If you could add it, if you wanted to, because this is still a selector, remember, uh, but I'm not going to add any. So I'm going to go ahead and refresh the page and you can see it turns red again. So that's the first type of selector. Next thing I want to look at is the general sibling combinator or selector. So this is a little bit more difficult to understand, uh, but all in good time, it's once you get used to it, it becomes um, much easier to understand. So pretty much what the general sibling selector does is goes for the same kind of idea as this selector here. It looks for elements that go directly after one another, except they have to be sharing the same parent. Okay. So for example, Let's see our input here, our form. Uh, we have an input and a text area or a button followed by a text area, for example. So what we're going to do here is I want to style every button that's followed by a text area, except in this case, they have to share the same parent. So what we're going to do is go and say every button, which is going to be uh, the next one or the final one, which is a here. So sorry, it's actually going to be text area right? Because that's the first element here, which is our text area. And then this symbol followed, and then it's going to be our button like that. So this is saying every button that is followed or that is after a text area, but they're in the same parent. So from here, we can go and style it however we want. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and just say the color is purple. Oops. Now, if we go ahead and refresh, you can see that the button color is purple. So the, like I said, the main difference between these two is that the first one is going to be styling elements that follow each other, no matter where they are on the scale. So if you actually look up here, they don't share any parent. They're completely separate elements. Whereas here, they have to follow each other. And I'll actually demonstrate that quickly. If we change this to a plus here and refresh, the style is still going to work because they are directly preceded. Um, but the only thing is if they aren't, so for example, I'm just going to actually move this button out of the form, just like that. Whoops. Seems like, uh, the button disappeared there. Let's go ahead and, uh, redo that. Okay. So we have the button back. Now, if I'm going to go ahead and change this back to our, uh, symbol there, and if I go ahead and refresh, you can see that the button right there, it doesn't actually have that styling anymore because although they directly follow each other, um, they're not under the same parent. So that's just uh, one minor difference. All right, let's move on to the next one. It's called the child selector. So this is probably the most basic out of all of these advanced selectors. And pretty much what it's saying is every single child uh, of a certain element. So I'll give you an example here. We have an LI and a UL. This is pretty basic. All you have to do is type UL, which is going to be our parent. And then this symbol or the greater than symbol and LI. So this is going to say every single LI inside of a UL. Open up the brackets and let's set the color this time to um, blue. I'm just going to say that. And remember, specificity is at play here. Now, like I said, the specificity rules, once you use these advanced selectors, get quite complicated. Uh, but for example, if we actually look at the LI here, 
um, the style for this, we can see that the li with the pseudo selector is actually more specific than the this general selector. So I'm going to go ahead and comment that out. Now, if we reverse the page, you can see that it's blue. So that's just one thing to keep in mind with these advanced selectors. Uh, they can get pretty complicated, and that's why we use the numbers, the zeros, ones, twos, things like that, is to be able to classify these once we get and start using these advanced selectors. But like I said, usually you won't use these in your general use. Um, so I'm not going to go over specificity, especially because usually you'll group up all of these styles into one selector. Okay, so that's the child uh, selector. The next one is very similar to the child selector, but instead of having direct children, there's actually something called a descendant. So I'm just going to go ahead and edit this a little bit. I'm going to have an li, okay? But then I'm going to create an ordered list inside of the... Uh, oh, whoops. Actually, I need to create an li and put the ordered list inside of that. So pretty much what's going on here is I'm creating an ordered list or a numbered list inside of a list item that is inside of a ul. It's a little bit complicated, um, but we'll get to that in just a second. So I'm going to create an li inside of this, and I'm going to say my numbered list item, just like that, all right? So now I'm gonna go ahead and refresh the page, and you can see we have a list item here with our item, all right? So let's get started on using this um, descendant selector. So I'm gonna get started. First thing I wanna do is uh, actually set this up. So first thing we're gonna have is the parent, okay? So in this case, it's going to be our UL, remember, because that's the top level. But then I'm going to select um, the LI here, but I'm not going to put our greater than symbol. So that's the big difference. This is the um, descendant uh, selector, and then this is going to be our child selector. So that's just the main difference. It's very easy to miss. Just make sure that you don't uh, mess that up. So now I'm going to select the color and set it to, for now, let's just say green. All right, now let's go ahead and refresh the page, and you can see that all of the LIs inside of there are going to be green, right? Only problem is our ordered list right here is actually um, purple, right? And of course, you know, our uh, list here is getting a little bit complicated, so I'm going to go ahead and comment this out. Remember, this is a very specific selector. Now, if I go ahead and refresh, both of them are green, all right? So what you need to take away from this is pretty much what this is saying is any LI that eventually boils back or propagates up, if you uh, have done any programming before, that goes up to an a UL, okay? So I'll just show you what that means. In this case, the LI is a direct child of the UL, right? But then we have another LI in here, which is a child of an OL, which is a child of an LI, which is a child of the UL, right? So as you move up and up, it eventually comes back to the UL as the parent element. So the main difference you need to take away from this is that the um, child selector is selecting any direct uh, children. So anything here would not apply because we're actually, um, this one wouldn't apply because the ordered list is actually a child of the LI, remember. But when you're using the um, descendant selector, what actually happens is if it is contained inside of a UL at all, then use or apply the styles. So I'm going to go ahead and demonstrate this now. Let's go ahead and actually remove this LI. Remember, because once you get to this point, CSS gets a little bit complicated. Um, this is going to end up styling everything inside it. So I'm actually just going to remove this um, and leave it just the ordered list. So right now we have the ordered list as a child of the UL. Now I'm going to go ahead and refresh. And you can see it still stays the same because uh, we have this style applied. But why don't we go ahead and remove this? What do you think is going to happen? Well, you can see here that this stays blue, remember, because of our direct child uh, selector. But then this doesn't have any style at all. So this LI works perfectly. It is a direct child of the UL, which means it's going to be colored with the style specified. The only problem is this LI is a direct child of the ordered list which is completely separate from this one. So the styles aren't going to be applied on this one. On the other hand, if we did have our descendant selector enabled, it's going to style both of them. Because remember, the LI is a child of the OL, and the OL is a child of the UL. 
So just keep that in mind. Uh, there's a big difference between the two. You might be able to miss it. It could really mess up your uh, code. So just make sure to keep that in mind. All right, so those are pretty much the basic um, advanced selectors. Those are the four that you're mainly going to use. Again, there's many more, but um, they are quite difficult and uh, we're not going to cover them because they're not very useful. So there we go. Those are the four selectors that you can use. Go ahead and practice them as much as you want. Um, you know, try messing them around, open up some HTML files and just see what you can do with them. All right, let's move on. Welcome back. So in this video, I am going to be talking about the last type of selector. These are called attribute selectors. They're a little bit complicated once you get uh, started, but once we actually start using them, they become very easy to use. So first of all, what is an attribute selector? Well, as we know, in HTML, we can actually add attributes to all of our elements. So for example, this image here has an attribute of source, which tells the image tag where the source of the image is. But what we can actually do in CSS is use these to our advantage. We can select certain elements that um, for certain attributes and their values. So for example, let's go ahead and try and rewrite this subtitle class here. So we know if we go over here that all of our, uh, all of our subtitle classes are used in H2s. So what I want to do is actually rewrite this in terms of our attribute selector. So what we do is first start off with our tag name, which is h2. But then inside of some squared brackets, what we do is type attribute is equal to value, okay? So obviously, um, we're not going to do it like this. We're gonna have to select some certain attribute. But what this allows us to do is actually select certain things or certain elements based on their attributes. So in this, in this case, we wanna select everything that has the attribute of class. And we want to make sure that the class itself is subtitle. Okay. Now you do not need um, quotation marks for these, uh, unlike how they were in HTML. You can see we do need quotation marks, but in CSS we don't actually need them. All right. So there we go. We have rewritten our class here, but we've re we, but we've written it in a way that allows us to select it based on its at on the attribute of it itself. So let's go ahead and refresh the page and see what happens you can see that they stay exactly the same. Now, nothing has changed. If I go ahead and change this back to dot subtitle, just like that, and I refresh the page, you can see nothing's changed. So that's pretty basic. Now, it doesn't just have to be class. We can select it based on many different things. So for example, if I wanted to select this image over here, I'm gonna go over to the bottom. I could say image, oh, whoops, image, and then every and then the source has to be equal to something. All right. So there we go. Now we've done that. But there's actually more than one type of selector. Now, usually this is the basic one where you just equate one side to the other. But there's actually many more types of selectors, which allow you to kind of modify the attribute selectors and make them much more powerful than they are right now. So how do we do this? Well, I'm going to be covering just a few of them with you today and showing you how you can use them. So we have two images on this page. Now, both of them are located in this image folder. Is there, do you think that there's any way that we can select both of them in one go using an attribute selector? Well, there actually is. So here's what we have to do. First of all, let's find the common factor between these two images. They both are contained inside this folder. So they both start, definitely start with this path dot dot slash img slash both of them are going to contain this and if we actually go back and look you can see that both images actually do contain um, this link here wherever the other image is there it is so there we go now we've done that but remember that this is direct e equating this has to be equal to this and unfortunately neither of them are equal to that so how do you think we fix this well all we have to do is put a caret behind um, the attribute just like this. So what this says is every single image where the source contains or starts with uh, Sorry, yeah starts with this piece of information what comes after it doesn't matter But what we're doing is selecting all of the images where the source attribute starts with this uh, value right here So this is you can already see how powerful this is 
Now, if we go ahead and refresh the page, obviously, um, we can't see anything because we didn't add any styles. But I'm going to go ahead and add a quick style for you. Now, you don't need to know how to do this. I'm actually going to make it a little bit more obvious. So you don't need to know how to do this. We're going to cover it later. But you can see now both images are covered in black. Okay? So there we go. That's just one way, uh, one of the selectors we can do. We can also change this to a dollar sign. And in this case, it's going to be um, make sure that the source attribute ends with this value. Okay? Um, so there we go. We can do that. Obviously, the style isn't going to work anymore because this doesn't apply. But there's also another one that we can do, which is using a star or the multiplication symbol. And pretty much what this is, is if it contains it anywhere, anywhere in the, um, in the value for beginning and middle, doesn't matter. As long as it contains this, it's going to be there. So I'm going to go ahead and refresh and you can see now that works because both of them do contain this. So those are the three basic ones, but there's also, um, some more complicated, um, selectors. Now I'm going to go ahead and cover them, but you don't exactly need to know these uh, because they're a little bit complicated. So I'm just going to go ahead and do them. The first one is called a white space attribute selector. So pretty much, if you don't know this already, you can actually add multiple classes to um, something in HTML. So I'm actually going to go ahead and add another class to these subtitles, and I'm just going to call it um, just something random, article subtitle. Obviously, it's a little bit confusing, but just bear with me. So you can actually add multiple classes or multiple arguments separated by white spaces or spaces uh, inside these um, inside these attributes. Now, obviously, this is specific to some very uh, small, a very small number of attributes, but you can do this. Now, just keep that in mind for now. What we're going to do is go forward and start using this. So I'm going to go ahead and select anything that contains this um, this class specifically. Now I could do, you know, maybe the attribute selector where it ends in this or contains it, but there is another selector that we can use. So I'm going to go ahead and say H2. And of course the attribute is class and it's this symbol. Oh, whoops. It's this symbol. Okay. And then equals, and then our value in this, it's in this case, it's going to be our class, which is article subtitle. All right. So now we can go ahead and add whatever we want. So I'm actually going to go ahead and give it a background. Now, again, you do not need to know what this is yet. I'm just trying to vary up the properties a little bit here. So let's go ahead and refresh the page and see what happens. You can see that a green background has been added to this. I'm not going to try hovering over that. It's a little bit um, discomforting, but you can see that a green background has been added to it. Now, this could be used for a um, using a contain attribute. Uh, selector, but this is a little bit more specific and it only works for things that are separated by white space. So if you want to isolate certain elements that contain a certain class, for example, uh, you can do it with these class uh, attributes and that would work perfectly. So the next selector I'm going to talk about is a little bit more complicated um, and it's very similar to the first them, the first one that we talked about, which was the general attribute selector, the one where, where it's exact equality. But there's a little bit of a difference here. There's actually one exception to this. Now I'm going to go ahead and demonstrate it here. Okay. So pretty much what this is saying is find every H2 where the class is equal, either equal to directly article dash subtitle or article dash subtitle with a dash. So, and again, it does have to start with this. So it can't just be containing followed by a dash. It does have to start with this. So why would you want to use something like this? Why can't you just use the exact equality? Well, this is a pretty basic site right here. Now we're not really doing anything complicated or any multiple style sheets or anything like that. But sometimes when you have want to have multiple elements or you want to build libraries, you can create multiple elements that are followed by an ID. So for example, just list them here. I'm going to actually put this in a comment. So I could have subtitle dash and then some ID like that subtitle dash and then again some ID. So you can see why we would use something like this. Pretty much what you want to do is select everything that um, has subtitle and then the dash in it. And you're probably also wondering, okay, why can't you just use one of the other selectors? Like something that starts with it. Well, sometimes this is contained in a chain or sometimes there's multiple dashes. And on top of that, 
some sometimes it may change you know maybe this could be in the middle of 15 other classes so you can see why you'd want to use something like this and although it's not used very commonly it's still very important to know all right so those are pretty much all of the advanced art attribute selectors like i said you aren't going to use these very commonly uh, but again it is good to know they are very powerful selectors um, so yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, go ahead, like I said, with every single video, practice and just try using these selectors on your own. All of the project files are available on GitHub. The, they, the link to the repository was posted at the beginning of the course. So you can go ahead and check that out if you wanna download the files um, and work with them. But other than that, there we go. Uh, that's pretty much it for selectors. Now we can actually move on and start using CSS. All right, let's move on. I'm not really going to talk a lot in this video because um, there's not really much to talk about, but this video and the next are very important because right now you're probably just piecing things together about the whole way that we use CSS. Now we've had to use a couple properties here and there, but you probably don't actually know what these brackets do or how selectors work or how any of this is actually put together. So that's what I'm going to be doing in the next few videos is explaining how all of this comes together. And once we learn that, we can actually move on to the fun part, which is using CSS and styling this website. So first thing I want to explain is properties. Now, we've talked a little bit about properties here and there because we've needed them to demonstrate points on how selectors work. Now, obviously, it might have been better if we use properties first, but in my opinion, it's better that you learn selectors before you learn properties, because if you learn selectors first, you'll be able to understand the premise or the theory behind CSS and how things work. Whereas if you just learn properties first, then most of your focus will be on how the properties work and not the selectors. And I feel that it's much more important that you learn the selectors before the properties so that you can actually understand CSS and how it works as a whole. So that aside, let's move on to properties. Now, like I said, we've used these a little bit in the past, but we haven't actually talked about them in detail. So this is a property. Now, they're contained within selectors and they pretty much define the way that CSS is used or what goes into the CSS. Now, a selector is going to target the element, but the actual properties are what give it its change and what make it what it is. Without or without properties, then the selectors would be completely useless. So let's go ahead and talk about the parts of properties. Now, first of all, a colon is always needed. You cannot use a property without a colon and a semicolon. The colon comes after the property. Now the property is pretty much defining what is going to change. Is it the color, the background, the positioning, the height, the width? There are so many properties out there and they are all used in different ways. And then next is the value. Now, most of the time you can actually use multiple types of values, but for something like color, there are very specific rules that you need to use for them. And we're actually gonna be learning those rules and how to use colors in the next section. But for now, the, just think of the value as a key, or well, not a key, the value is sort of the guideline towards the property. The value is like the value to the attribute. The attribute defines what's changing and the value actually gives it that change. So just keep that in mind. So that's pretty much it for properties. It's very simple and we're gonna get lots of exposure to them as we move through the course. But for now, all you need to keep in mind is that properties have two components. The actual property itself, which is kind of the guideline on what's changing, followed by a colon, and then the value itself, which is going to be the change or the type of change that happens in our um, our element, so what happens through our selector. And at the end of it all, you always put a semicolon. If we remove the semicolon, it's not going to work. So yeah, that's pretty much it for properties. Let's move on. So this is gonna be the final video on, or in this section. We're not really gonna be doing anything or styling the website, but for now, I just wanna talk a little bit about a very important part of CSS. Now, this is pretty much going to define the way that you look at CSS. And we've written a lot of CSS code here. Well, we're not really looking at properties yet, but we've covered a lot of different selectors and how they work. But now we need to put the two together. We know what properties are, and we definitely know what selectors are. So we need to know how these two work together. Now I've talked a little bit about this in the past, but we haven't actually gone through it in detail. So that's what I'm gonna be doing in this video. 
So first of all, if you look at all of the CSS code, we can see a pattern evolve here. First of all, in every single one of these, there are these curly braces. And on top of that, in every single one, there is some italicized text, which is due to the uh, development tool that we're using. But there's some italicized text and then some other text here. And there's always a colon and a semicolon. And on top of that, before every first curly brace, there's always going to be some form of text here, which is our selectors. But how do these actually work together? So this is very important for something called the CSS general rule. And it's pretty much going to teach you how all CSS is supposed to look. So first of all, there's always three parts to your, um, to your selector here. There is the selector itself. There's the curly braces, which actually represent something called a CSS block. And then there's the properties. So first of all, let's talk about the selector. Now, we all know that a selector defines what elements you're trying to collect or target on your HTML page. A selector can look any different way. It can look like this with some weird symbols. It can have colons and pseudo selectors, or it can just look something very plain um, like this. But we all know that they do something different. And over the last few videos, we've been covering what selectors actually do. So now what we're going to do is go through and I'm going to teach you how this selector plays in with everything else. So we're, we have our selector over here. This could be anything, uh, an element selector, pseudo selector, attribute selector, like one of these. Um, but for now, we have our selector. So this is going to target some element on a page. Now, the part we haven't talked about is something called the CSS block. So pretty much once you select something, you need to define all of your styles. And as we know, all of your styles have to go in between these two curly braces. So that's what we call a CSS block. The curly braces define the beginning and end of this block. And it can be empty. It doesn't need to have anything inside it. But what's going on here is this block is going to contain all of the styles that are then going to be targeted towards our selector. And then, of course, we have the properties. So all of these have only had one property, but you can actually do more than one property. So a property looks like this property, a colon, and then a value and a semicolon. So the property is going to be the name of the actual style. This can be color, background, and we're going to learn a bunch of these throughout this course. But this could be anything. On the other hand, the value has to be sort of targeted or matching the style of the property. So for example, if this was a color, we can use pixels because pixels are for size. So there are many different ways that you can um, use these different values and they all depend on your property. So what I didn't show you is you can actually have more than one property. Now these can be in any style as long as they have the semicolon and the colon um, and they come inside the block. So this can be property two and value two. And you can put pretty much as many styles as you want in here. So for example, if you wanted to style a subtitle and you wanted to change the font size, the color, and the background all at the same time, you don't need to create three separate CSS blocks. You can do it all in one. And that's the real power of CSS is that you don't have, you can keep your code concise and clean without having to create all of these different blocks. So this is pretty much the general rule. You have to follow this pretty much for all of the CSS you write using a selector and then different properties contained inside of a block. So like I said, we're going to get much more experience with actually using CSS as we delve more um, into CSS and learning all of the different features it has to offer. All right, let's move on. So this is the start of a new section. And now that we've learned all we need to know about selectors, we're going to actually start styling up our website and making it look good. So first of all, let's just talk about coloring in general. I mean, what is coloring and what are we supposed to do with it? So as we know, we already have a bunch of colors here and they all look fine. But what we're actually trying to do here is color our website in a way that makes it look modern and appealing to users. So we're going to be learning a bunch of different techniques that you can use to color your website. Now we've already used one in the past and it's the very common one. And that is of course the color property. Now we're going to be talking more about this in the next video and using it in depth. But first thing I want to talk about is the different types of colors because there's actually more than one. So first of all, we've all used and well, you've at least seen me use the colors uh, given by name. So for example, red, green, blue, and purple. 
Um, but there's actually more than that. There's so much more to colors than just those names, because as you know, they're actually quite limiting. You can't really change the color and choose it as you want. So what I'm here to teach you about is the three different types of colors and how they work. So the first one is obviously the CSS color codes or names. And what they do is it's pretty much given a name and they each have a designated color. So this is a really easy way for testing colors, for example, if you want to test if a property works, as we saw at the beginning of this course. Um, and you can also use them for, you know, maybe quick fixes or trying to just try out different colors. But once you get into the really specific, detailed um, web design, and once you start producing your website properly, you're going to want more than just the color CSS gives you. So I've actually attached to the lecture resources this website here. Um, you have a bunch of different CSS color codes and you can see that there's actually a huge range of them. We only use the basic ones uh, that are quite vibrant and they really hit the eyes very hard. But you can see there's actually a lot more than what we just use. The only problem is nobody wants to memorize all of these different names. So what we're actually going to be doing is learning how to use these two, which are the ones I'm going to be talking about in this video. So first of all, let's talk a little bit about hex code. Okay. So first of all, I have a color picker over here just to demonstrate how this whole thing works. We actually don't need this for now. So I'm going to put this up on full screen. So this is a color picker that I found on Google. You can go ahead and search it anywhere, but I like using Google's provided one uh, because it provides you with both the hex code and the RGB code. Don't worry. We'll talk about those in just a second. So first of all, you can slide up and down uh, this thing and choose whichever color you want. And you can see that these two codes change. So what do they actually mean? Well, first, let's talk about the hex code. So we all know that when you're normally using numbers, you range from zero to nine. So any given number in this new in that numeral system can be made up of zero, one, two, and all the way up to nine. So in that case, there's 10 possible combinations. But in hex code, there's actually 16 different possible combinations. You can go from zero to nine and then A to F. So for example, let's just take this right here. This can actually be converted into a number if we wanted to. Suppose B actually stands for 12 because it goes zero to nine and then A, B, so 12. And you can actually convert this into a number, which is very interesting. So I'm not really going to be talking about the, uh, applications of hex code in this uh, in this video because that goes all the way down into computer science and we're not really looking at that now. But one thing we can do is actually create colors based on this. So first of all, you'll notice that our code here starts off with a hashtag and then you have six digits. So each one can have 16 possible combinations. But as we know, color, any color is made up of either red, green or blue, at least on the computer for the standard color um, palette. So it's made up of red, green, and blue. Now, basically, this hex code is split up into three two-digit pairs. So the first pair of numbers is meant to represent the amount of red in the color, the second the amount of green, and the third the amount of blue, R, G, B. And these pairs can range from 0, 0, which means none of that color, to F, F, which is the highest value. Remember, hexadecimal goes from 0 to F. So I'm just going to choose something very basic here, like a standard blue. You can see here that this is the purest blue that you can get. Pretty much what this is saying is the first two is zero, zero, which means there's no red. The second pair or yeah, the second pair is also zero, zero, which means no green. But then the third is FF, which means all blue. So this is pretty easy. So if we go to something like white, for example, this would have FF, FF, FF which is all red, all green, all blue, which actually creates white. And if we chose black, you can see that that's zero. So this is a pretty hard thing to understand once you get into some of these more complicated colors. Again, we don't really use hexadecimal in normal, uh, in normal use. When we're creating colors or writing code, we don't really use these numbers. So it's actually much easier to work with RGB codes. So, RGB is a little bit different in the style that it's written, but it all represents the same concept. Pretty much, 
there are three numbers here, and these aren't hexadecimal numbers, these are just normal numbers. You have three numbers, the first for red, the second for green, and the third for blue. Just like this one, except in this case, the numbers can go from 0 to 255, 0 being the minimum and 255 being the maximum. So this is actually much easier to read. Let's go back to our blue here, and I'm actually just going to write the code here. So you can see that there's 0 red, 0 blue, and 255, sorry, 0 red, 0 green, and 255 blue, which is the maximum. And obviously, you can see that once we go back to those complicated colors, when you look here, it's quite complicated to understand. But when we look at the RGB code, we can see that there's a moderate amount of red, a large amount of green, and a large amount of blue. And therefore, it should theoretically be a cold color. Now again, you don't really need to know how to construct these codes from your head. They're quite hard to understand. So what I would recommend is when you're designing these colors or designing these um these websites, I would recommend you just go and use a color picker. It's much easier to it's much easier to decide and you can also uh get a lot more experience, hands-on experience with these colors rather than memorizing all the theory behind them. So both of these will work fine and in the next video, I'm going to show you how to actually use these codes in our um, in our website and actually use them to style and color text. All right, let's move on. So in this video, I am going to be starting to color and style our website. So we're gonna go through and use the selector skills that we've learned in the previous section to actually go through and start adding some color. On top of that, we're gonna be using the skills we learned about hex code and RGB color codes to um, vary up our style or method of coloring things. Because in the past, like I've said, we've just used some basic um, techniques with CSS color codes, and now we're gonna be working with our own custom colors. So first of all, let's go ahead and start adding some classes to this website to get it set up for our styling. So first thing I did is actually started from a clean slate because it was getting quite messy before and I thought that it would be better if we started from scratch. So the first thing I'm going to do is go ahead and add a class or an ID actually I think would be better to our title since there's only one of them. So I'm going to go ahead and add an ID of title. And hopefully you know how to do this from the skills you learned in the last section. Let's also go ahead and add some classes for our paragraph text. And because, of course, we have more than one paragraph, we're actually going to go ahead and use a class. So I'm going to use this, and I'm going to say paragraph, or I'm just going to say para to shorten it, text. So I'm going to go ahead and copy this class onto our other paragraphs instead of writing it down. There we go. So the next thing I want to do is go ahead and add some classes to this list here just for uh, convenience. So I'm going to go ahead and add a class for a list item. Now obviously we're not going to use all of these in one go, but I was just considering to add them so that uh, when we get into it, we can actually go ahead and use them without having to go ahead and add these classes every single time. So there we go, we did that. Let's also go ahead and add a class to our link. link. And now we have our table items. We're going to leave this for now because it might take a long time. Uh, we'll, we'll style this when we get later into our uh, section. So there we go. We did that. Now the last thing I want to do is just go ahead and add uh, a couple classes to our inputs here. So I'm going to go ahead and add some classes. So class is form input. And this is actually quite commonplace to add uh, or write class names and ID names with these. So um, with dashes instead of, you know, snake case, which is using capital letters, things like that. It's just a convention in CSS. So let's go ahead and add the same class here, just like that. There we go. And we'll also, we're also going to go ahead and add a subtitle class to our subtitles. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. There we go. Let's just copy that and over to our other subtitles. And once we're done with that, we'll move on and start coloring our text. Right, there we go. So everything's looking good. That means uh, nothing has gone wrong. Let's go ahead and start styling our text. So first thing I want to do is style our header here. So obviously you don't really want to go crazy with text colors. It's more for backgrounds, but I think we'll just experiment a little bit for this video 
um, with some of our colors. So first of all, I'm going to need to select it. This is the first part of our general rule. So because it's an idea, I'm going to go hash and then title, open up our block with our curly braces. And now we're going to start writing our property. So if you don't know this already, the property is going to be color. This is the text of the uh, the color of the text and I know it doesn't look like it since it doesn't say text dash color uh, similar to a bunch of other properties but this is the way to color your text. So here we can go ahead and type our property or sorry our value. Now in, before we've used colors like steel blue which is um, a CSS color code but now let's go ahead and challenge ourselves and start actually messing with these colors um, using our own color picker. So first of all I want to choose a color that I really like and I'm gonna go for a sort of deep orange. So we don't wanna go for something too dark, but we also don't wanna go for something too light so that it's hard on the eyes. Now I think a color like this is good. Now how would we actually implement this? Well, we just copy and paste it, and if you're thinking that that's the right way, well, then you're right. It's actually very easy. All you have to do is copy your hex or RGB code and paste it into, um, into here, just like that. Now if I go ahead and refresh the page, you can see that that color is being reflected on our title. Now I would recommend instead of using your hex code, go ahead and add an RGB code. And I'll tell you why later in this section, but for now just think that this is better because it's a little bit more flexible and you can change it easily. So on top of that, using an RGB color code really allows you to mess around with the colors in a way that if you didn't know hex code, you wouldn't be able to. So for example, let's say I wanted to increase the amount of blue in this. All I would have to do is go ahead and just change it. Let's say I wanted to go with 150 blue. You can see that that the color has completely changed by adding more blue. By doing it, we've kind of mixed around the colors and created this pinkish color. Imagine you're working with a color palette instead of a digital kind of weird um, color mixer. Think of you have a giant pile of red, green, and blue, and what you're doing here is changing all of the proportions to get just the color you want. So let's go ahead and change this color back to 9. There we go. Now we have our orange color there. So let's go ahead and also style up our, um, our subtitles here. And one common thing that you do with... Um, hierarchies of text, so for example titles and then subtitles and paragraph, is usually your titles or your high up on the hierarchy are going to have very dark colors and then your subtitles or things that are lower on the hierarchy are going to have around the same color scheme but they're going to be a little lighter. So what I'm going to do is just go ahead to my color picker and drag this up a little bit. Of course you could do this by just increasing all of the values but I actually prefer to use the color picker because I can really see what's going on. So I'm going to choose something a little bit lighter, maybe something around here. Again, we don't want it to be too light because then uh, it's going to be too hard on the eyes. So I think I'm going to go with something around here. So I'm going to go ahead and copy the code. Now let's go ahead and add our selector. So I'm going to go dot subtitle because remember it's a class. Then I'm going to use my property color and paste in our RGB color code. Let's go ahead and refresh the page and you can see that our subtitles have been colored down. So there we go, everything is working really well for now and we're starting to get the hang of this. Now I recommend uh, you go ahead and try this on your own. Again, the whole point is to be styling a website as you go along. So I recommend you go ahead and mess around with your own colors. Again, you can just find this color picker by going to Google. If you don't really like it, you could always go to another color picker on uh, search for one. But you can go ahead, choose your own colors. If you don't like orange, you can go with blue, maybe something a little colder. Uh, it's totally up to you. Just get some practice with using colors uh, on different types of text and get some more practice using CSS on your own. All right, let's move on. So in this video, we are going to be covering background colors. Now, I know it's a little bit intimidating considering we've never actually done backgrounds before, but it's very similar to colors in the values that it uses. The only difference is, is what it's actually styling. So I'm going to be teaching you how to create backgrounds on your website. Now, obviously, we're not going to go all crazy and start creating backgrounds for everything because we haven't got into, we haven't gotten into layout yet. And without layout, backgrounds aren't really usable because sometimes, especially with colors, it just doesn't really look that good. So what we're actually going to do is go through and just practice with our backgrounds for now. 
So the first thing I need to do is actually look for something to create a background on. And we all know what a background on text looked like. Now we don't actually know why the background goes um, all the way to the edge yet. We haven't gotten in, we haven't gotten into layout yet. But once we do, you'll know how to change that. For now though, I think it's really fitting to go through and style this whole page. So firstly, what selector do we need to use? Considering that we're trying to select everything, how are we supposed to create a background on every single item? Do we go through and select everything and add that background? Well, if we actually look, our, look at our HTML page, you can see that all of our text here is contained inside of our body tag. So the easiest way to select this, because again, there's only one of our body, we can just use an element selector. So I'm gonna go ahead and select it with body. So usually you would actually put tags, uh, element selectors at the top. So I'm going to go ahead and do that now. Open up our block using those curly braces. And now we can add our background. So first of all, the property used to select and color backgrounds is called background color. But we're not actually going to use that because background is much easier considering that you can actually go and also select images and URLs instead of colors. It's much more flexible and I prefer using it over background color. So I'm gonna go ahead and select that as my property. So from now, you can just go ahead and add your value. Similarly to color, you can use an RGB code, a hex code, or a CSS color even if you want. So I'm gonna go ahead and set it as red and just warn your eyes because it's quite popping. So you can see that now our entire site has been styled red. Now obviously I don't want this. This doesn't really look very good. So I'm gonna go ahead and erase this property for now. And we're gonna go through and choose a color. So I would recommend choosing something a little bit light. So I'm gonna go for about a light turquoise or light blue, something like this. So now I'm gonna go ahead and copy my uh, RGB code. And here, I'm gonna go ahead and add my background property and paste in my RGB code. Now, if we go ahead and refresh the page, you can see we have this really nice light blue, which kind of fits in with our oranges. Now, because it's a little bit, um, it doesn't really look that good on this light orange, I'm gonna go ahead and dampen it a little bit. So the easy way to do this with RGB is to just go ahead and drop all of the values. This way you stay in the same proportions, but you're just darkening everything. So I'm gonna go ahead and darken our subtitles. So I'm gonna reduce everything by 20 or so. So this becomes, let's just say 200, and this becomes 148. And obviously these don't have to be exact, uh, and this can become 30. So these don't have to be exact, like I said, we're just darkening the titles. You can see, you can see that they got a little bit darker and it looks better on this color. All right, there we go. So that's pretty much how to style backgrounds. Now you can go ahead and apply this to pretty much anything you want. So if I actually go ahead and style our subtitles with our blue background, obviously it won't look that good, but it works perfectly fine. So there we go. That's pretty much how to add color to backgrounds. And in the next video, I'm going to be teaching you how to actually change the type of background that you're using. Because obviously sometimes you want to actually change the background and use maybe a custom image or you want to link to an image online. So I'm going to be teaching you how to do that in the next video. So let's just go ahead and refresh the page, keep that normal. All right, let's move on. So in this video, we're going to be looking at a different type of background in CSS. So now that we've covered basic color types and we've also covered a little bit of background, uh, and using backgrounds, we're actually gonna move on to an alternate way of creating backgrounds, and that's through background images. So right now, we know the basics of coloring. So we, we're able to color text now with our own custom colors using a color picker. Uh, we can also go ahead and use our own, um, you know, backgrounds and things like that with our own colors. But now what I wanna cover is looking at different types of backgrounds themselves. So in this case, we're gonna be looking at images. So first of all, when we want to set the background to an image, we can't just go ahead and add an RGB color code. We're gonna to need to go and actually link to an image. So I'm gonna show you a really easy way of doing this. The first thing we're gonna need is an image. And for this method, you can actually use uh, images with, from the internet without having to download them using URLs. So I'll show you how to do that now. So if I go ahead and search for a landscape image, just like this, and now we want to look for a sort of low resolution one. We don't want something too big. 
I think this would be pretty good. It's going to look a little bit weird, but just for this purpose, we're going to use it. So now what we need to do is get the URL link to this image. So you can do this by right clicking on it. And then you're going to go ahead and click on copy image address. Okay. So what this is going to do is get the actual link to the image itself. Right now, this link is going to Google images, but what we actually need is the link to the image itself. So there we go. We have that set up. Now we need to go ahead and add the image to the page. So under here, I'm going to just erase this color code for now, and I'm going to show you how to add our image. So there's this uh, thing in CSS, they're called functions. Now we're not really going to go very in depth about them, but pretty much what they do is they take a few inputs, they process them and they give an output. So the first example of a function that we've already used is this right here. It takes three inputs, a red, a green and a blue does some magic behind the scenes and then gives us a color back. So what we're going to do here is use another function called URL. So what this is going to do is take in the link or to a URL and then it's going to find that image and set it. So in quotations, it does have to be in quotations. Just remember that you're then going to paste in your image. So remember, I just copied this from the image address and now we have it here. So we have the image. Let's go ahead and check it out on our website. So there we go. You can see that, oh, whoops. You can see that our image is set here. Now, there's a few issues, obviously, with the um, repetition and everything, but we're not going to be covering those uh, until maybe in a few videos where we talk about some other background properties. But there we go. For now, we've actually set our image and now it is set on our website. So when you think of a URL, you're most likely thinking of linking to Google Images or some sort of web URL. But that's not the only type of URL that we can use. A URL is just a link to an endpoint. This right here is a URL. It's just not linking to a website. It's instead linking to a local uh, picture or style sheet or whatever you're trying to link to. So what I'm actually going to show you is that we can use these local URLs in here. So I'm going to erase this. It's a little bit long. Now I'm going to paste in our new URL here. Go ahead and refresh the page. And now you can see that it still works perfectly because again, it's linking to an endpoint. It's just not on a website. It's instead stored on our local machine. So there we go. We have that set up now, but there's actually another way that you can set background images. And this goes the same for background colors. So why I like to use the background property is because you can set anything you want in one go. You can set it as a color, as an image, and you can do many other things. But instead, you can actually use very specific properties that work for specific um, values. So for example, in this case, we can use background image. And from here, we can go ahead and copy paste the URL like that. Make sure to add your semicolon. Now I'm going to go ahead and erase this and show you that it still works perfectly fine. So you can see I refreshed the page and it's still working. And this goes the same for, for background colors. You can go ahead and add a background color and then add some random RGB value. I'm just going to go for a full uh, black for now. And you can see that it still works. The only problem is if I go ahead and paste in that URL here. Oh, whoops. If I go ahead and paste in that URL here. Uh, I'm just going to link to it straight. Just like that. So if I go ahead and add the URL to the color, it's not going to work because this is specifically for colors. All right. So there we go. That's pretty much it for background images. Um, it's quite easy to use. All you have to do is make sure that you have a working URL. You can just test it by putting it in and seeing if the background's loading properly. Um, and from there, just use your URL function and a suitable property such as background or background image, and you should be good to go. All right, let's move on. So in this video, we are going to be looking at some more background properties. Now we're not going to be looking at all of them because most of these aren't really useful and they're, they're not really used in everyday life. But what I'm going to be doing is showing you the main uh, properties that you can use with backgrounds that can really change uh, how your backgrounds look. So we're actually going to be covering, covering only two in this video. So that's background size and background repeat. 
So the first thing I want to cover is background repeat because I think it's the most important. So you can see we have our background there. I already set the height and width. Don't worry about these values or the properties or anything. Again, we'll talk about those later in this in this course. Uh, but for now, you can see that we have our background here, uh, which is actually inside of a div. So I set the div height and width, and now there's a background here. So I want to mess around with this background and see what I can do. So first of all, you'll notice that we can see here that we have, so for example, um, two or three or four of the same image. And pretty much what's happening is the image is being repeated so that it can fill up all of the content space. Now this is done by default because again, um, all of the uh, values and pixels and the dimensions are absolute. They're not like other programs where you can just throw a picture on there and it'll automatically resize. When you're working with web development, it takes those raw dimensions and just plugs them straight into the website. So that's why we need to do a little bit of styling. So you can see that this image is big enough. And remember, because this is a direct image, what's happening here is we have an image uh, tag and then the image is just being plugged straight in there. Whereas with here, we don't actually have an image tag. What we have is an empty div, which is just think of it. If you don't know what that is, think of it as a container. It has a width and height of this much, but then this is an empty box. What we're doing is filling it with this image. So instead of plugging the image straight in, we're just filling an empty box with these images. And of course, the image isn't big enough to fill it. So what we have to do is, or what HTML actually does by default is repeat this. So if you don't want that, there is an easy way to fix it. Now it's probably not going to give you the result that you expected, but what you're going to do is go ahead and say background, background, dash repeat. And pretty much you can either set this to no repeat, which is the default, or, you, oh sorry, no, repeat is the default, yeah. So repeat is going to be the default value. But if you want to set it to no repeat, this is pretty much going to remove that repeating property. Now, although it might look like now this image is going to cover the whole thing, watch what happens. You can see that it only takes up um, that small box. And this might look like it just resized everything, but if I go ahead and add um, a background color to this, like that, and I'm just going to say red, and I go ahead and refresh the page, you can see what's actually happening here is that we have the image and it's not taking up the full image. If I go ahead and set this to repeat, now the background is taking up the full image. So I'm actually just going to go ahead and set this to a basic steel blue. I think that's one of my favorite CSS name colors. So there we go. Now that we know how to adjust the rep repetition of these backgrounds, why don't we go ahead and actually talk about background size because that's the important one that's going to allow us to fill this whole container. So first of all, now that we know that background repeat just changes if it repeats or not, we need to know how to alter the size. And we can do this using a property called background size. So I'm going to go ahead and actually erase this because we don't need it for now. Just like that. So you can actually go ahead and set the size of the background. And remember, depending on whether you set it to repeat or not, this is going to change your effect. So right now it's still on repeat since we removed that property, but pretty much the way to manipulate this is the first value is going to be the height. So for example, let's say I wanted to take up 50 pixels. Then with a direct space, remember no commas, nothing. You're going to then enter the width. So I'm going to say maybe 100 pixels. Let's go ahead and refresh now. And you can see that because our repeat is actually off, uh, sorry, our repeat is on, we can see that it just keeps repeating until this whole space is filled up. Now. Obviously, it's going to be pretty hard to get this exactly at the dimensions. If I actually go ahead and set this to 400 pixels and 70%, we didn't really talk about percentages much, you can see it's still repeating. So it's very hard to get this working in the way that you want it to cover the whole thing exactly, even if you use the direct values. So there's actually a keyword that you can use to fix this up. All you have to do is type cover here. So if we go ahead and refresh, you can see now the image takes up the full width. And although it sacrifices the quality, pretty much what's happening here is this cover value is going to resize the image based on the dimensions just right so that it fits this whole thing. There's also one more keyword that you can use, which is called contain. But the only problem is with contain is it's going to resize it as much as possible. The only problem is it's trying to resize it without messing with the proportions. 
So let's say that this is um, maybe a two to one ratio. So for every two widths, there's one height. So let's just use that as an example. Basically what's happening here is that no matter how much you stretch this, you cannot go the full way without stretching it off the screen. So contain doesn't do that. Instead, it just repeats the image. Now, if we actually change this back to cover, you can see that it does cut off part of that image because it just stretches it out the full way until the image color or the background covers the full width. So there you go. That's pretty much it for background size. Now I would recommend going instead, not with the uh, sizing option pixels, but instead using the cover keyword or the contain keyword. If you know that your proportions are right, or if you need it for some other purpose. So yeah, pretty much those are the two main other background properties that you're going to be using. Obviously there's many more, but they're not as um, useful and they don't really make as much of a difference as these two. All right, let's move on. So in this video, we're going to be talking a little bit more about RGB colors, but we're actually going to be adding one more uh, feature to this. So right now we've talked about RGB, which is our basic color set. We have a red, a green, and a blue. But there's actually one more that we're missing out on that can really improve the quality of our colors, and that's A, or alpha. So right now you can see we have an RGB color code, but what if we wanted to add this mysterious alpha component? What would we do? So I'm actually going to go ahead and use it as the background. Well, the first thing you need to do is change the RGB uh, name to RGBA. And in this way, we've completely changed the way the color looks. Now, if we go ahead and refresh the page, nothing's changed. But now we can actually manipulate that alpha value. So all we have to do is after green, or sorry, blue, keep getting those two mixed up, after the final value, you're going to add another comma. And here is where you can put any value between 0 and 1. So now that you know what you can do with it, alpha is pretty much the transparency or opacity of a color. 0 meaning it's completely transparent, you can't see it at all, and 1 meaning it's fully visible. Think of this in percentages. For example, 0 is 0% 0 and 1 is 100%. 0.5 would be 50%. So if you think of it that way, you can really think about opacity in a much easier way. So I'm going to go ahead and actually set 0.4. So right now we're at 0 or 40% opacity. Now if we refresh the page, you can see that the color is still there. It's just a lot lighter. Now you're probably asking, why, why don't you just go and maybe make the color lighter? Well, it's actually much easier to control it this way. And on top of that, if you want things like maybe fading or you want to maybe uh, change a color, fade it into a different one, uh, you can't really just change the color every time because in animation, it's much easier to just change the opacity, reduce it or increase it than change the color every time. So it's also much easier to use RGBA colors um, when you're trying to just control the overall uh, look of a color. So usually when you're using just simply RGB colors, you can only get a certain look. But once you add opacity into the mix, you can completely change the way that it looks. So pretty much here's the takeaway that you're supposed to take from this video. You can have a fourth component to an RGB color, which is A. Now this becomes an RGBA color. Now this A value stands for alpha or opacity or, or transparency, whatever you want to call it then this value isn't like just from 0 to 255. Instead, you have to set a value between 0 and 1. If you think of it in terms of percentages, it becomes a lot easier. 0 being the no or 0 when there is no transparency, uh, sorry, when, there, when it's fully transparent, and then 1 being when it's completely visible. All right, so that's pretty much it for this RGBA color scheme. Uh, it's very easy to use. You don't really need to use a color picker for that. You can just think about how opaque you want it, and from there you can set your value. All right, let's move on. So in this video, this is going to be talking about the last feature with using colors, and it's a little bit hard to grasp at first, but once you start using it, you can really get used to it. So we're going to be working with gradients in this video. And for now, I'm just going to go ahead and erase this background. And I'm just going to have a single color. So I'm just going to say steel blue. And I'm going to also erase this color property. So now we have a background of the steel blue color. There we go. So now it's working. 
So pretty much if you don't know what a gradient is already, it's kind of a transition between two colors. So it's not just a sharp red to blue in one go, it smoothly gre or, you know, moves or diffuses from through the colors. So for example, you start just completely red and then you move up along and as, as you go up, it gets more and more blue. So you're sort of mixing between the two colors. So if you've ever done any painting before or used maybe coloring pencils, if you kind of use paint and draw between the two colors, depending on the proportions between them, it's going to make sort of a purplish and then it transitions uh, like that. So pretty much that's what's going on here with our gradients is we're transitioning between two colors. Now, of course, you can do more than two. You can put three, four, you can put as many colors as you want. But pretty much what you have to take away from this is that a gradient is just a transition between a number of colors. Okay, so now that we know what a gradient is, let's go ahead and get started adding them. So there are actually two types of gradients, radial and linear. So radial gradients are circular. They kind of move outwards from a center. And depending on the percentages or how much you want of each color, it's going to change the way the gradient looks. A linear gradient, on the other hand, is the one that I described earlier, a smooth red transition to blue. It could go from left to right, top to bottom, and even diagonally, depending on how we define the direction later um, in this video when we start creating our gradients. All right, let's get started. So the first thing I want to work with is linear gradients. So the way to do this just with our RGBA or our URL, all we have to do is type linear dash gradient, just like that. And from here, we can start defining our directions. So if you don't already know about directions already, pretty much there are four different positions, top, bottom, left, and right. And you can also combine the two to create corners. So for example, top right would be the top right corner. So first of all, what you're going to want to do is type two, and then you're going to say the name of the direction. So in this case, I'm just going to say to right. So what this is going to be saying is you want the gradient to move to the right side. So it's going to be going this way. Now there's also another way to do this. I'll talk about in just a second, but for now, let's leave it like this. And then after your comma, you're going to add as many colors as you want. So in this case, I'm going to add red and blue. And remember to separate them also by a comma. Let's go ahead and refresh and see what's happening. You can see that we have a red slowly transitioning into a blue to the right side. So remember, it starts with the first color and moves on. Let's go ahead and add a green in there and then a steel blue and then a blue. Now we have four colors that are slowly transitioning. We have a red that slowly transitions into a green and then a steel blue. You can sort of see it there and then a blue. And just saying, we don't actually have to use these name colors. I just wanted to use them because it looked, um, it was quite easy to look at. So what we can actually do, and here's your first use for opacity, is you can go ahead and let's just take a random color here. So to right, remember this is starting here. We're going to paste in that color, but then we're going to finish it with an RGBA color like that. And pretty much what's, what's going to happen is this is going to be a slowly fading out color, just like this. So you can see what's happening is we start with a fully functional color, which has a full trans or a has no transparency at all. And we slowly, slowly make it fade more and more out until we can't see the picture at all or the color in this case. So yeah, that's pretty much a great way of looking at it. And that's pretty much it for linear gradients. Let's talk about actually making diagonal gradients now. So we know that we can have two right. We can also have two top, for example, if you wanted to start from the, start from the bottom, just like that. And you can see now it goes up. But what if we wanted to make it diagonal? So let's say we wanted to finish in the bottom right corner. What you would do is just type it out like this, to bottom right. Now, if we refresh the page, you can see that it slowly goes down and fades out just at the bottom right. So there we go. That's pretty much it for positioning. But there's actually another way to do this, and it's through angles. So if you don't already know how to use angles, then you can pretty much skip this step because it's quite hard to get the use of it. But once you learn how to actually work with angles and you know how to, uh, you know, move them around, things like that, it becomes very easy to work with them. 
So let's say you wanted them to go in a very specific direction. So for example, you wanted it to end somewhere here. Now obviously you can't use words for positioning because they only work at certain places such as the corners. So if you wanted to do this, you're going to have to go ahead and use angles. So first thing I'm going to do is go ahead and erase this part because uh, we're not using positioning and then we're going to go ahead and type our angle. So the first thing I'm going to do is define the place that I want it to end. So let's say this time I wanted it to end on the left here. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and say minus 90 because remember what's happening here is we want it to just flip completely around. So let's say this is our starting angle, it's zero, and we go all the way down, minus 90. So if you don't already know, 90 is kind of a quarter turn. And what's going to happen is from here, we can type DEG, or degrees, and this is going to set the angle that we want it at. So let's go ahead and refresh the page. You can see that now it goes from right to left. Now, this is a pretty bad example considering we can just do this normally by typing to left. But why don't we go ahead and choose something a little bit more specific. So I'm going to go 146 degrees. So just remember that pointing upwards is kind of the starting position. And then we turn 90 degrees and then just a little bit over halfway. And I think that's not a very good example, so I'm going to go with 160. Now you can see once I refresh the page that it ends sort of around the corner but not exactly on. And if I actually go ahead and add something like maybe uh, 215, something like that, go ahead and refresh, you can see that they are ending in different places. It's a lot more specific. Now it's not very obvious with this kind of fading color, but what's happening here is we can directly control where we want our gradient to end. So that's one way of using linear gradients. Now let's go ahead and talk about the next type of gradient, which are radial gradients. So first of all, I'm just going to erase this whole thing here because I don't really need it. Now radial gradients don't work in the same way that linear ones do. Instead of having a sp specified direction, so for example, you want to go from right to left or from top to bottom, instead what happens is we can actually define the percentages or proportions of each color that we want. The next thing I'm going to talk about is actually this background size. So one thing you need to note is that you cannot specify the cover uh, background size or anything like that for these radial gradients because they just won't work. So what we're going to have to do is go ahead and remove this. There we go. Now let's go ahead and add our radial gradient. So I'm going to go ahead and type radial dash gradient just like that. And now what we can do is specify a certain amount of colors. So for example, I'm just going to start out with red and blue. Now if we refresh the page, you can see it starts off red and ends at blue. But we can actually add more than two colors. Just like with our, um, our linear gradient there, what we can actually do is go ahead and type in, let's for example, let's just say green as an example. Now if we refresh the page, you can see that we've added a third color. Now, if we wanted to change the proportions, so for example, let's pretend that this blue is taking up too much space. We don't want that much. We can actually specify how much we want of each. So to change the proportions, what we can do is go ahead and add percentages. So what I'm going to do first is go and specify what I want here. Now, one thing to note is that these have to be in order. You have to have the minimum percentage at, or the smallest percentage at the start and then the largest at the finish. So I'm going to go ahead and start off with something small, like 20%. Then I'm going to have, let's say, 40% blue and 55% green. So now if I go ahead and refresh the page, you can see that there is a lot more green and a lot less blue and red. So the final thing I want to cover for radial gradients is the shape. Now you can actually specify the shape that you want. Now right now I have an ellipse or sort of oval shape, but we can actually change it. All we have to do is type the name of the shape. Now there are two values you can put here, ellipse, which is the default, and circle. I'm going to go ahead and type circle. Now if I go ahead and refresh, you can see that this is in a much more circular shape rather than the previous oval. And although it's not a perfect circle, obviously our proportions are going to change what it looks like. All right, so that's pretty much it for gradients. There's quite a lot to learn about these, and there's a lot more features that you can cover. Um, but for now, I think this is great. Now, what I'm going to do is go ahead and just create um, another gradient, another linear gradient right under this one, uh, just so you can see what it looks like. So, for example, I'm going to go ahead and 
Maybe let's just go for the body background for now. I'm going to go ahead and actually add a linear gradient gradient here. And I'm going to say, um, let's just say to bottom, because again, we want it to just kind of stretch from top to bottom. So now what we're going to do is start off very strong. So we're going to have our main RGBA color or RG, oh, whoops, our main color here. So I'm going to copy this. So this is going to be a fully, um, fully visible color starting from the top. And then we're going to end with a much less visible color. So there you go. Now let's go ahead and refresh the page. And you can see that maybe there's a little bit of an error there. Uh, oh, yep, forgot to spell it. There we go. Now we can go ahead and refresh and you can see it's still not working. Still a bunch of errors here probably. Uh, yep, forgot the, forgot the parentheses there. Just make sure that you're doing this right because sometimes you can make some uh, silly errors. So for example, if you look here, we were actually, we were missing a bracket. So now if we go ahead and refresh, there we go. Uh, it's a lot better now. So we start off with a nice uh, fully visible color and we end off with a less visible color. All right, so there we go. That's pretty much it for gradients. You can go ahead and download this file uh, from the project. You can go ahead and look at how everything works here, mess around with it, see what you can do because um, there is a lot to gradients and although they're not uh, used every day, they're still very useful tools and they can really help you out in your web development careers. All right, let's move on. So in this video, we are going to be talking about some of the different types of units in CSS. So, so far we've been working with some basic coloring techniques. We've learned about selectors and then different properties. And then we've learned about some of these different values, but we haven't actually learned what all of these different things mean, this, this PX, this percentage, and we don't actually know how they work. So what I'm going to be doing today is talking about some of the different types of units and how you can identify which one to use. So first thing I want to talk about is the difference between the two types of units, which are absolute units and relative units. So firstly, we have to talk about some of the units we've already been using. For example, pixels. Now pixels is a little bit special. I'll explain to you, to, I'll explain it to you in just a second, but pretty much the commonly used um, absolute units are things like centimeters, millimeters, and inches, which are absolute. They, it's not dependent on anything else. If you set it as one inch, it's going to be one inch long, no matter if you're doing it on a phone or an ultra wide TV. So that's what absolute units are. They aren't affected by anything around them. The second group are relative units, and these are a little bit different. Relative units are usually dependent on something. So for example, our percentage unit here is dependent on the parent elements, well, unit. So for example, if this service image here, where is it here, has a width of 70%, then that means that the parent element of this service image or this service image right here, which in this case is our body, takes 70% of its width, of its total width. So the whole way through of the body is 100%, and 70% is going to be somewhere around here because that's what we set it as. Now notice that when I start resizing this, you can see that it still takes up 70%. And obviously uh, right now it doesn't work because I haven't refreshed the page, but you can see no matter how small I make it, it's only going to take up 70% of the total body width. So this is really good for something like a responsive design because what happens is when you're using absolute units in a responsive design, Let's say you set this width as 200 pixels. On a phone, it's going to appear very large, whereas on an ultra wide TV, it's going to appear too small. So using something like percentages would be very useful because then you could resize your window here, however you like it, and still have that look that you want. So that's pretty much it for percentages, but there's also a lot of different um, relative values that we could use. And I'm gonna go through all of these in just a second. But the first thing I want to talk about is this special unit, which is pixels. Now, pixels is a little bit different. Now, although it is considered an absolute unit, it is actually relatively scaled based on uh, what device you're on. So if you don't already know, your screen right now that you're watching this video on is made up of a bunch of little tiny pixels. Now, there's this concept in computing, it's called DPI. It's pretty much used to calculate the resolution of your screen. And depending on the number of pixels you have, the resolution is going to change. 
So on low DPI uh, tablets or things like that, anything that has a very low uh, resolution, so for example, if you're on YouTube and you change your resolution to 480p, what's going to happen is then the video is going to sort of adjust how many pixels are in that video. Now, I'm not going to get too deep into how pixels are changed and things like that, but pretty much what happens is on high resolution devices, these pixels aren't going to appear the same as on low resolution devices, because obviously this is taking up only 400 pixels of height. And if you have an ultra high display, a very high definition TV, 400 pixels is only going to be about half of what it is here. So what actually happens in this is on these high DPI displays, each pixel in, in this unit is actually taking up multiple pixels relative to the resolution of the display. So for example, on a TV, every pixel according to this height would actually take up something like four pixels. So this is to give it that absolute illusion. Now, although it is in theory or at its core relative, when you're, when you're actually using it, it is an absolute value. So that's just one thing you need to keep in mind. Now, don't worry too much about pixel, you know, redefinitions, things like that. Uh, we're not focusing on that for now. We're just focusing on how we can use different values for different things. So let's go ahead and cover some of the different units that we can use for absolute uh, units. So the, the easiest way to do this is through uh, changing the size of the text. Now, again, we're going to cover this much later um, in this section, so don't worry about that too much. So the first one we can use is centimeters. So I can say the font size is two centimeters. Now, if I, refresh, if I refresh the page, you can see that it is a lot bigger. Remember, if you actually took a ruler and measured the font size, you would get two centimeters. There's also many more, such as millimeters and inches and pretty much everything in between. So you can see that's also a lot smaller. So we have our standard pixels here, but there's actually a few more that we can use. Now they're not very, they're not used that commonly, so I'm not really going to go over them that much. Um, but there is a, there are, there are some other units that you can use instead of pixels that kind of follow that same formula. So there is something called PT, which are points, and it's a little bit bigger than a pixel. So if I go ahead and refresh that, you can see that that actually gets a little bit taller. We'll go ahead and change that back to pixels. You can see that does get quite uh, a little bit taller. And there's also PC. Again, it's a, it's quite similar to um, PX and PT, but in this case, a PC is a lot bigger. So you can see how much bigger it actually is. Actually, one PC is 12 points. So that just shows you how much bigger it is. So there we go. That's just a little bit of some of the other uh, absolute values. Now let's cover relative values. So the first one, the first one that we actually already covered was uh, percentage. So we already looked at you know our percent symbol over here, which pretty much takes up again uh, a certain size or whatever value of its parent element. But there's actually many more that I want to cover. The first one I'm going to look at is EM. So pretty much what if what I do here is it's going to represent the size relative to the current standard font size. So let's just pretend that we know that this font size is value. Let's just call it F. What's going to happen is if we set the body font size to 2EM, you're going to double everything or double it based on F, which is our font size. So if I set 2EM here, just like that, and go ahead and refresh the page, you can see that all of the text is double the standard font size. So again, this is completely relative to the standard font size. So I'm actually going to go ahead and erase this here and start using style tags instead. Uh, I feel like it's just going to be a lot easier to, you know, move around and easy, easily move that around. So now we've covered percent and EM. So those are the two um, main uh, types of relative units, but there's actually two more that I want to cover, which is view width and view height. So in web design and in development in general, there's this thing called the viewport, which is pretty much the dimensions of whatever you're viewing it on. So in this case, our viewport would be the body's width and then the body's height. So VW and VH, view, view width and view height, actually allow you to um, work, with, um, work with this viewport in a very easy way. So one VW or VH is equal to 1% of the total body width or body height. So remember, this isn't based on the parent element, 
This is based on the total viewport. This could be the HTML document, the body tag, it depends on what you're viewing it on. So for example, if I go ahead and change the width here to 70 VW, this is pretty much equivalent to 70 times 1% of the total viewport. And obviously if I go ahead and refresh the page, uh, you can see it gets just a little bit bigger because uh, there's actually a the viewport itself is bigger than the body tag, which is the parent element. Now we'll talk about that later in the course because it's quite advanced. Um, but what you can see here is that right here doesn't actually affect it because the body is almost completely equivalent to the viewport. But for example, if we wanted to set the font size of one of these TDs um, to 70%, would be, which, would be, which would be 70% of this T row, it would actually look completely different from 70 VW, which is 70% of the total viewport. So that's just one thing I want to keep in mind. You can also set more than 100%. It doesn't have to be completely uh, set in stone. So if I actually wanted to say VH, so 400 times 1% of the view height, what would happen here is that this image would become four times the total height of the viewport. So that's just also one thing to keep in mind. So I'm gonna go ahead and change this back to pixels. And we'll just keep that width the same because it doesn't really make that much of an impact. Okay, so there we go. Those are some of the different units in uh, CSS. I've actually atta attached a little reference sheet that you can use. You can refer to um, uh, to this to this lecture. You can go ahead, click on it. Uh, and if you wanna revise any of these, you can. But just a fair warning, you're not really going to be using um, a lot of these units. The main ones you're gonna use are most likely pixels and percent, but for some cases, you're gonna to wanna to use some other units. So although absolute units are still useful in some cases, so for example, if you want a very specific um, dimensions or viewport on your screen, so for example, if you only want users to access something on the phone, then, or a very specific phone, then you can go ahead and use pixels because it's going to look the same no matter what phone people use because it's all gonna be the same. The only problem is, is when people start using different devices, using absolute values are going to look very different based on what device you're using. And that's why you should tr kind of stick to using these um, these uh, relative units instead of using things like pixels, centimeters, and millimeters. So things like EM percent view width and view height would be very, very useful because then you can scale it based on um, whatever device you want. So for example, it's going to look the same, or at least this width, whether you're using it on a phone or a desktop computer, because again, it takes up 70% of the width, no matter what it is. So that's just some of the basics about some of these units. Now, like I said, you don't need to know these by heart. You can just go ahead and uh, keep them at the back of your head. And once we start using them and start using them in our, you know, fonts, layout, things like that, we'll actually start using these units a lot more and they will make a lot more sense. So this is just a quick introduction to these units and why we should use them. And you're not supposed to be going ahead and, you know, completely mastering every single one um, by now. All right, let's move on. So the next few videos are going to be focused on font and text manipulation. So we're going to be working with actually changing how this text looks. The first thing I want to talk about is there's actually two parts to this section, text manipulation and font manipulation. And although they sound like the same thing, they're actually very different. So the first part in this video, we're going to be covering text manipulation. Now there's not that much to look at, but pretty much the difference between the two is that text manipulation is looking at things that you can change no matter the font. So for example, something like sizing would not apply because the size is going to be based obviously on the font itself. So basically things like underlining or um, capitalization are going to be completely regardless of the font. You can change them no matter what they do. But things like bolding and um, uh, things like size, bolding, things like that, they are completely dependent on the font because again, the font decides how, it, how the font itself is going to look. So it decides the size, the bolding, and just the overall style. So the first part in this video, we're gonna be covering text manipulation. And in the next few videos, we're gonna be looking at actual um, font manipulation. So things like external fonts, which is probably the most exciting part of this course, and things like weight and bolding. All right, let's get started. So the first two things I want to cover are um, text decoration and text transform. 
So these are properties that are going to be relating to the style of the text. Now I know I just said that fonts and mostly styling is dependent on the font, but in this case, these, um, these properties don't actually rely on the font at all. So let's get started. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is text decoration. So although it sounds like you can do a bunch of cool things with this, the only real thing that you can do is change the lining of the text. So we're going to go ahead and work with this anchor tag here. So I'm going to go ahead and add a class. Oh, there's already a class there. Actually, we can just go ahead and select it. So I'm going to go dot link like that. And now what I can actually do is change the lining of this right here. So by default, anchor tags have a text decoration of underline, but there's actually three more properties that we can use. So the, the property to use it is called text dash decoration. It's pretty obvious. Now the first one I'm going to look at is none. So this completely removes the line from our links. They're completely gone. You don't have them anymore. The next one, which is the one by default is underline like that. So that's our normal um, link. Then you have line through, which is line dash through. And it's pretty obvious what that does. It just puts a line straight through. And then of course there's the overline, which is the line on the top. So there we go. Now we have a line on the top. Now, although you won't see the, uh, the two that we just showed line through and overline very commonly, it is very common to, um, see underline and text decoration none, um, applied because sometimes, and I'm sure you've seen this in websites all over the place, you can hover over links and they maybe change color. Uh, again, we'll be learning how, how to do that in this course, but you know, they might change color and do all sorts of things, but you usually don't see them with an underline. So that's where this property comes into play. So I'm just going to change this back to underline just to make things a little interesting. Next thing I'm going to do is go ahead and cover the next property, which in this case is text transform. So you can see that we have a bunch of text here and let's say uh, maybe we're working as a freelancer and our client wants us to capitalize all of our text. How are we going to do that? Now, obviously we're not going to go through and capitalize every single individual word. That's going to basically be suicide. Although it is possible, it could take a lot of time. So the easiest way to do it is using the text transform property. So I'm just going to go ahead and do this on the whole body for now. The property to this is text dash transform. It's pretty easy to memorize or learn these because they don't really require any weird memorization tactics. So now what you can do is go ahead and add our, uh, value. So there are three different values that you can use for this uppercase, lowercase and capitalize. So because we want to capitalize everything, we can go ahead and type capitalize. Now, if we refresh the page, you can see every single word is capitalized without us having, having to actually change the text. You can also go ahead and use the other two, which are lowercase and uppercase. Um, and that will obviously put everything in uppercase for you. But now you're starting to see a little bit about why these are text manipulation and not font manipulation. Again, it doesn't matter what font you're using, whether you're using some weird simple font or times new Roman, you can always use these to capitalize it no matter what the font is. On top of that, you can also move around these lines. It's not dependent on the font at all. So that's just a little bit about our text manipulation properties. So the next feature I want to cover is text align. So this is a little bit different from the other two that we've covered because it's not really focused on the styling or decoration of our text. Instead, it's going to be focused on the justification or alignment of it. So if you've ever used any text editor, for example, uh, Microsoft Word or Google Docs, anything like that, you'll know that you can justify your text and align it to your site. So there are four main ones that are included in CSS, left, right, center, and justify. So I'm going to breeze through the quick, the first three ones, because it's quite uh, easy to use. But then the last one I'm going to talk about a little bit uh, in more detail. So in order to achieve this, you can go ahead and add the text align property. And here you, I'm just going to go center as an example. And you can see that now everything is aligned. So the list items are a little bit weird. They don't actually uh, move the decoration to the center um, when you align it to the center. But other than that, all of the text is now aligned to the center. 
So now let's talk about justify. Now we're not going to go through left and right because we already know that, but what justify actually does, I'm just going to show you here, is pretty much it takes all of the text and it kind of matches it so it's all fit in the same width if you, if it makes sense. So although it might not fit everything in the same length, what happens is all of this text is now stretched out as far as possible. So although you might not be able to see a direct difference, let's just look at this paragraph here. I'm going to just end off this uh, property without changing it. You can see that without the uh, justify alignment, all of these are different. So what actually, what the justify actually does is it sets all of the lines to the same length. So I'm going to go ahead and add that justify back. So you can see this used a lot in research papers and, um, you know, academic papers, essays, things like that. Uh, this justification is used a lot. And although it's not very, it's not really used very commonly, it's still a very good feature if you have uh, big bodies of text, if you're trying to, you know, make everything look very streamlined. All right, there we go. So those are the four, uh, or sorry, three different types of text manipulation um, uh, properties that you can use and along with their respective value. So I encourage you to go ahead and try this out on your own. You can do a lot of things with these three values alone. You can really change how the page looks. All right, let's move on. So in this video, we are going to be talking about the other half of overall text manipulation. And in this case, we're going to be looking at different font properties. So in this video, we're going to be looking at three font size, font weight and font style. So first thing I want to look at is font size. So right now we have our pretty standard um, text here, right? So I'm just actually going to go ahead and erase our text transform from our previous video. So now we have our text here. And what I want to do is change the size of this. The only problem is I want to use a responsive design. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and first use our font size property. And then I'm going to go ahead and say, let's just say uh, 1.25 EM. So what, what happens here is make this 25% more uh, than the standard font size. Now you can see it's a little bit bigger, but it's not as big as doing something like 2 EM. So there we go. Now that we've done that, we can also go ahead and actually use pixel values if we wanted to 40 pixels, for example. The only problem is this is going to set everything consistently. So you can see all of the sizes are the same. It doesn't matter if they're a header or um, well, it does actually matter. But because in the CSS defined code, um, all of these headers actually have two EM. But if we actually removed all of these, they would be the same. So using something like two EM would be great because what actually happens is now uh, everything stays consistent. And it's also a relative unit, so that's always good because it stays responsive. So there we go, that's pretty much it for font size. I'm gonna go ahead and actually change this to 1.15 EM, I think that's good. So there we go, that's the first one. Now let's go ahead and talk about font weight. So this is a little bit more complicated. So pretty much what font weight decides is the bolding of a text or a font. So the values for this can range from zero, which is nothing, all the way to well, pretty much infinity. The only problem is most fonts only support up to 800 or 900 because again, for each value, there's a different bolding stage. So most fonts are only going to go up to maybe 800 or 900. Some of them can go even higher, but in theory, you can make these values as big as you want. The only problem is it's not really gonna show any change if you make them very big. So there we go. That's pretty much it for font weight. Let's go ahead and start adding it to our website. So let's say I wanted to make our title a little bit bolded. So I'm going to go ahead and say font dash weight. And now I'm going to go ahead and specify a value. Let's go ahead and start with zero and see what happens. You can see that nothing actually happens, but pretty much like I said before, most fonts only support certain values. So for example, um, 100 would be a very specific kind of bolding, 200, 300, 400, and all the way up to as much as the font supports. Now, usually the convention for this is you're supposed to go up in hundreds from 100. That's kind of like the minimum supported font size. So if I go ahead and set 100 here, you can see it's very thin. And if I go ahead and set it as 800, which is usually the highest that you should go realistically, this is kind of the standard for H1s. So there you go. You can set it to something like 600, which isn't very commonly seen. Uh, like I said, 
fonts only support certain uh, boldedness, if that makes sense. But you can go ahead and play around with this. And like I said, depending on the font, it's going to change what the text actually looks like. So there we go. That's pretty much it for font weight. I'm going to go ahead and actually just set this to 400, which is the standard um, font right there. So 400 is the normal. It's like uh, normal bolding, no bolding, and don't make it very thin. So that's kind of what it's the normal range. So there we go. That's it for font weight. Now let's go ahead and look at font style. So just like font size is for size and font weight is for bolding, font style is for italicizing. So I'm going to go ahead and actually italicize a small piece of text here. So let's just go ahead into this and I'm going to take this first part and actually just uh, cut it out. I'm going to create a span tag. So a span tag is sort of an, if you don't know, it's an inline, uh, they, it's an inline container tag, which allows you to contain uh, certain pieces of text without, you know, disrupting the flow or moving them onto their own line. So now I'm going to give it a class. I'm just going to say, um, italics, I guess that would work. So then I'm going to go ahead and use the class selector italics, open this up. Now we're going to go ahead and start working on adding our italicizing. So what you can do for this is called font style. And although most of the selectors these days are quite easy to remember, italics and font style don't usually go hand in hand. So it might be a little hard to remember this one. So there's three different values they can use for this. Normal, which is pretty much the same as setting the font weight as 400, doesn't do anything, or it actually will changes it back to its normal state. Then you have italic, which is to italicize it, and then you have oblique, which is um, a little bit more italicized. So let's go ahead and just add the basic one. I'm gonna go ahead and type italic here. Now, if we refresh the page, you can see that where it is. There we go, it's right there. Um, is a little bit more um, the the font the font is a little bit a little bit more italicized. So there we go. Now let's go ahead and set it as the other value, which is oblique. And you might notice a little bit of a difference. So not immediately obvious, uh, but it's actually just a little bit more italicized. So um, like I said, it's not very noticeable, but that's just one thing to keep in mind. So there we go. I'm just going to change this back to italic, and that's pretty much it for the three different font manipulation uh, techniques. Now, although I didn't cover font family, which is what I'm gonna cover in the next video, uh, these are the pretty much three basic ones that you can use to work with text without changing the font itself. So you can go ahead and um, work with changing the font weight, you know, make it bolded, italicized, you can also change the size. So you can really do a lot with this, but font family is a little bit more complicated, which is why I wanna leave it for its own video. All right, let's move on. So in this video, we are going to be talking about the last uh, property related to text and fonts, and that is font family. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, but in the next few videos, we're gonna be actually looking at how to include external fonts, which is gonna be a very uh, fun activity, and that's going to really change the way that we use CSS. But before we do that, we need to learn about font families. So first of all, if you don't already know, a font family is basically a collection of fonts that have similar features. So there are three main font families that you can use, serif, sans serif, and monospace. So first of all, let's talk about serif fonts. So serif fonts have these small lines on the end of some letters, and Pretty much every or a lot of the academic papers and uh, well printed out documents use these serif fonts. So right now, for example, our font is a serif because you can see these tiny lines at the end of some of the letters. So these are used very commonly on, like I said, papers, essays, you know, journals, anything that's pretty much printed out or given to you physically is usually going to use a serif font. But Unfortunately, it makes it very hard to read on the computer. So there's actually a another group of fonts that which is the sans serif group. And if you don't know, sans serif groups are basically the fonts that don't have those lines if it's not obvious enough uh, from the name. So right now, this is a serif font. A sans serif font, on the other hand, would not have those lines. It would look a lot cleaner and easier to read. Now, 
a lot of the websites that you use today, so for example, pretty much all the news websites, um, if you've used WordPress before, that also uses um, ser uh, sorry, sans serif fonts, unless you specify otherwise, uh, Google, Facebook, pretty much every website that you see commonly today, the big ones, usually always use sans serif fonts because they're much easier to read. So those are the two main groups, but like I said, there's also a third one, which is called monospace. So monospace is pretty much where all of the characters have the same width. So they all take up kind of the same um, space, each character. Whereas something like this, you can see that each letter kind of takes a different amount of space um, depending on what the letter is. So some pretty good examples of a serif font are Times New Roman, which is probably the most famous, and Georgia. Some pretty good examples of sans serif fonts are Arial and Calibri. If you've ever used um, uh, Google Docs before, Calibri is a pretty common font. And then a pretty good example of uh, a monospace font is um, Courier New, if you know what that is. Uh, Courier New is one of the monospace fonts, but like I said, there's many more out there that you can use. Um, like I said, uh, it all depends on what family you pick and what, you, what kind of... Uh, result you're trying to achieve out of your font. Are you trying to make it readable? Are you making a paper or a journal? Uh, it all depends on what you want out of your um, well document. So in this case, because we're doing or creating a website, we're going to want to use sans serif fonts. So in order to specify a font family, or in specific a font, you're going to have to use the font family um, property. So if you go ahead and set font family, now this isn't just for setting the family, this is also for setting the specific font, and I'll talk about that in just a second. So I'm going to go ahead and say sans serif. So this is the font family that I want, and watch what happens to our page now. You can see that it looks completely different. We can actually read everything and it looks a lot cleaner. So that's why I like sans serif fonts, and that's why most developers much prefer sans serif fonts over serif fonts. You can see that it just looks a lot easier on the eyes. It's just much easier to read and use. But like I said, you can't, you don't just have to specify the family. You can actually specify the specific font. And you can actually do this using the comma separator. So first of all, I'm going to set Times New Roman as the main font. And then I'm going to insert a comma and then serif. So I'll explain this right now. First of all, if a font has more than one word or it's separated by spaces, you're going to need to use quotation marks to contain it. Now, the second thing is this comma here. Pretty much what's going to happen is if Times New Roman is available, use that as the font. But if it isn't available, then fall back to the standard serif font. So you can actually include more than just Times New Roman on here. So you can include three or even four layers sometimes. Um, but for now, we're just going to use two. And we'll talk about including very specific fonts um, in the next two videos where we're going to be including these external fonts. So there we go. Pretty much what this is saying is set the font family, in this case the font, as Times New Roman. But if Times New Roman isn't available, maybe, you know, if you're using an external font, maybe the server has crashed, or maybe it's just not available on the browser, then use the serif family, just the general serif font. So if I actually go ahead and remove this, you're not going to see much of a difference between Times New Roman and Serif. Um, like I said, you can see there's not much of uh, a change because they're pretty much the same thing, but it is there. And if you use a different um, Serif font, such as Georgia, there will be some sort of a difference between the two. You can see that. Now, although they aren't exactly... Um, they aren't exactly the same. You can see they both contain those lines, things like that. So that's why um, you commonly use more than more than one font, just in case maybe if you're using a different browser, maybe someone's using a very old browser like Internet Explorer 6 or 7, then you can use some of the older fonts. So there you go. That's pretty much it for font families. It's really not that hard to grasp. And once you really get into it, um, it becomes a very, very useful tool. So I'm going to go ahead and actually just change this. But like I was saying, it becomes a very useful tool once you get into the later parts of web development because changing the font can completely change the look of your site. So that's just one thing you want to keep in mind. All right, let's move on.
So in this video, we are going to be looking at actually using some external fonts. We've looked at fonts and text and we know how to manipulate it now, but we don't actually know the one crucial piece, which is using external fonts. So your computer will most likely come preloaded with a bunch of different fonts. If you use things like Microsoft Word or, um, you know, maybe Google Docs, things like that, they all come with preloaded fonts. And although Google Docs technically isn't on your computer, we'll just leave it in there for now. So obviously we have a lot of fonts to choose from in CSS, but first of all, how do we actually know which fonts to use? And what if we don't have the font? I mean, you know, maybe it doesn't come with our computer. How are we supposed to get it? Well, the first thing that I would recommend doing is going and getting fonts from the internet. Now, if you don't already know this, most people would think that, you know, the fonts that you have are set for life. You can't download anymore. Well, fonts are actually a huge growing industry and there are so many different fonts out there that you can use and you can even make your own. So there's obviously a lot more fonts to choose them than what's provided on your computer. So in this video, I'm going to be teaching you how to go and find your own fonts. And then in the next video, we're going to be including it into our project. So the first source I'm going to recommend here, which is actually the only source, um, but it's called uh, Google Fonts. It was put together by Google and it's a collection of 915 font families. So you can see we have a bunch of different fonts here. And when I say font families, just think fonts default because um, you know, when you think of it as a family, you would think there's multiple fonts, but there's actually only one and then you can change the bolding and other uh, settings. We'll go over that a little bit later in this video. So you can head over to this. I've linked it in uh, the lecture resources, or you can just uh, copy the link here from the video and it's going to take you to this site. So there's actually 915 families on this site, which is a lot to choose from. Now you can see that there are even, you know, things in different languages. There's all sorts of different styles, maybe from different um, general families, families. So this could be from, you know, a sans serif family. This could be from a serif family. So you can see um, that there are so many different choices that you can use. And depending on what type of website you want to create, you can actually choose the fonts that you want. So I'm going to actually go through now and start picking some fonts. So what I would recommend is just go through and look at the many different fonts you have here. So for example, I think this is a very nice font. So what I'm going to do is just go ahead and click this plus icon. And what it's going to do here, it says there's one family selected, right? If you open it up, you can see that our font has been selected. Now we're going to work on embedding this in the next video, but for now, I just want to leave it like this. So you can see that we can actually go ahead and customize our font now. So for example, if I wanted to choose some different bolding, so for example, you can see this is a font weight of 100 and this is a font weight of 900. So you can select as many as you want, but you can see that we actually have a load time here. So the reason that this is given is because we are including this from the internet, obviously. So if you try to pull too many resources from the internet or from, you know, um, outside of your local machine, it's going to really slow down the load time of your website because obviously it's not into instantaneous. You need to send over requests and there's a whole lot that goes behind. So what I would recommend is not trying to select every single one of these weights, only select the ones that you think you're going to need. So for example, for now, I'm just going to select the regular and the bold. Now I don't want any italics. So I'm just going to exclude this and you can see that our load time is fast. So we're okay. So you can see that apart from our boldings, we can actually select um, some of some of the stuff from here. So instead of having to go into our selection, we can actually just go and straight select it uh, from here. We can also change the size if we wanted to. Um, and then we can click the plus icon. So you can uh, go ahead and play around with those when you include your own fonts. Uh, but for now, I think I'm just going to go with the default size and just add a bolded. So now I'm going to go ahead and actually include a second font because it's pretty uh, common in web development and web design to include at least two fonts, you know, maybe one for headings and one for text. So I'm going to go ahead and find something that kind of fits in with the Leto font that we have here. I'm going to just select it uh, back to the default size. So I'm going to try and find something that kind of matches this. Um, it doesn't have to be obviously exactly the same. It can just be something that, um, you know, kind of fits in with the theme or makes the website look good, kind of complements the other uh, font. 
So I think this is good. It's actually ser uh, serif, so I don't, I'm not going to use it. You can see those lines there. I'm looking for a sans serif font. Um, let me see. So I think this is a pretty good font. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and add this as well. Just click on that plus icon. And now we can actually customize both fonts. So I'm going to go ahead and add that bold 700 as well. You can see that the load time is moderate now because of course we're including more than one font, but we don't need to worry about that too much. So there we go. We have that set up now. So there we go. That's pretty much it for Google fonts and you know using all these different fonts. Now you can go ahead and customize it, choose whatever makes your website look good or maybe uh, whatever you want. But just make sure that you choose a font that really works with your website well and make sure you don't include too many different weights uh, so you can keep the load time uh, within Bay. So in the next video, we're actually going to go through and start importing this into our website. And I'm going to teach you some really good fail safe tricks in case Google Fonts fails. All right, let's move on. So in the previous video, we started looking at what type of fonts we can use in our website. Now we're going to go through and actually include them. So first of all, let's just look at our website for now. We have all of our fonts set up and we have a bunch of text manipulation uh, ready to go and working on the website. But now what I'm going to do is actually go through and start using these external fonts. So we're not going to use this uh, Arial font anymore. So I'm going to go ahead and erase that. And also for the font weight, I'm also going to go ahead and erase that because uh, there's some issues with it that I'll talk about in just a second. So there we go. Now that we've removed all of the uh, properties that will be directly affected by the font, let's go ahead and work on um, setting up our website with these external fonts. So the first thing you'll notice here is that when you go over to your Google fonts, it gives you this link tag to include. So this link tag is pretty much going to um, link to Google fonts and pull them from their servers. So this is what you're going to need to copy right here. So you're just going to copy this and up in your uh, HTML document, you're going to paste your link tag above your style sheet. Now make sure you post it above this above your style sheet because you want to have the fonts ready so that when your style sheet comes along and the compiler is reading it, all of the fonts are already there and ready to go. So there we go. Now that everything's linked and set up, why don't we go ahead and see what happened on our website? Well, obviously we we'll, we remove the font, but you can see that nothing actually happens. So by doing this, we don't actually set up our website to use our fonts. We're just bringing them into our website. Now what we need to do is go through in CSS and start utilizing these fonts so that we can see the changes on the website. So on top of that, this there's this little text here that allows you to, um, you know, you can just copy the style straight, but I'm going to go ahead and do it manually. So first of all, let's go ahead and add our body font. So I'm going to go ahead and say font family. And now we're going to go through and select our font. So we included two fonts, Leto and Saraboon. What we're going to go through is go ahead and see which one we want to use. So I'm going to use Leto for the body text. So right here in quotes, I'm going to go ahead and say Leto, just like that. And now let's go ahead and refresh the page. And you can see how much of a difference that makes. Now, using this new font, everything has changed. It makes the website look completely different from what it used to be. So there we go. We've included that. But let's go ahead and include our second font here. So I'm going to go through and actually add it on the title and the subtitle. And remember, going back to specificity, the class and ID selectors are going to be more specific than the body selectors. So our font family is going to override the body font family. So let's go ahead and add that uh, right there, just like that. And let's go ahead and add it to our subtitle as well. All right, now let's go ahead and see what happens. So you can see that although the difference is quite subtle, it still changed the font of the titles and subtitles. And you can see why using two fonts on your website makes it look a whole lot better. So there we go. We've added all of our fonts. But the only problem is, we know that what ha what's happening beside behind the scenes is that this link tag is going to Google servers, pulling these fonts, and then including them in our website. But what if it fails? What if there's no internet connection? Or what if it's down? Maybe the Google font servers themselves are down. 
This is where we need to use the trick we learned in the font families video in which we can actually add a backup font to this. And if we actually go on Google Fonts right here, you can see they already do this. Now because the sans serif family is included by default, what's going to happen is normally it's going to use the font specified. But if there's some problem and we can't get these fonts, maybe Google servers are down, it's going to go over to the next font. And we know that sans serif is included on every single machine, which means that it's going to work fine. So let's go ahead and do that. Now if you remember, all we have to do is go ahead and add a comma and then put the name of the family, which in this case is sans serif. We're going to do this for the other two as well, and this one as well. Now, of course, this is going to change based on the font that you use, and I'm actually going to show you this right here. Let's remove both of these and add a serif font. So this would be considered a serif font. Let's go ahead and add that. Now, if we go ahead and look at the family, well, it's actually not, um, not serif. It's a different family called cursive, but you can see, just to prove that point, that the family is going to depend on uh, the font itself. So we explained a little bit about font families in that video and obviously all of them have different characteristics. So of course, like I said, it depends completely on the uh, type of font. So if I go ahead and see the family there, you can see that that's sans serif. But if we use something like um, this font, it's going to be a different font family. So that's just one thing you need to keep in mind is that you want to make sure your fallback font is both included on every machine and it's kind of similar to our font here. Now if I actually go ahead and erase this, now let's go ahead and see, obviously there is a visual difference but it still has that same style. There's no lines, it's clean to read, it's just straightforward. So that's one thing you want to make sure of. Alright, so that's pretty much it for fonts. Next we're going to move on to layout which is really going to change the way that this website looks. All right, let's move on. So the next few videos are gonna be focused on CSS layout. So we're pretty much done, at least for now, with coloring and text and all of the cool features we can do with them. But now we're gonna actually go through and start using our uh, skills with different, well, new skills that we can actually put together and create really, really nice, awesome websites. So layout is probably one of the most powerful tools that you can use in CSS and can completely change the way your website looks. But before we move on, we need to learn a little bit of theory behind how CSS works. So there's this concept in CSS called the box model, and it's pretty much the, the um, what happens is every single element is surrounded by an invisible box. Now this box has different layers, which we're going to explain in the next video, but all of these boxes are touching together. They're kind of connected. And what you can do is actually change the shapes of these boxes and change the shapes of the layers in order to move things around and position them on a page in a way that makes the website look much better. Now obviously this isn't the only way of shaping your website. There are so many different methods, flexbox and grid, and we're all going to cover them later in this course. But for now, this is the basic kind of layout features that you need to use so that you can move on and start using some of the most complex features. So this is kind of what that invisible box looks like. So at the center is where your content is. Now I'm going to explain this in just a second, all of these little terms, padding, border, and margin. Um, but you can see that the center contains the content, but then the other three layers are something completely unknown. And we're going to be going through and explaining what those do. But for now, just understand that you have the content on the center, but then there's this invisible box around it that is split up into three layers. So let's go over the first one, which is the padding. Now the padding represents the space between the content and the border of the content. Now you can see up in this model, we have this padding section and then we have a border. So pretty much what the border does is it separates the content and the padding from the margin. But pretty much, let's just assume for now that the margin kind of move things around and it doesn't actually move the content around. What padding is supposed to do is it's basically supposed to give more room around the content itself. It's not really meant to move the content around. So It'll make some more sense when I go over margin if you don't understand it now, but let's move on to the next layer. The border is pretty much the divide or the separation line between the content, the padding, and the margin. So borders can be styled and changed and 
by default they're invisible, but we can actually go through and change how they look, which we're going to be going through uh, in a couple videos time. So the border doesn't actually create any spacing or anything itself unless you want it to, but pretty much what the border is supposed to be is kind of that division line. So the last uh, layer that I want to talk about is the margin. So just like how the padding is supposed to give spacing or well padding around the content, the margin is supposed to move the content around and give it space between other elements. So while the padding is used for internal space, the margin is used for external space and is made so that to give room and spacing around external elements. So for example, if you have a, an image and then a, some text under it, you can use the margin of the text to kind of push it down from the image, whereas the padding would just kind of make internal space. Now, although it's not the best example, as we go on and start using it, you'll get this a lot more if you don't already. All right, so that's pretty much it for the box model. It's a very, very simple concept, but it can be really used to a very high potential, and it does contain a lot of features that we're gonna be going over in the next few videos. All right, let's move on. So now what we're gonna be doing is going through and starting to use the first layer of the box model, which in this case is the content itself. So although not technically a layer of this invisible box, it's still a big part of layout and the shaping of things on your document because the way you shape and well style your content is going to completely change how the rest of the box model is affected, your padding and your margin. So what we're going to be doing is going through and using some of these. And if you actually remember, right here we have already used the two main features of shaping content, height and width. So we've already pretty much learned these properties, but I'm going to go through and do a couple more examples just so you can get the shape of things and how to use them. So first thing I want to talk about is the units that you should use. So usually on a page, the best way to do this is using pixels or some absolute unit for height, but then for width, use a relative unit such as VW or percentage. Now we do this because although height is very, very hard to determine, responsively at least, they kind of stay the same as you move down. So the height is going to kind of stay consistent. The only problem is the width completely changes everything. So the width of devices is very different from place to place. So a phone would be quite a small width, whereas you know a full screen TV would be a very wide width. So that's why you use relative units for width is that you can keep it consistent while still, you can keep both of the values consistent while still using different units. So let's go through and actually use it on this image here. So the first thing I wanna do is go ahead and give this a class, or actually I'm gonna give it an ID. So I'm going to give it an ID of about us image, just like that. All right, now let's go ahead and select it here. I'm gonna go hash about us image. Remember the ID selector. And now what we're gonna do is go through and start adding our, um, uh, our properties. So the first thing I'm gonna add is the height. So I'm just gonna make this a cool 300 pixels just to see how it is. And most of this is very experimental. You're not supposed to go through and change everything and um, you know, well, well you are, but you're not supposed to go through and set everything to a constant value. So you're supposed to you know, play around, see what works, and then when you're familiar with it and once you know what you want, you can leave it as it is. So there we go, we set the height. Now obviously this with the width of the image itself is always relative, but I'm gonna go ahead and change it anyways. I'm gonna go ahead and say the width is 60 VW. Now you could always say 60%, it would pretty much be the same thing, but I'm gonna go ahead and use VW here just to, um, actually, you know what, we have VW here already, so I'm gonna go ahead and add percentage. There we go. Now of course you could use whichever uh, unit you want, they're gonna mean pretty much the same thing, um, obviously apart from the different viewports and things like that, but they're pretty much the same for our purposes, so you can use whichever one you want. So there we go, we've changed it, and now if we go ahead and resize, oops, you can actually go ahead and see that the width is gonna be pretty much the same while the height stays constant. So one thing I wanna talk about is a really cool feature that we can use in Chrome, and you can see that's a little bit weird there, but we'll worry about it, we'll worry about that later. 
um, is a really cool feature that allows you to actually change the viewport of your Chrome window without actually having to use different devices. So if you go ahead and click on that icon, just right click anywhere on the page, click on inspect, and it's going to bring you here to this page. And you can actually select any device you want from the drop down menu and see how it would look on that on that device. So I can pretty much do whatever I want here. Uh, if I wanted to select an iPad, even an iPad Pro, um, you can actually see what it would look like on the device. So this is a really useful feature that you can use to make sure that your website works everywhere instead of having to go and upload it somewhere and then view it on all those different devices. You can also set select this responsive design, which I really like because then you can change the size however you want, uh, just like that you can see and um, it will work perfectly. So yeah, that's great. And you know, if maybe if you don't want to use these uh, devices from this drop down menu, you can actually go through and change the size here, which is really useful. So I'm going to go ahead and close this off now. And you can see that our website is looking good. Obviously, our image here looks quite weird. But like I said, it's all about experimentation, you're supposed to go through and see what works. Um, and obviously you don't have to use an absolute value, it's not set in stone, but you're supposed to go through and see what works for you and from there you can set the values. So this is just kind of a little experimental uh, thing to teach you how to use these features. Uh, but like I said, this website's all about, or this course is all about practicing and getting experience with this. So you can go through, uh, check out the project files and play around with these values yourself. Really get a feel for how this works. So that's pretty much it for content resizing. It's very easy. There's only two properties you need to know. And pretty much the rest of the box model is also quite easy. Um, but it's good that we learn it step by step so that we master every stage. And by the end of it, we'll really know how to master the layout and really manipulate our page in the best possible way. All right, let's move on. So in this video, we're going to be focusing on one of the parts of the box model, which are borders. So in the previous video, I talked a little bit about some of the different layers of the box model and how they work. But in this video, we're actually going to be focusing on manipulating one of those layers, which is the border. And although it's not the, really the main part of the whole box model idea, it's still a pretty useful skill to know. And it really helps you understand how the box model comes together. All right, let's get started. So for the next few videos, we're mainly going to be working with the images simply because they're just easier to uh, manipulate and set the layout uh, over something working with something like uh, text or titles, things like that. So we're going to be working with our circular gradient here that we created in a previous video, as well as this custom image. So let's get started. So now there are many different styles that you can use to style the borders, but we're going to be using the main shorthand that allows us to style everything all at once. So the, the property is similar to our background property here. All you need to type is border. Whoops, we need to do on the image. So I'm going to go here on our uh, radial gradient and I'm going to start adding our border. So let's go ahead and get started. So what I'm going to do is just type border and remember every single element has a box around it, has this box model or invisible box. So it doesn't matter what you choose, you can always style these elements. It might look weird on some uh, elements like this text here, but you can do it with everything. So there are three main parts to this um, element here. First is going to be the size. So we'll talk about that in a second. Then you're going to have the style, which is probably the main part. And then finally, you're going to have the color. So now that we have this, we can go ahead and start talking about this. So size is pretty similar to, you know, changing the size of an image, for example. Yeah, it can be in pixels or percent or EM, it doesn't matter. I'm going to go with pixels for now. Now the usual range for a border is somewhere between, you know, one and three or four pixels. We can go much thicker than that, depending on what you need. So I'm going to go ahead and show you what two pixels look like. So remember, separate it by a space. Now we're going to go over the style. So there are many different styles that you can use on your borders, but there's three main ones that we're going to talk about, or sorry, four main ones we're going to talk about. Dotted, dashed, solid, and double. Now normally you're going to see solid, that's pretty much the most common one. I'll show you the other uh, versions of this in just a second. So I'm going to go ahead and type solid. And now comes the color. So as we learned before, before this can be a named color, this can be an RGB code, or even a hex code. 
I'm going to go ahead and just choose um, a darkish blue. I think that will fit in really well with the page. And in fact, you know what? Let's not let's not use the color picker. Let's just use our RGB color skills and take the color of the background, which is here. So we're going to take those four. And now I'm going to go back to our image here and paste it in. Oh, whoops. And now what I'm going to do is just darken everything. And if you remember, the darker it gets, the higher all of, oh, sorry, the lower all of these values get. So I'm just going to lower them all by uh, about 50. So here I'm just going to go 154. Now again, this doesn't have to be exact or anything. You can, you can put really whatever you want here, but I'm just trying to darken um, everything. I'm just going to make this 200. So let's go ahead and refresh the page and see how our border looks now. Let's scroll down. So there's the problem. We actually forgot a um, semicolon here on the end of the background. So that's uh, one thing you need to keep in mind. There we go. Now it's working. And you can see, and I did actually change the color there just to test it out. And you can see, there we go. We have our background. So obviously it's pretty obvious here with our bright red color there, but what I'm actually going to do is go ahead and just play around with some of these and see if we can change the features. So first thing I'm going to do is go ahead and change the height. So I'm going to go ahead and set it as 10 pixels, for example. And you can see that the, oh, not the height, sorry, the size. And you can see that that gets a lot thicker. So you can change it depending on how you want your border to look like. So now let's go ahead and change the style. So let's go ahead and try out some of these other styles. So first I'm going to try dotted. So you can see now we have a dotted border. Now let's go ahead and try dashed. And you are kind of getting the idea of how this works. Let's see doubled, I think, or double actually. I think that's uh, probably the best other than solid. Yeah, you can see that that looks um, pretty nice here. Uh, we have that double border. It's pretty useful in styling, but it's not really used uh, very commonly. So the last thing I wanna go ahead and change is the color. So um, I'm going to go ahead and just take a color from the color picker. I don't really feel like going through the whole RGB process again. Let's go ahead and just take this color. It's quite dark. Um, I'll just go ahead and refresh our page and see what it looks like. And now you can see the color has changed. So you can see that borders are not only useful for just changing the style of this of an image or a box or any box for in that for that matter. Um, they're also useful for showing how the box model works. So I'm gonna go ahead and change this back to solid so you can get a better view. So if you remember in the last video, we talked about the different layers of the box model and we remembered that the padding was used to separate um, or create spacing between the content and the border. In this case, you can see that the border and the content are directly touching, which means there is pretty much no uh, padding at all because there's no spacing between them. On top of that, you can see that this border is also touching also elements on the page or other elements on the page. So like for example, this table, there's a little bit of space between the header and the image, but that's due to other uh, margins. We'll talk about that when we get uh, later in this section. And so you can see that this doesn't have much margin either. So you can start to see here how this whole box model comes together and how you can see um, what's going on. So yeah, that's a pretty useful way to kind of look at the box model and see how everything comes together. In the next few videos, we're going to be looking at the other layers of the box model, and then we're going to bring it all together and start really changing up this the way this website looks. All right, let's move on. So in this video, we're going to be moving on to the next two main layers of our box model. And in this video, we're going to be talking about margin and padding. So you kind of already have an idea of what these two are. We've talked about them in the first video. We've talked about what they do, <clears throat> but we haven't actually talked about how to manipulate them. So in this video, what I'm going to be doing, what I'm going to be doing is going through and working with these two properties to actually manipulate um, our layout. And that's when the real power of the box model shows. So let's go ahead and get started. The first thing I want to do is go ahead and choose the right, um, thing to manipulate. And in this case, the best thing to work with is an image right here because it's very easy to see and um, <clears throat> see the changes 
uh, when you when you uh, do these margin and padding changes and it's also very uh, useful to have a border here which I added uh, so you can really see the difference between margin and padding and to see which one uh, is responsible for what. So let's get started. Now, similar to the rest of the properties, the naming is pretty straightforward. In this case, we're gonna go ahead and use the shorthand margin property, but I'm also gonna be showing you a few other ways, um, which I didn't show you with the border because these are a little bit easier and they're kind of hard to understand if you just use the shorthand property. So I'm gonna be just building it from the ground up. So the first property I'm gonna look at is of course the shorthand margin property and how to add margin and padding to all sides at the same time. So in case you didn't know, this is called top, this is called bottom, this is left and this is right. But I'm sure you know that, especially with uh, working with multiple backgrounds, things like that. And pretty much the same throughout all of CSS. So let's get started. So the first thing I'm gonna do is go ahead and find my image. And then I'm gonna choose which box model layer I wanna manipulate. I'm gonna go ahead and work with um, padding first because it's a little bit easier to understand. Then we're gonna go and work with margin. So we're just gonna type out padding here. And now what we're gonna do is go and start adding uh, whatever we want. So remember, if you add just one value, it's going to add it the same value to all sides. So I'm gonna say, for example, right now, 20 pixels. Now, if I go ahead and refresh the page, you can see that there is 20 pixels of space in, uh, between all sides of our image. So you can see 20 pixels on the left, on the right, on the top, and on the bottom. So you can see what's going on here with our padding. If we increase this value, for example, it's, gonna, it's going to almost double. And now we have 40 pixels on each side. So that's just a little bit of information about padding. You can see the spacing between the content and the border is getting a lot bigger. Now let's go ahead and change this to margin and see what happens. So I'm actually just going to completely remove this and refresh the page. So now let's go ahead and add our 40 pixel margin. We'll just save for now so you can really see the difference. So now you can see that the content or the space between the content and the border is still the same. There's no spacing at all. But you can see that everything around it has kind of been pushed down. And remember, it's adding margin to all sides. There's 40 pixels between the border and the left side of the page, the border and the top side, the border on the right, and the border and the bottom. So you can see that margin is moving the image itself around the page, whereas the padding is just adding space inside the image. So now let's go ahead and talk about some of the more specific properties in case you wanted to maybe style specific sides. So I'm gonna go ahead and change this back to padding, just like this. And now we can go ahead and see our differences a lot more clear. So what you can actually do is add a dash and then the name of the side to it to actually specify which side you want the padding to be added to. So let's just say I wanted to add it to the right side. Now if I refresh the page, you can see that all of this still stays the same, but on the right side, there is 40 pixels of padding. You can do this with as many as you want. So you can go padding top, for example, and I want 100 pixels on the top and let's just say on the bottom. And remember, always with the dash, I just want only five pixels. Now, if we go ahead and refresh the page, you can see it looks quite unbalanced, but we have 100 pixels on the top, we have 40 pixels on the right and five on the bottom. Now, obviously this gets a little bit tedious after a while, after you keep, you know, doing padding right, top, bottom, left, top, right, top, right, bottom, left, and it gets quite um, irritating after a while. So what I'm gonna do is show you a really cool shorthand that you can use to style them all at the same time. So we're gonna go back to using our shorthand property. And now we're gonna go ahead and add four values separated by spaces, but it's a little bit confusing at first, okay? So just bear with me. Now, what I'm gonna do is for the left, I don't want anything. So, oh, whoops, I need to start from the start from the top. So on the top, I want 100 pixels, like that. On the right, I want 40 pixels. On the left, I don't want anything, so I'm just going to say zero. Now, you could say zero pixels, but in this case, we don't want anything at all, so it doesn't really matter which one you choose. I just prefer to put a zero there. Um, and then, of course, on the right, uh, sorry, on the bottom, we want five pixels. Now let's go ahead and refresh and see what happens. It stays pretty much, oh, whoops, must have uh, confused confused something over there. So 100 on the top, we have 40 on the right, and on the bottom, uh, yeah, so there's the problem. 
on the bottom we want five pixels and on the left we want zero. So you can see it gets quite confusing uh, after some time. So you can see that now it's exactly the same. So here's what you have to kind of uh, remember. The first one is the top, the second is the right, then the bottom and left. So an easy way to remember this is by looking at the pieces of the border. If you draw a diagonal line straight in half, you style the top and the right first, and then the bottom and the left. So just keep that in mind and you'll be fine. So if you if you ever forget, you can always go and check online. There's a lot of references talking about um, these different values here. And I'm actually just going to go ahead and change it to margin for a second so you can see what's going on. Now you can see if I change the margin, actually it stays in the same position, but instead of adding internal space, it's adding external space. So that's just uh, one thing to keep in mind. But like I said, if you want to go ahead and review this, you can always find some resources online. There's a lot going on there. Now let's talk about shortening this into actually only two sections, because let's just say on the top and bottom you want a certain margin, but then on the left and right you want another. This is a pretty common thing that you, you're you going to want to do in CSS, so I'm going to show you how to do that. All you have to do is go ahead and shorten it to two values. I'm actually going to go ahead, yeah, I'll go with margin. The first two values are going to be for the top and bottom at the same time. So I'm going to go ahead and add 80 pixels of padding. Oh, whoops. 80 pixels. There we go. And now for our so oh, whoops. Now for our second value, it's going to be our left and right values at the same time. So I'm going to go ahead and add 40 pixels. Doesn't matter the order um, because this is always going to be for the top and bottom. This is always going to be for the left and right. So just make sure that they are um, equal. So let's go ahead and refresh. And now you can see the left and right have kind of stayed uh, a little bit shorter, whereas the top and bottom are very, the margin is very big. As you can see here, the top and bottom is double the left and right. So that's a nice shorthand that you can use to um, style two different, or well, two different sides. So for example, now if you split, if you can just take this part and this part, style, this, style them at the same time, and then you take the left and right and do the same thing with them. So I know that's a lot to take in and it's a lot of different ways, but just remember um, if you ever get confused, you can either use the internet or just use margin dash and then the position. Um, but other than that, all you need to know for now is the concept. You just need to know how margin and padding work and how you can actually manipulate them. What they do, I mean, what do you do when you say the margin left is 10 pixels? So just make sure that you know that, you know, when you add a certain space to a position, you're basically changing the spacing between something and another thing based on what whichever layer you chose. So for example, if you chose padding, you're going to be changing the spacing between the content and the border. So that's pretty much it for margin and padding. Now we're going to get a lot more experience with this as we go through the course and style more things. But for now, just make sure you know how to use these shorthand properties, you know how to use all those different shortcuts. Now you don't need to memorize them, you just need to know kind of how they work. Um, obviously memorizing them is good, but if you, if you forget them, don't worry too much about that. Just make sure you know how to use these properly, um, and that's pretty much it. Let's move on. So this is a pretty important video because we're talking about a concept that is going to be used constantly in the next few sections. And it's a very, very important part of CSS and kind of defines the way that you look at documents. So the two properties that we're going to be looking at are float, which is the less important one, and display, which is the very important property that we need to learn. So let's cover float first because it's an easier uh, thing to approach. But before we start, for both of these elements, you need to understand the concept of inline and block level elements. So first of all, elements have a certain display type, which we're going to be, well, manipulating in the next property. This display type pretty much defines the behavior of the um, element. So there are two main display types, block and inline. So pretty much if we look at our HTML document here, we go through and you can see all of these tags. Creating these tags create a sort of sort of display behavior for the content inside them. 
So the block level element, what it basically does is move moves everything onto its own section, its own, well, block. So an example of one of these elements would be um, a P tag. You can see that if this was an inline element, it would be flowing with the rest of the things. But you can see here, despite the margin, this is moved onto its own section. It's not playing or moving after the image. It's moved onto its own section and everything after it comes after, well, the block. On the other hand, an inline element is something that won't really move anything onto its own section. It's going to keep it, um, keep it intact. It's not going to move it or change it in any way. It's just going to leave it how it naturally occurs on the page. So an example, a very good example of one of these would be a span tag because what a span tag pretty much does is it's used to contain some piece of content in an inline style. So for example, this italics class would be a perfect um, representation of an inline tag. What we're trying to do is, is italicize some text. And if the span was a block level element, this text here, this italicized text would be moved onto its own section. So everything preceding it would come before it, and then there would be a new line with the text, and then after it would come the rest of the text. So you can see there that the inline and block level tags really make a difference depending on what you want to use it for. So what we're going to be doing in this video is going through and learning how to change the display type of these different elements. But first, let's talk about float. So again, these tags come with a natural display type and how, are, how they are placed on the page is how they naturally occur. But there's actually a way to change the way that they look. And this is done using float. So if you just listen to the name there, what the element pretty much does is change how the element, well, floats on the page. So I'll go ahead and do uh, do some examples here. For example, let's just take this um, gradient here, this div. So I'm going to go and look for it, the service image. I'm going to say set the float, and I'm going to say it floats to the right. And watch what happens. You can see that now what happens is pretty much this just flows over to the right side of the page and it also changes all the content after it. So you can see that this content here has now been pushed up. So this kind of shows how a little bit of how float works. And this doesn't just have to be with images. We can do it with text as well. So if I go through and choose something uh, like this element over here, this um, link here. So I'm going to go ahead on this link and I'm going to say it floats to the right. Now let's go ahead and refresh the page and you can see that that kind of flows over to the right and everything before it is now kind of pushed up where it was. So you can think of this as kind of a kind of a Tetris puzzle block. When you're moving something over, everything is going to be pushed up or moved around as well. So to fit the page. So you can kind of think of it in that way. Now, obviously, um, once you start getting some really a lot of experience with float, you can kind of predict where everything is going to move on the page. But floats are really useful for laying out documents, especially if you want to kind of position images next to text or move things around in a way that looks more like a uh, proper document. So I'm going to remove that float and I'm just going to do it with our um, image over here, with, with our image, our about us image. So I'm going to go ahead and say it floats over to the right. See that? So now you can see that it floats over to the right and now everything before it has kind of been pushed up onto this section here. So there we go. Now it's working and everything is looking great. Now let's look at the next property, which is display. So display is pretty much a way of, well, changing the display property of an element that it naturally comes with. So of course we know things like a div or a paragraph tag come as a block level element, whereas something like a span or a bolding tag would come as an inline element. So what we're going to be doing is going through and changing these properties. Now I didn't actually cover the properties of float, which I'm going to go over in just a second. Um, but what I'm going to talk about is the different properties of display. So of course you have the standard inline and block, which is pretty obvious, but then you have um, a few others. So the, the one that I'm going to be covering here is none now. So what the display none property does is pretty much just completely 
re almost remove the element from the page. Now it doesn't actually remove it, but what happens is the entire, that invisible box that contains everything just suddenly disappears. You can't see it anymore. It doesn't take up any space. It's just completely gone from the page. So I'm going to show you what that looks like right now. Let's go ahead and, for example, let's just say that this table is kind of annoying. We don't really want it here. So what I'm going to do over here in my table is give it a class of uh, site table. Now I'm going to go ahead and select it here, dot site dash table. And I'm going to say display is none. Now watch what happens. You can see that that table completely disappears. And it doesn't even take up the space anymore. It's not like the table is just invisible or not, not well, not visible, but it's completely gone now. This is very, very commonly used um, once you start using JavaScript and once you start making your sites interactive to maybe create web games or hide something, maybe uh, create some sort of hidden token. It can be used for all sorts of things. So this is a very useful display property. So I'm going to go ahead and remove that. Now the next one I want to talk about, and I'm actually going to, I'll just keep it there if we decide to use it later. The next one I'm going to talk about is inlined block. So we know that we have two different display types, inline and block, but there's actually a combination of the two, which is a little bit hard to understand, but once we start using it, you can see how useful it is. So inline block is a little bit well, like I said, it's a little bit hard to understand, but pretty much what it does is take features from both inline and block level elements and combines them together. So we know that inline elements do not move anything onto their own line. We know that they stay in their place. They don't touch anything or move anything around. Whereas block level elements move them onto the new line. Now, what happens is that inline or this inline block element takes that new takes that sort of new line feature and removes it completely. It does not move anything onto its own new line. But what the block level elements do is they actually create some spacing around the element once it's moved onto its new block. So the inline block element then takes this and puts it into itself. So the inline block element pretty much keeps everything in the same line, but creates that block level spacing that it can be found in other block level elements. So let's go through and actually demonstrate how this works. I'm going to go back to my table and add our inline block display property here. Inline block. Now I'm going to go ahead and refresh the page and see what happens. So you can see that it's kind of kept on the same line, but it's given that sort of spacing or, well, block level spacing that you can't really find with a normal uh, inline element. If I actually go ahead and change this to inline here, you'll see this uh, very apparent. You can see that that uh, click here to Google text has now moved around. There's a little bit of a weird box here. So you can see the difference between an inline element and an inline block element. So there you go. Inline block is a very useful display property. You can use it a lot in your website to maybe lay out grids and all sorts of things like that. And we're actually going to be using some very special display properties later in this course. Uh, called flex and grid, which are really going to help us create these beautiful grids and layouts that can transform our website in every way. So that's pretty much it for display. Now let's go on to talk about some of the other float properties because I kind of wanted to save it for last. So we already know that there are two main float properties, which are left and right. But there's actually a few more that we can use that are sort of different and they're not very conventional, but they're still apparent and they can, um, well, change the way that, well, a, an element floats on the page. So the first one is the most interesting one is the one that is, well, the only real floating element, which is called inherit. So you can see here that we have child elements and parent elements. Now, what's really interesting is what can happen is if we have, let's say, a div with an h2 and an image in it. What we can do is pretty much set the divs float as right, and we can set the one of the child elements, such as the h2, we can set its float as inherit. What's going to happen is it's going to take the float property of the parent element. Now, you're probably asking why this would be useful at all. Well, pretty much what you can do is you can actually lay out 
um, multiple elements without having to specify their float uh, as long as they're children and parents. So for example, if you have an element that's maybe four or five levels deep and you don't want to specify the float every time, you can just use an inherit element to move everything to the right side with only specifying the float once. So the last value I want to talk about is the is the none value. So this is kind of the default value that you're going to see um, if you don't specify anything. And it's pretty much just going to keep the um, item in its place. It's not going to change its float or its display, and it's pretty much not going to move it around at all. It's not the same as display none though. It doesn't really remove anything. What float none pretty much does is just leaves it where it naturally occurs in the text. So for example, if you have a block level uh, div tag and you set its float to none, then it's just going to appear as a block level element. It's not going to move around or do anything uh, similar. So there you go. That's pretty much it for floats and displays. We're going to be working with these a lot throughout the rest of this course, and they're very important properties. So I recommend you get some practice with them and start using them so you can see all of the different ways that you can use um, the display and float properties in your website. Now, apart from the box model and a few other ways, displays and floats are a very common way, or at least they were, of manipulating your website and making it look um, really good. So without it, the website is just kind of everywhere. All the elements are scattered around. But if you want to really make the website look how you want it to look, you need to use this in combination with a few other features that we are going to learn in the future in order to make your website look great. All right, let's move on. So today we're going to get started with a new topic in CSS and this is a very exciting one because we're going to start learning more about very advanced layout techniques. So in the past we've learned about some pretty basic layouts. We've learned about floats and displays and the box model but they're not really enough to create the best websites possible. To do that we're going to need some extra advanced techniques which is what we're going to be covering in the next three sections. In this first section we're going to be looking at CSS Flexbox. Now, we're going to give a quick, or I'm going to give a quick introduction to it in this video. We're going to be talking a little bit about what it is, how it works, and how you can apply it and what you can do with it. Um, but for now, we're just going to go ahead and get started with it. So first of all, what actually is Flexbox? So if you don't know already, Flexbox stands for Flexible Box. And similar to the box model, it's a concept in CSS. Uh, or a feature that allows you to create and arrange items or well elements very easily. So it's a great alternative to using something like the box model or floats or displays if you want to create very responsive websites or lay out your items in a way uh, that makes it look great. So this is an alternative to using those traditional techniques that were used in earlier versions of CSS. So the Flexbox or the main Flexbox is split into two different components. You have the container and the flex items. So the container is the parent element. It's what is going to become the container for all of the items. Now, usually what you would do is use this on a div or some other form of container element and then use some special properties, which we're going to be covering in the next video to create the flex container. But then the next part is the flex items. So this can be pretty much anything you want. Images, links, um, spans, whatever you want, you can add them as flex items. And this is what makes up the flex box. Now what you can do with these two components is actually uh, use different properties to manipulate them and create really nice layouts like this one that we have here. And that's what we're actually going to be covering in the next few videos, is learning how to uh, manipulate the container as well as the items inside. So what can you actually do with Flexbox? Well, you know that you can create these nice responsive grids, but what would you actually use them for? Well, although it might not be apparent, pretty much all pages these days use some form of CSS layout, whether it be the box model or Flexbox or CSS grid, which we're going to be covering in the next section. There are so many ways that it can be used. Flexbox is mainly used to lay out a website or create different components. So for example, the top of the page is going to contain your sidebar. That's one flex item. And then you have the right side of your page, which takes up maybe 30% of the page. And that's your side, uh, or yeah. So the top is your menu, for example. And then the side on the right is your sidebar. And you have the rest as content and you have little widgets everywhere. And you can start to see how this 
all connects together. You can create really good looking websites by creating one huge flex container and then creating a bunch of separate items, putting all of your different things in those items. So it's pretty much just a way to lay out your website. Now in the past, we've used floats to move images around and we've used also margin and padding to push things up and down, but that's not a really efficient way. It's more of a, a kind of hack to move things around and using something like Flexbox pretty much lets you do all of this naturally. All right, so there we go. That's a little introduction to Flexbox and how it works. Now what we're gonna do is go ahead and go onto our machine and start creating some Flex containers. All right, let's move on. So in this video, we are going to be going ahead and creating our first Flex container or Flexbox. Now, I already have some uh, apparatus set up here so that we can get started straight away without having to go and do anything uh, with any of the styling. And this is the best way to really see how Flexbox works because um, without it, you know, it's just kind of look, it's going to look kind of weird, all the invisible backgrounds and things. So I think this is the best way to really see and demonstrate how Flexbox works. All right, let's get started. So, well, it's actually quite easy to set up a flex container. The hard part is creating it how you want, but it uses the display property, just like any other uh, item on this page. So when we set the display to block or inline block or inline, we do all of that, but we can actually set it to flex. And what that's going to do is create our flex container. So all we have to do is go ahead and find our parent element, the container that we want, and I already have the class set up here. Uh, if you want to go ahead and do this on your own, you can. Uh, like I said, if maybe if you want to copy these styles, for example, you can go ahead and check out the project files. Um, but like I said, you can just go ahead and create your own setup so that you can start working with it. So first of all, we're gonna go ahead and find our parent element. So in this case, these are gonna be our items in the future, and then this div is our main element. So I'm gonna go over here, and I'm going to go ahead and give it the display property of flex. Now, instead of doing something like block or inline block, instead, we set it to flex. And what this is gonna do is create our flex container. Now watch what happens. You can see now that instead of having it just in a row, all of these items have been spaced out accordingly. Now all of the default values of all of the flex properties have now been set up now that our display mode has been activated. Now in the next few videos, we're actually gonna be going through and manipulating these properties. For example, changing the order, we're going to change the size and width of these, and we're gonna go ahead and justify and align the content. But that's for a future video. For now, all you need to know is that by setting the display property to flex on a parent container, it's going to set up all the default values of the flex properties and create the flex container that we want to work with in the next few videos. All right, let's move on. So in this video, we are going to be covering two of the properties of our flex container, direction and wrap. So right now we have everything set up. We have five flex items here labeled A to E, and then we also have our container. But now we're gonna go through and start manipulating it. So the first thing I wanna talk about is flex direction. So pretty much right now it's laid out in a row here, but what we can actually do is specify the direction that we want our items to go in. We can also reverse the order using a special suffix. Let's get started. So the property that we're gonna use is flex direction, flex dash direction. And you add this to the container, uh, to the flex container. So here we're going to specify either row or column. Row is the default value and it's going to be going in a direction to the right side of the container. But we also have column, which is what we kind of saw before. And you can see it's a little bit better spaced out. And you can see it goes A to E, except it goes in a column. Now that's pretty easy to understand, but we can also go reverse. So instead of A to E, it goes E to A. All we have to do is add dash reverse to column or row, and it's going to flip the direction that our item is going in. Let's refresh, and now you can see it's going in reverse. We can also do the same thing with row, or pretty much any other value uh, for this uh, property here. 
you can see now it goes E to A and it also goes in the opposite way to the left side of the page instead of to the right side. So that's it for flex direction. It's very easy to understand. I'm just going to go ahead and set it back to row, the default. The next item I want to talk about is flex wrap. So this is a little bit more complicated to understand, but once we start using it, it gets quite easy. Pretty much when you wrap an item, it's going to move it to a new row or column to avoid the exceeding the maximum length. So for example, if we had more than the specified amount of items here, so if we had A, B, C, D, E, and then F, G, H, I, and all the ways to K or L, we don't want it to keep going on forever. So what we want to do is once it gets to a certain length, wrap, length, wrap it around and move it to a new line. So I'm actually going to go ahead and do that here. I'm going to go ahead and copy all of these items, pretty much double it. And then I'm going to say F, G, oops, H, I, and J. And now let's go ahead and refresh the page and see how this looks. You can see we have now A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J. And of course, it's not going past the page yet, but we can actually wrap this around and see how that looks. So all we have to do is add the flex dash wrap property. And now we can either specify, we can specify one of two values, wrap and no wrap. So I'm going to go ahead and say wrap. Now, if we go ahead and refresh the page, you can see that instead of kind of squeezing in the space or changing the spacing, it just moves this to a new row. We can also go ahead and use wrap reverse, which pretty much, well, it does the exact same thing, but it reverses the order. So now if we go ahead and refresh, you can see that this whole thing is kind of flipped. Now, normally you won't see wrap reverse used, so I would just go ahead and learn how to use wrap and no wrap. Now, of course, if you're going to go ahead and use no wrap, it's usually because of some inherited value because again, no wrap is the default value uh, that's used. So you won't really see it commonly in CSS. Let's go ahead and set the property back to wrap. So those are the two main properties that we are going to cover in this video is wrap and flex direction. Now, of course, these are two very basic properties, but they're still very useful and you can really see how this can be used commonly inside um, our website and inside web development as a whole. All right, so that's pretty much it for these two properties. Let's move on to some of the other properties that we can use on our flex container in CSS. So in this video, we're going to be talking about two very important elements or well, properties that can be used to justify and align flex items inside of a container. So we're going to be talking about two main properties. One of them is going to be responsible for the horizontal alignment and the other for the vertical alignment. So let's talk about them. The first one, which is for horizontal alignment, is called justify content. Now, both of these LO, both of these properties actually contain three main values, which are shared between the two of them. And then each of them contain two special values, which actually align them in a pretty different way than you would expect. So let's talk about justify content. Now, first of all, you'll notice that these are a little bit stretched out. Don't worry about that for now. That's just because of the uh, added height to the container. We'll talk about that in just a second, um, but let's get started. So the first three properties that are pretty common are flex start, flex end, and center. So flex start is going to be where the container starts, which in this case is on the left. On the other hand, the end is going to be the opposite. So on, on, in this container, it's on the right and then center positions it in the middle. So what I'm going to do here is just set it as center for now. And you can see that now all of our items have been centered in the middle here. If I set it to something like flex end, and remember it does contain a dash in there, it's going to move everything to the end of the container here. So those are the three main values. Let's talk about the two special ones now. Now, pretty much these ones are going to be messing a little bit with the spacing between these, but they are still related to alignment because it's changing the spacing in a way that does actually align uh, our elements here. So the two main values are space around and space between. So let's talk about space between first. What happens is that space, the spacing between the flex items is created so that it's all equal and it creates equal divisions to move everything on, well, equally divided from each other on the same row. On the other hand, space around 
actually create spacing on all sides of the item. So instead of just creating them between, it's going to create them between some of the flex items and the edges. So though that's the main difference between the two and it depends on what you really want. So for example, if you want a centered kind of item or a centered flex box, what you would do is use the space around property. Whereas if you wanted something to be stretched out, you would use the space between property. So there we go. Those are some of the little um, items or values that you can use on your justify content property. Now let's move on to align items. So this is the property that aligns it vertically. Now by default, it's set to stretch, which is what we can see here. So it just stretches all the way across down to the bottom of the container, but we can actually change this. So let's go ahead and add this property, align items. Now what we're gonna do is change it to center. So just like before, we have three main values, flex start, flex end, and center. You can see that immediately, now all of these items are still spaced in between, but they have been moved to the center here. So you can see here that on the align items, this has been arranged vertically. It, this is the start at the top and the, st and the bottom, or the flex end, is well at the bottom of the container. Justify content says that flex start is on the left side and the flex end is on the right. So there we go. You can see what this is, what this looks like right here is when we align the items, it centers it in between the top and the bottom. So let's go ahead and just see what the other values look like. So for example, flex start. So for let's just say you want to keep the height of these items the same. You don't want to stretch them. This is what you would do. You could also set it to flex end if you wanted something to appear at the end of a page. And yeah, that's pretty much it for those three main values. Now let's talk about the two special values. So these are a little bit different because they don't follow some general convention, but the two values are baseline and stretch. Now we've already covered stretch a little bit in the beginning of this in which we could set stretch as our default value and all that does is just align it all the way through from top to bottom, but baseline is a little bit different. Now unfortunately we can't really see the effect uh, apparent right here, but pretty much what happens is that all of these items, no matter their size, are aligned to a baseline. Now if I actually go and add some inline styles to override some of these, so for example B, I'm going to, let's just say I'm going to make the line height, which is a property we haven't actually learned uh, yet. What we're going to do is just set the line height to, whoops, a little bit of a problem there. And I'm going to set this to 100 pixels, like that. And now what I'm going to do is go ahead and refresh the page and see what happens. You can see that this is a little bit higher, but they're all aligned on the same line. You can see that the fonts here have been changed a little bit. Not really, it's not really apparent here, but you can see the heights are different, but they're still all in the same line. So that's what baseline actually does. It just, no matter the size or the font text or anything, it's all going to keep them or it's going to keep them all on the same well, baseline and that's what it does. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and remove this inline style since we don't need it. And those are pretty much the two main uh, alignment properties. Now, if you wanted to align something to the center of a flex box, what you would do is just set justify content and, ju and align items, both of them to the center. And what that's gonna do is just align everything to the center of the flex box. So that's what I've just done here is I set both of them to center. So that way, on the top, it's centered between the top and the bottom, as well as the left and the right. All right, let's move on. So for the first part of this section, we've been talking about a lot of the properties that we can use um, for the actual flex container. So you can see that we've covered five here, the display type, which is to create the container, the direction, wrap, and our content alignment properties but we haven't actually talked anything about the items themselves because we've just been looking at the container. So that's what we're gonna be doing over the next few videos is looking at some of the properties that we can use um, on our items themselves to change how they look. And that's when the real power of Flexbox comes in and really shows how it can be used. So the first item that we're going to be covering or property in this case is flex item order. Now, instead of adding this directly to the container, we can actually go through and add this to the 
flex items themselves. So I'm going to hold control or command if you're on Mac and go ahead and add our style property to all five of these flex items because what we're going to actually have to do is add this property to all of our items. So it seems like a new line was created there. Let's get started. So pretty much what we're going to be doing is using a property to change the positioning or order in this case of our flex items. So I'm going to go ahead and create that multiple cursor feature again. And the property we're going to use is order. Now what we can do is go ahead and start specifying our order. So pretty much what we're going to do is go through and uh, change what this looks like and how this looks like in um, our place here. So what we're going to do is go and specify our values and then we're instead of having it from A to E, we're actually going to go through and add something to make these properties look in a different way instead of having to actually move all of these around. So instead of moving the divs around and you know changing all of them, we're actually going to go through and specify some numbers. So let's get started. So what we're going to use for this is numbers. Now this ranges from one all the way up to as many numbers or as many items as you have. Now the default value is zero and this is just going to keep it in its position, but we can actually specify the number to see where it lands. So let's just say that I want D first. What I'm going to do is go ahead and under my order property, add a one, just like that. Now I'm going to go ahead and add E. So I'm going to set my order to two. Now, if you've worked with computers before, you might think that it starts with zero, but in this case, zero is our default value. So we're not actually going to be using that. So I have D then E. Now let's say I want B next. So I'm going to put it under the third position. Now for C or actually A, I'm going to put it as the fourth position and C is the last. So let's see if this holds up here. We refresh the page D E B A C. So you can see that we can actually change the order of these flex items directly from our CSS instead of having to go through and move them around. Now you might, now you might be wondering why this could be useful at all. Now, although it might not be apparent here because we haven't actually gotten or used any JavaScript, once you start making your website interactive, this becomes a very useful feature because you can't just go through and program something to move the divs around in your HTML document without using some sort of file reading. Instead, it's much easier to just add a style to it where you can change the order, maybe even randomly. So you can see how this would work. And although, like I said, although it may not be useful in this case, it will definitely be useful once you start learning about JavaScript and start making your websites interactive. So that's a little bit about flex order. Now, just one thing, you don't actually have to use it with an inline style tag, but it would be much easier considering that if without it, you'd have to go and add an individual class to every single item. Now, of course, it's much easier to just go ahead and add a style tag to each of these, but if you want to use it with a class method, maybe you already have an existing class, you can go ahead and do that. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm just using this because it's a lot more convenient and easy to use. All right, so that's pretty much it about flex order. It's quite easy to learn once you know how to uh, find the positions of items and how you know how to uh, order them in the right way. If, as long as you know the number of items you have, it's very easy to position them just the way you like it. All right, let's move on. So in this video, we are going to be talking about three very important properties that come with Flexbox, which are Flex Grow, Flex Shrink, and Flex Basis. Now, although it might not seem like it, these actually are completely responsible for the responsive power of Flexbox, and it's what really makes it what it is today and why it's used so commonly over things like floats and display types. So first of all, if we look at it now, it might seem that flex grow and shrink just specify the width and height. And although they sort of do, they are very different when it comes to the core concept and how it's decided. So the first thing we need to do is talk about the flex basis property, because from there, we're going to define everything else. Now, we all know that we have five items here and they take up a certain amount of space each. 
but you can see that there's all of this extra room here on the side. So what actually happens is these properties work to define how the extra space or this uh, remaining excess space is divided up between them. And from there, we can actually specify the widths uh, based on the, you know, browser width and it's all responsive. So it's all decided completely based on the browser and on the properties that you define. So the first thing I'm going to do is go ahead and actually add this property to all of them. And I'm going to explain why in just a second and why we need to do that. So what I'm going to do is first of all, I'm going to go ahead and add the flex grow property then the flex shrink property. Now we're not going to use all of these in one go. We're just going to do this um, gradually and then our flex basis. Okay, so let's talk about flex basis first. What this does is it pretty much defines the minimum width of, of an item or a flex item. So this can be any value. It doesn't just have to, it doesn't have to be a specific number or unit. So for example, I'm going to go ahead and set this as maybe a hundred pixels for each one as its minimum width. We go ahead and refresh the page and now you can see it's a lot wider, but you can see that there's still this extra space. So this is where our flex grow property comes in. Now what happens is if I actually go ahead and go to all of them and set them all as one, what this is pretty much going to say is every flex item is going to get the same amount of extra space. So you can see that this gets, if all of them are one, they all get the same amount. Let's go ahead and see that when we refresh the page. You can see now there's only a little bit of margin, which is normal, but all of them are divided up equally now that we've set them as one. But what happens if we go ahead and actually change this value? Let's go ahead and, for example, set our fifth item as two, maybe. So now you can see that although it's not much bigger, it is a little bit bigger. So what this is pretty, um, let, me go, let me go ahead and set it to actually something a little bit bigger so it's more obvious. So you can see now this is a lot bigger than the other items. So pretty much what this is saying is our fifth item, this container item, is going to get five times as much excess space as the rest of the items here. So one thing you need to know about flex grow is that you need to add this property to every single one of them and make sure that they have a defined value. If they don't, if you want them just to give them a default space, give them a value of one. And this is because what happens is when you don't give them uh, any value, if you give this flex grow property to anything, it's going to eat up all that extra space. Let's go ahead and demonstrate this now. I'm going to go ahead and erase all of this, all of these flex grow properties just temporarily. And then I'm going to leave it on this one. Now I'm going to set it to one. Now you might expect this is to be just a little bit bigger, but let's see what actually happens. If we go ahead and refresh the page, you can see that this is actually bigger than when we set this to flex, this flex grow property to five. So what's going on here? Pretty much what's happening is the default value for our flex grow property is actually zero, which means it's going to remain at the same width and it's not going to take up any excess space. So pretty much what's happening is when we set this to one, everything else is not taking any excess space, leaving it all to that one value. So all of that extra space is taken up by this block here. And you can see that and it's prove, proven because there is still no excess space here since it's all taken up by, by this property. So what I would recommend is before we learn the flex property in the next video, just go ahead and add this flex grow property to every single item or container if you plan to use it. So now if we go ahead and refresh the page, you can see that that's working great. Now what's the advantage of using this? Before we move on to our next property, if I actually resize this window right here, I'm just going to resize it, you can see that when it grows, it still takes up the same proportions of excess space. Now we'll talk about getting smaller in just a little bit, but you can see here that it does actually take up the same proportion and that's where the really responsive power of Flexbox comes in is when you're resizing your windows and browsers and there's all of the different devices, this actually stays the same. So let's move on to our next property now, Flex Shrink. So we know that the basis or the minimum width is 100 pixels. That's the minimum it can go. 
But when we actually shrink this down and all of these get smaller, I'm actually going to go ahead and remove the flex uh, wrap property from here because it's it's um, a little bit intrusive here. And although it's not good for this, it's not good for this example, we'll go ahead and use it later. So when we go ahead and actually shrink this window, you can see that that proportion is actually lost. So what's going on here? Pretty much when you go below the minimum width, whether it's defined on our flex basis or the minimum width of the, um, of the, con of the container item itself, what's happening is that proportion is completely removed and you go to the default value of flex shrink. So flex shrink is similar to flex grow, except what happens is it defines the rate of shrinkage of each container item, again, relative to the rest of the items. So in this case, what we have to do is go ahead and look at how this shrink property works. The default value for this, unlike flex grow, is one, not zero. So what this is saying is shrink each item at the same rate as all the other items. And that's why we can see that once we go under the minimum height, or sorry, minimum width, you can see that all of those items begin to look the same. So what I'm going to do here is actually go ahead and show you how to manipulate this. And this is where the real responsive power comes in and where you can really change how everything looks on different devices. All we have to do is go ahead and specify the value that we want here. And one thing to note is that if you don't want something to shrink, you can just set the value to zero. So for example, if I wanted to uh, remove the shrinkage of our fourth item here, or let me go with our first item right here. All I have to do is go ahead and set, set sorry, our shrink value to zero. And what this is going to say is don't shrink the item. Even if it goes below, do not shrink the item at all. Let everything else shrink. Let's go ahead and see how this looks on our site. So we're going ahead, we're, we're removing that space, but you can see that our first value does not shrink at all. So there we go. Now let's go ahead and start adding our shrinkage values to the rest of our um, items here. So what I'm going to do is first add a value of one to all of them, just like this, just to keep everything the same. And now what we're going to do is go ahead and start manipulating them. So first of all, let's go ahead and say that we want our middle value to shrink three times as fast. So we're going to go over to our middle value and change the flex shrink to three times. So now we go ahead and refresh the page. And when we shrink it, you can see that that value shrinks three times as fast as everything else. So you can see that and it's pretty uh, apparent there. So there we go. That's pretty much it for our three values. Now, one thing I forgot to mention is if your flex shrink is one and it's not there on purpose, you can actually go ahead and remove it since the default value is one. I forgot to mention that in the, um, when I started changing them, but there we go. Now what I'm, what I'm going to say is why would you use something like this flex grow and flex shrink? When you're laying out entire pages based on Flexbox, you want to make it as responsive as possible. You don't want to go and, you know, have it look completely different on one device to the other. What you can actually do is use this to change the look of a website depending on what device you're on. So for example, you can use this property to change the look of a website on a mobile phone versus on a widescreen TV. It's going to be completely different and you can do this using only a few properties instead of having to go and define entire styles for separate devices. So from here, we can actually really see the true plow power of Flexbox. From here, we can go ahead and actually model our website with just a few styles that are very streamlined and efficient to change the look of a website completely on different devices. So I hope that was a little bit easy to understand. Now I know it's quite hard to wrap your head around, but this is the core concept of Flexbox and it's what really makes Flexbox what it is. So if you understand this, the rest of Flexbox and using it is going to be a breeze. All right, let's move on. So in this video, we're going to be moving on from flex, grow, shrink, and basis, and actually talking about a really useful shorthand property that can summarize all three of these into an even more streamlined method. 
So in the past video, I talked just briefly about the flex property and pretty much what it is, is a shorthand to use the flex grow, shrink and basis property in one go. So we can use this to our great advantage because instead of adding all of these properties to every single one of these items, we can actually just summarize it down into one simple property. So let's go ahead and talk about it. Pretty much the flex property, which is the property that we're going to be using, follows or takes in three values, the grow, the shrink, and the basis. So what we're going to do is first add our grow. In this case, it's one. And then we're going to add our shrink, which is the default value of one. And that's just a little tip. If you don't actually have it defined, just go ahead and set it as the default value. So just a quick summary, grow the default is zero, which means it's not growable. Uh, the default shrink value is one, which means shrink it at the rate of everyone else. And then the there is no default for the uh, basis property unless you use something like auto. So what you can do is go ahead and define that as 100 pixels. Now what we're going to do is go ahead and do it for the rest of these items. Flex, flex, just the property. Here we're going to go one, which is the grow, three, which is the shrink, and again, 100 pixels for the basis. And you can start to see kind of the rhythm that I'm getting into here. Five for the grow, one for the shrink, which is the default, and 100 pixels for our uh, basis. Let's go ahead and do it for this one. And like I said, you can see the rhythm here and you can just go ahead and do this very quickly without having to manually go through and add all three of these properties. One, one, and 100 pixels. All right, now let's go ahead and erase all of these other unnecessary properties now that we have our flex property. Just like that and erase that. So if we did this right, pretty much what's gonna happen is everything is gonna look the same. Since all of our values are still working, we just threw them into a shorthand. Let's go ahead and first, before we refresh, check out the behavior. Oh, whoops, something's going wrong there. Yeah, there we go. So let's just check out the behavior. We shrink, B gets smaller, D doesn't shrink uh, at all. And we, when we size up, our last value gets bigger. Let's go ahead and refresh the page and see if this worked. So when we shrink, D is supposed to say the same and B gets smaller. There we go. So D stays the same and B gets smaller. And if we enlarge it, you can see that C gets larger. So there we go. You can see how all of this works. Instead of adding three properties, we can actually just go ahead and do this in one straight swoop. Just go through and add all of all three values using one property, the flex property. All right, let's move on. So this is going to be the last video on Flexbox, and I'm sure that we've summarized all of the different uh, things that you can do with Flexbox in this section and then you can go off and start using it and creating all sorts of really cool responsive websites and layouts with it. But for now what we're going to be doing is going through and learning the final property. Now we've learned how to align all of the elements at the same time in our flex container. We learned how to align it both vertically and horizontally. But what we're actually going to be doing is learning how to align each item. And remember, because each item is laid out width, well, width-wise in a certain way, we can only align it vertically. So just keep that in mind for now. So let's get started. Now, in order to align it vertically, we use the align items property to work with and align all of these. So in this case, what we did with our container is aligned all of them to the center. But what we're going to be doing now is going through and aligning each individual item using a special property called align self. Now, one thing to note is that this property will override the align items property if you have it enabled. So for example, if I wanted to align this to the top, it would override our center and would align this only, only and only this item to the top. So let's get started. First thing I want to do is go ahead and add the property. And remember, we have to go and add it just like everything else. Uh, so I'm going to go through and add it now. So first thing I'm going to do is go and let's just take our first item, for example. Where is it? There we go. So now I'm going to go ahead and add a line self. And now we can go ahead and add our different values. So let's go ahead and get started. 
I'm going to go ahead and try something just like with the normal values. Let's go ahead and say flex start. So just like our other values with our default container, what we can actually do is align them with the same values. So center, flex start, and flex end. So let's go ahead and refresh the page. And you can see now that that specific item, which is D, or the first item, is aligned to the start of the flex container, whereas the rest of the items are aligned to the middle, which is based on the align items property that we had on our container. So now let's go ahead and create a sort of V shape out of all of our items here. So what I'm going to do is first go and add um, our flex, uh, sorry, align self uh, property to all of our values here or all of our container items. And now what I'm going to do is start styling them. So we know that the first one is at the start. We want the second one here to be in the center. So although it's already defined, I'm just going to say center to make everything a little easier to read. Now we're going to go ahead and look for the third one, which needs to be at the bottom. So what I'm going to say here is flex end. And let's go ahead and refresh working so far. Our fourth one has to be on the same level as E. So we're going to keep that in the center here, wherever it is. Let's see. Uh, yeah, it's the fourth one center. And now we want our final one to be at the top as well. So it is a little confusing to read with the orders, but after a little bit of looking, you can see how this whole thing works. Now, obviously, it's a little bit out of proportion because of our uh, sizes here, but you can see that our thing is still responsive. It's still uh, resizing in the same way. We just align the items differently. All right, so there you go. That's pretty much how this works. And one thing to note that before we move on is you can't actually use stretch and baseline on aligned self. They just don't work because they are kind of container specific properties and they won't, they work off of values of the container. So aligning it on an item just wouldn't really work in the same way. So that is one thing you need to keep in mind is that you can only use these three values. All right, so like I said, we were moving on and learning about all of the different alignments. And now that we've learned how to align each item, we can really use this along with our flex property and some other uh, Flexbox properties on the container to create a really nice responsive layout. So I encourage you to go ahead and try this on your own, create your own flex layouts, and don't even just use these blocks. You can go through and use images and forms and all sorts of things and just style them in a way that makes the website look good because now that you've learned the tools to create a responsive container, you can go through and actually start practically applying it to the real world. All right, let's move on. So in this video, we are going to be looking at grid versus flexbox. Now in the previous section, we looked at flexbox as a whole. We looked at all the different container properties. We also looked at some of the other properties that we can use on our items. But today we're going to be looking at a different type of well, layout property, and that is grid. So before we get started, I'm going to give a little introduction to grid and what it actually is. So similar to Flexbox, grid is a display type that's going to allow us to work with our layout and our CSS in a different way. So again, they are both completely al complete alternatives to some of the other layout features that were used in the well older times and in other versions of CSS. So what we're going to be doing is, again, in this section, going through, looking at the different types and what we do with grid and how it actually all fits together. So now that we know some of the similarities, let's look at the differences. So although they are both alternatives to our, um, to our different layouts, what we can actually do is look at how they work at a core level. And although they are completely the same in what they achieve and they're core goals, they are completely different in how they work. So first of all, the grid system is a lot more manual. It requires, uh, well, it doesn't require, but you can control your container in a much uh, easier way. So you can really customize your layout and see how everything fits together with a lot more tools. So one of the, the main difference is how the grid system focuses on both width and height. So although Flexbox does have some height features, it's mainly focused on the width of uh, flex items in the container, whereas grid is focused, very focused on 
providing both tools for width and height to create well a grid. And that's really the reason for the name is because it is more focused on creating a grid, providing tools for columns and rows and all sorts of things that we're going to cover in the next few videos, looking at, you know, some of the tools that we can use in grid and the inherent differences between grid and Flexbox. So I hope that was a really in-depth view at the differences between Grid and Flexbox, and we will go through and talk more about them as we go through the section, uh, you know, learning more tools and properties that we can use on our Grid. All right, so I hope that you took a lot from this video, and although you're not really supposed to know anything about how they work, it's good to keep in mind about some of the differences between them and draw your own conclusions about whether you should use Grid or Flexbox depending on what type of website or uh, application you are creating. All right, let's move on. So in this video, we are going to be starting creating our different grid items and working with our grid. So I've already created and set up a little uh, playground or sandbox for our grid here. We've pretty much adopted the same style as the Flexbox here using uh, all of our different uh, you know, widths and heights and all these different blocks. But I encourage you when you're doing this on your own to go ahead and experiment around, maybe use some different items. I'm just doing this because it's easy for demonstrations. All right, so let's get started. Pretty much grid and well, Flexbox have very similar ways of activation. They both use a display type or the display property to set or activate the container. Now, the only difference is, is, is the property that it, or sorry, the value that needs to be used to activate these, which is pretty fair, which is fairly obvious. So let's get started. First of all, we need to put it on the container. Remember, we're not working with the items. We're working with the container as a whole. So all I need to do, similar to how we created our flex container, instead of saying flex box or grid box or whatever, all we have to do is type in grid. And what this will do is set up our grid container. Let's go ahead and refresh. And you can see that although, uh, you know, it may not appear that nothing has changed, we have activated a whole range of properties that we can now use on our grid here to set up everything and start creating our grid. Now you'll notice that when we set up our flex box, so many things different, so many different things changed. But with our grid, we actually need to go through and set up the grid um, by ourselves, which is what the whole manual element about it, which is where the whole manual element comes in, is we have to go and create our grid and sort of shape it in a way that suits our needs. All right, so that's pretty much it for creating the grid. Now, I know this wasn't a very heavy video, but there are going to be a lot more concepts that we're going to need to learn in the future. So this is quite an easy video, just setting up the grid. And now that we've done the easy part, we're going to go through and start learning some of the more difficult parts of CSS grid. All right, let's move on. So in this video, we are going to be moving on with grid and start creating and setting up this grid to really just define the style that we want to use for our website. So what we're going to do is go ahead and get started with some of the two basic properties that we're going to be using, which are template rows and columns. So unlike Flexbox, we can actually specify the number of grids, or well, the number of rows and columns that we want manually and create the exact style that we want to divide up all our elements. So what we're going to be doing is using two special properties that we can go ahead and use. And what this is going to do is allow us to split up our grid into a specified number of rows and columns, which we can then divide the items up into and then start specifying the sizes and other parts of these items. So like I said, we're going to be going through and, you know, doing all of this. And as we go through, uh, in this section, we're going to be getting more experience with rows and columns and some of the other core concepts in grid that will allow us to really shape up this grid box that we have right here and start applying it in different places. So let's get started. So like I said, the two properties that we're going to be learning today are about template columns and rows. So pretty much what this does is sets up the grid to start off with a certain number of rows or columns, depending on what 
um, property that you're using. And then from there, you can actually specify the sizes of each column and row. Now we're not to changing individual item sizes yet, but we can actually go ahead and change the size of each individual row or column to create alternating sizes and or, or alternating uh, boxes which have alternating sizes. So let's get started. Now the two properties that we need to use, which are pretty easy to learn, are grid, template columns, and rows. Don't forget about areas for now, we don't need to know them. Um, now what we're gonna do is set up our grid template columns first. So instead of doing something where we may be taking a function or something, this is actually set up in a really nice and elegant way. And all we have to do is type out the sizes that we want. And based on the number of sizes or values that we input, it will decide the number of rows that we want. So I'll give you an example here. Let's just say I wanted the first row to be 10 pixels wide, which is pretty small. Um, and then I wanted the second one to be 50 pixels and the third one to be 10 pixels again. So what we're pretty much doing here is setting up, setting it up so that we have three columns because we've passed in three values. The first is going to be about 10 pixels, which is very, very small. The next one is going to be 50 pixels. And then the last is going to be 10 pixels. Now let's see how this looks. Now, if you don't already know this already, columns are going downwards, not this way. So let's just keep that in mind. We refresh the page and you can see what kind of an effect that has here. We have a lot of empty space open here, again, because we're using absolute values and not relative values, um, or at least relative to the box that we have here. You can see that our boxes here are really divided up in a weird way. So our first column is 10 pixels, very small. And then the second one is, it's getting really mixed up, you can see here, with our wrapping and all of this different stuff. And of course, we don't have those lines to show us how our grid is set up, but you can see that doing something like this would obviously really mess up the grid. Now, obviously, you're not gonna go and set all of this to 10 pixels and 50 pixels, but you can just see what kind of an effect this has already. We haven't even created any rows yet, and we've already completely customized the way our grid looks without touching or doing anything. Unlike Flexbox, we had to actually really go in and specify it in a way that changed everything. So let's get started on some of the next on the next one, which is our grid template. Um, what's it called? Rows. So what's going to happen here is it's instead of specifying the columns, we're going to go ahead and specify the rows and it works in exactly the same way. All we need to do is pass in a set number of values and it'll decide what we need for us. And just one thing to note, these don't need to be the same. Imagine it, imagine it as sort of a table here. We have three columns going downwards and three rows going from left to right. So let's go ahead and specify this here. I'm gonna go ahead and say, I only want two rows. So I'm gonna say the first one is 50 pixels, the second one is 250 pixels. Now let's see how this looks. So you can see again, this whole thing has expanded and now our first row is much smaller and our second row is a lot bigger. So you can see already what you can do with this and the true power of, as of using these template columns and rows as I've explained before, but this isn't a really convenient or efficient way to create a nice looking grid because how are we supposed to know the um, elements or the amounts of each device, especially with, you know, all these different viewports and sizes. We, we need to keep this consistent across all devices. So there's actually a really easy value that we can use, which is called auto. Now, if we actually go ahead and set all of our rows to auto, what's going to happen is it's actually going to divide the space evenly between the three, no matter the size. And I can also even go ahead and do this with my rows. And now if I refresh the page, you can see this looks a lot better. Now you can kind of see how the spacing is working here. We have three columns and obviously there's nothing in our third column for the bottom row, but then we also have two rows. So it's kind of split down the middle. And now we have our three elements up here and our fourth and fifth element down here. So you can see here that what's happening is it's dividing the space evenly between um, our elements or our grid. And if we did actually go ahead and remove one of these values and change it to an absolute value, so something like 100 pixels, what's going to happen is the remaining space is going to be kind of 
divvied up between the two columns. And obviously it doesn't look like it here because we don't have spacings enabled. There's a bunch of things going on behind the scenes, but what happens is the remaining space is kind of divided up between the two columns. So you can see already that with these values, we can create some really nice looking grids without even having to do much work. Now, what I would recommend is instead of going and specifying all of our absolute values, go ahead and just create the number of columns and rows that you want while also using auto values. Because later in the future, what we're going to do is learn some techniques to split up our items and make them look a lot larger without having to change the size of the columns and rows because it is a much easier, it's much easier to work with our items rather than the grid itself. All right, so that's pretty much it for template columns and rows. Now, like I said, just for any other exercise, I recommend you to go ahead and play with this on your own. Try and create your own custom grids and throw in images and all sorts of things in there. Play around with it and try and see what you can create and just try and come up with as many cool, crazy ideas as possible because there is a lot you can do with just these two um, uh, properties, which are grid template columns and grid template rows. All right, let's move on. So in this video, we are going to be looking at some more properties relating to the grid container. Now, these properties are very similar to the ones we learned in Flexbox, which is actually somewhere up here where we've learned how to justify and align items in different ways. But there are very similar concepts. The only problem is some of the values and the properties themselves are actually kind of different. So we need to go ahead and look over those differences so that we can get used to interchanging these properties between the two without kind of affecting our understanding of the properties. So what I'm going to be doing in this video is going and teaching you in this video how to align and justify our items both horizontally and vertically. So we'll start with the first one, which is very similar to Flexbox, and it is the justify content property. So just like we've learned before, this is going to justify it on kind of the horizontal axis uh, instead of on the vertical axis. So um, for example, if we were to center these items, what we would do is we'll push them all to the center instead of moving them up and down. So there we go. Let's go ahead and get started with this. I'm going to go ahead and create a new property here, justify content. Now, just like with our previous property, there are three main values that are used both in our justify content property and the align content property, which we're going to learn in just a second. The only problem is in our flexbox section, we looked at them and they did have a prefix, which are flex start and flex end. So basically, like I said, these are sort of to signify uh, the start and end of the flex box, depending on what axes you're aligning your items on. But instead of adding that prefix here, we're just going to say start, end, and center instead of something like grid start or grid end. They don't use any of that prefixes. Um, all that's included are the three main keywords. So it's a lot simpler to understand, and but it is a little bit harder when you start using both Flexbox and Grid and you get the two very mixed up or confused. So let's go ahead and do that now. I'm just going to go ahead and justify the content to the center. I want to go ahead and do it or justify it to the end this time, just to spice things up a little bit. If I refresh the page, you can see that our template columns, and that's the keyword there, template, are ignored and everything is completely aligned to the right side of our grid. So we can also do it just like with our previous properties in our Flexbox. We can also align it to the start and do pretty much whatever we want with these. So the next value or the next two values that we're gonna use for this property are space around and space evenly, which is a little bit different from space between. So they both work in the same way in that they create spacing between the items to give them to well, even them out in the grid. But the only difference is on our um, flex box, we actually used space between, whereas on our grid, we're using the value space evenly. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you that here. I'm going to just go ahead and say space evenly, like that. Now if I refresh the page, you can see that although it doesn't actually show up here, maybe because of a um, developer error or something like that, we now have our um, items here spaced evenly, uh, just like we can see here in uh, this grid box. 
Now there are remember spaces between or before and after um, our uh, first items and that's the key word there. You can see instead of saying between it says evenly and pretty much what this is saying is we're actually going to space them evenly not just put space in between them. So like I said I talked about a lot of uses of these in the previous section but we're not going to go over those now. So let's go ahead and try out the next value which is space around and when we refresh the page you can see that this looks pretty much exactly the same. Now, of course, we don't have lots of space or room to work with here, so you're not going to see the direct impact or differences between these. Um, so for now, let's just consider them the same purpose. Like I said, we've used both of these in the past, and you know exactly what they do. So now let's go ahead and get started with our next value, or sorry, property, which is our align content property. Now instead of using align items, we're using align content. So that's just one thing to keep in mind. What I'm going to go ahead and say is align content. And before that, let's actually go ahead and give it a little bit more height. I'm going to say maybe 500 pixels. Refresh the page. And obviously these stretch out. We don't have any defined heights for them. But we don't have to worry about that for now. I'll go ahead and change that in just a second. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and start playing around with some of these properties. Now, what's actually really interesting is for our align items, we can actually use both space evenly and space around, but we also, we also have our space between property from our flexbox section. So if I go ahead and try that out now, space between, and refresh the page, you can see what happens is that we have our space between right there, just as we've signified, and it's not spaced evenly. Remember, there's no space before or after uh, our top and bottom items. So that's a really cool feature to keep in mind with our align content uh, property. And of course, along with space evenly and space um, around, we also have our three standard values. Just go ahead and show you that here. Our three standard values, which are center, start, and end. So I can go ahead and show you that now. Start, uh, or sorry, uh, align content to the end, and that will push everything down to the bottom of <clears throat> bottom of the page. So there we go. There's a lot to digest in this uh, video. There's a lot of different properties to cover and memorize, but don't worry about all of that. For now, just understand which property does which, and everything will just fall naturally into place. And remember, if you ever forget how to do something, you can always go and both review the lectures or just Google it. It's really that simple. There are tons of articles and helpful resources out there to help you decide or figure out some of the properties you may have lost or forgotten in your time using CSS. So there we go. That's pretty much it for aligning content. It's quite easy in terms of properties, although there are a lot of values. Once you start using them and getting used to some of the subtle differences, everything will just fall naturally into place, as I said before. All right, let's move on. So in this video, we are going to be looking at another feature of our grids here, and that is going to be column uh, column gaps, column and row gaps. So we've looked at aligning content, we've looked at creating columns and rows. Now we're going to look at the final piece that kind of connects everything together for our containers, which are gaps. So we've talked about how our grid is kind of set up. We have our boxes, we have our columns and our rows, and then we can actually change these or override them using our justifications here. I'm actually going to go ahead and erase these or comment them out just for this lecture so we can create some good demonstrations here. So what I'm going to be doing is going through and talking about these gaps. And they're actually pretty important when it comes to the whole thing because you can completely change the way a grid looks by creating spacing. And obviously, if you've seen any websites and really look closely at it, you'll understand the importance of spacing in websites. They really uh, bring everything together and create sort of a hierarchy that's easy on the eyes if you've taken any UX or design. So let's get started. Now, what I'm going to be doing is going ahead and creating these column and row gaps. So the first, th the first one I want to talk about is column gaps. And just as we were working with our um, col template columns and template rows, the, um, the properties that we need to use are pretty similar. So first, I'm going to go ahead and start with our columns. Now, the property that we're going to be using is grid column gap. 
And you can obviously kind of uh, associate these together to memorize them or maybe learn them easier. Uh, but besides that, we're going to go ahead and get this started. Now, of course, this only takes one value. We don't need to specify any more because what we're going to be doing is um, giving each, well, each column a gap between them. So let's go ahead and give it a value. I'm just going to go ahead and say 150 pixels uh, to make it a little bit evident. I'm going to go ahead and refresh the page. And although it may not be obvious immediately, you can kind of see that these columns are a little bit more spaced out now. Now, of course, there's no lines to kind of show you the visualization, but you can kind of deduce from this that there is definitely a bigger gap between the columns now that we've specified it. So now what I'm going to do is go ahead and actually change this and give it a row gap. So very similar to our previous, uh, previous property, we're going to use grid row gap. And this is pretty much the exact same thing, except it specifies the gap between rows. So this is probably going to be a lot more obvious here. What I'm going to do is just going ahead and saying 300 pixels and notice how the gap of this place kind of gets bigger. You can see now that there is a much bigger gap between our top row and our bottom row. So that's pretty easy, but obviously you don't want to go through and specify these every single time. So there's actually a really nice shorthand property that we can use to bring this all together. I'm going to go ahead and actually, I'll keep these for now and then I'll erase them when we're done. So instead of specifying which axes you want to do it on, or which axis, sorry, you can just say grid gap. And what this is going to do is just create the gap instantly where you can pass in two values and specify it or do it all in one go. So this takes the column first and then the row, uh, kind of just how template columns goes first and template rows go first in its shorthand, uh, which we haven't actually talked about, but we'll get to that later. For here, what we're going to do is specify our column first, which is 150 pixels, and our row gap next, which is 300 pixels. Now I'm going to go ahead and erase these um, other values that we don't need and refresh the page. So I actually made a little mistake there and I put the column before the row, sorry if I caused any uh, confusion there. So what I'm going to do is actually just go ahead and change this really quickly um, so that this will work. And now if I go ahead and refresh, you can see that they look exactly the same. Again, sorry for that mix up, just remember that the row or the row size comes before the column size. Just keep that in mind. So there we go. Now we have our grid gap set up. Now this is pretty much it for our, um, well, column gap or row gap or all of these gaps for our grid layout. Now there's really not that much to it. It's very easy to set up, but once you do that, uh, it, it becomes very easy to sort of work with your grid along with the other properties to create some really nice looking layouts. And once we start learning some more of the properties in the next few videos, you can really maximize the uh, use of the grid layout in CSS. All right, let's move on. So now we're going to be moving on to a little bit more complicated, the more complicated parts of grid. And in this video, we're going to be covering quite a big topic. It's going to be a lot to chew. And don't worry if you don't get it on the first try, we're going to go through this slowly and we're going to go through it step by step so that we can learn everything about this. So in this video, we're going to be learning about the real true power of grid. And what we're going to be learning is how to rearrange and resize items based on starting and starting and ending points. So that's what we're going to be doing today. Now, the first thing we need to do is obviously go and go to our grid container on our HTML file, since we need to specify the start and end points of each um, item individually. So let's get started. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is actually go ahead and remove uh, all of these values because it'll be much easier to see and understand what's going on when we just have these fives here. What I'm actually going to do is go ahead and add a sixth item just to break even here and um, make everything look great. So I'm going to go ahead and choose another color, just something random here, maybe a purple. Do we have that? Yeah, we do have that. Uh, maybe a green, something. Actually, let's just go for a nice dark orange, something here. And we're going to go ahead and copy that. And now we have a sixth value to break even here. 
So what we're going to be learning in this video is how to, like I just said, resize items. And there are actually a few, um, there we go, we have our uh, color set up now. We do have a few uh, different shorthands and properties that we can use to set this up. So the first thing we need to learn is the lines and the concept of lines. So we do know that we have our columns and our rows. But what's happening here is that each column starts and ends, or well, each column is designated a certain line. So for example, this would be line one at the beginning here, this would be line two, and then this would be line three. And then for our rows, we have our line one and our line two. So what we can actually do is say, set, set this item to go from line one to line three, and from row line one to row line two. And we can do this using a few properties and some shorthands and some other keywords and all the other things that we can do to set this whole thing up. So one thing you need to keep in mind that uh, is that lines are the basically the core concept, the most important part of grid. It's what makes grid what it is. And all of the properties that we've learned are all kind of revolving around lines and the models created by those lines. So that's just one thing to keep in mind. All right, let's get started. So the first thing I'm going to do is talk about how to start and end at a certain item at a um, designated area. So we're going to go through and specify these start and end points. Now, there are many different ways to do this, but we're going to start with the basic sort of syntax that we should use to set this up, and then we'll move in some, into some of the more advanced syntax uh, to set this thing up and start make, creating shorthands and other sorts of properties. So let's go ahead and get started. What I'm going to do is select what item I want. Uh, let's just go ahead and say the first item. And now what we need to do is go ahead and set grid column like this. So what I need to do from here is, oh, whoops, what I need to do from here is to specify a start and an end point. And they are separated by a slash. So the start point is going to be the starting column line. So I'm going to say one. And the end point is going to be, well, the ending. And I'm just going to say two or, yeah, I'm going to say two or three for now. I'm just going to go ahead with three. Now, if I go ahead and refresh the page, you can see what's going on here. Now, obviously, it looks really weird with all of these different uh, items here and they're being rearranged in a different way. But what's happening is we're starting at line one and then we're going to end at line three. And you can see that although it's not resizing properly, it still does take up that space in an invisible way. So we have our item two at the start of line three and everything is pushed right past it, overriding those template rows and columns that we created. Now let's go ahead and specify our next value, which is the grid row value. So what we're gonna do here is just with our first one, we're gonna set a start and an end point and separate them by a slash. So what I'm gonna do is go ahead and say, start at well row one and we're going to, oh, whoops. And we're going to end at, again, let's just go ahead and say line two, just like this. Now I'm gonna refresh the page and you can see, well, nothing's happened because it does start at one and end at two. Let's go ahead and set three right there. So now you can see what's going on here. Although it didn't, it didn't show anything before where we had one to two because it already took up that space. When we set it to one to three, you can see that everything has now been pushed again and the space has been separated accordingly. So you can kind of see the power of this already. You can create all sorts of layouts, menus, and sidebars just by using this syntax alone. And it is very powerful, but there's also many different ways to do it, which we're going to be covering over the next few videos. Now, instead of specifying an endpoint or an end line, because these can get quite confusing. You don't know where lines start and where lines end. And it does get quite confusing, especially when you have very big grids with lots of different columns and rows. So instead of this, you can actually specify the distance that you want it to take up. So the keyword that you can use for this is span. And what this is going to say is start at some line, whichever one you choose, and span or take up a certain amount of, well, spaces depending on what value you're using. So for now, I'm going to say span two, and here I'm also going to change this to span two. Now let's refresh and see what happens. 
you can see that nothing has changed, of course, because they are exactly the same thing. You start at column one and you take up two more spaces. You go up two more lines. You start at row one and then you go down two more lines. So you start at line one, one, two, just like that. And this is a much easier way to work with grid columns and rows because you can kind of see what you're doing instead of just specifying start and end points. Like this, you can actually kind of visualize the what you're doing with your grids and how big you want to make your items. So that's pretty much it for these different items. Now, there are, like I said, many different shorthands that you can use, which we're going to be learning uh, in just a few videos time. But this is kind of the basic idea of specifying uh, these items. You can go through and you can set start and end point, end points based on the different lines and the sort of model created by the grid. And then you can set how big you want each item to be. All right, let's move on. So today we are going to be covering or looking at the last feature of our grid section. And it's pretty much just a summary of what we did here, but using a shorthand. So you can see that we have our grid column and our grid row. So we identify our starting and ending points for both axes. But there's actually a way that you can do this whole thing in one go. And usually when you're developing web websites, you're going to want to do this. You're, you don't want to go and do each of these properties individually for all of them. You're going to want to do it quick and fast for both axes. And that's how you get the maximum out of grid. So what we're going to be using is something called the grid area property. And just like before, pretty much what happens is this is a shorthand that summarizes these two in one property. So it is a little bit confusing to get your head around the starting and ending points. So I'm just going to go through it with you. So right now I have changed this part a little bit. I've kind of messed around with the column starts and ends so that you can differentiate between the values. So pretty much what the first value you're going to input, just like here, is going to be your row starting point. So you're going to go ahead and input two in this case, because we want to match this exactly. And the next, instead of your row end, is actually your column starting point. So then we're going to put one. Now from here, this is where it, a lot of people get mixed up and confused. Pretty much what's happening is just how like with margin, you go top right, bottom left, or um, with any other kind of property that deals with those kind of multiple value uh, scenarios, what's going to happen here is you have the row column start, and then you have the row column end. So just keep that in mind and everything will work out for you. So all you have to do is go ahead and say two, one, and now we're going to put our row end. Remember, we have row start, column start, row end, and then column end. So here we're going to put span two. Now remember, this can be a span value or an end value. It doesn't actually matter. So you can put whatever you want here. And then, of course, the column ending value, which in this case is span three. So now what we're going to do is go ahead and just comment these values out for now and see if anything has changed. And you can see, of course, it hasn't. Since we've pretty much summarized this into our shorthand, we don't actually have a use for these anymore. So I'm going to go ahead and get rid of them. So now that you know how to do it, let's talk about some of the benefits of this. Now, when you're creating a grid, you're creating a huge practical system, most likely. You're going to be organizing pages into headers and sidebars and all sorts of things, and you don't want to go and input those two for each one. It gets a little bit confusing after a while. So it's much easier if you just have one property that can summarize both the column and the row uh, in one clean swoop, and then you can apply them to all of your different pieces. So your sidebar would go and start and end here, then your header would go here, and you get the idea. So that's pretty much it for grids and grid area. There's a lot to cover, and of course, practice makes perfect with these kinds of things. But the more you use it, the more you will understand how to um, sort of work with it and play around with some of the tricks that really get grid to work properly. Now, these tricks can't really be taught because, of course, they're personal to the user, the developer, and what kind of work they're doing. So there's always shortcuts and all sorts of little tricks you can use with these properties to really lay out your website related to your special field of development or work. All right, let's move on. 
So this is going to be starting a brand new section and we're actually going to be looking at a very cool and useful feature in CSS. Now, of course, this isn't a very old or considered a essential feature, but it's still very useful and it can help you make your website look a lot better. So in this section, we're going to be covering everything to do with movement on your page. So things like animations, transitions, and some other features that you can use to sort of change the way your website looks without actually changing it in a sense. Now, of course, this will make a lot more sense once we go forward and start working with some of the properties. But the first one I want to talk about in this video is our transition property. So there is a lot to cover in this video and transition is actually a shorthand for four different properties. So there's going to be a lot to uh, work with and talk about. So I'm going to go through it a little bit slow, but once you get to the end of this video, you'll understand everything about transitions and how to work with them. Now you can see I've touched up this website a little bit using any, all of the skills that we've learned in this section, selectors, displays, margins, all sorts of things like that, including styling the button just with a little creativity. And now we have our page kind of a little bit better laid out for um, our animations. So the main part that we're going to be focusing on is our contact us section and notably our submit button. So this is the main kind of focus piece of this section. So pretty much right now we have a static page. There's nothing moving, nothing uh, changing positions or properties or anything like that. And right now what I want to do is focus on the submit button to create some transitions. Now pretty much what's going to happen is we're going to use pseudo selectors to change the state of this button um, or change some of the properties in it. So for example, the background or the text color or anything like that. And then we're going to use the transition property to make it appear smooth. So that's one thing to keep in mind. The transition property itself um, isn't that big of a deal, but the real um, work goes behind the pseudo selectors and how you use them. So let's get started. The first thing I want to do is use a pseudo selector to change. Let's just go with the background for now. So what I'm going to do is use my class that I added. You can go ahead and add this on your own if you're following along. And then I'm going to use a pseudo selector. And I'm just going to say for now, let's go with hover, which is a pretty common pseudo selector. Now, just to test this, that this works, I'm going to change the color to black because again, there could always be issues. Let's refresh hover. It's black. You can see that it's already working. It's just not smooth. So let's go through and start changing some of these properties. What I'm going to do is change the background to a lighter shade. I'm actually going to just use the color picker here. I'm going to go ahead and use a lighter shade of blue, something that would indicate that you're hovering over. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And for now, we're just going to stick with one property. Uh, but once we go forward, we're actually going to add more and more properties to make it look a lot cleaner. Let's go ahead and refresh, see if that works. You can see that it is a much lighter shade and it looks like a proper hover on a website. So let's get started. Now we have our uh, submit button or our base class, the one that's always active and our special pseudo class, which kind of uses specificity to override our base class in certain conditions. In this case, the hover. Now what we're going to do is add our transition property. So what we do is go to our base class and we're going to set our transition property here. And now we have a bunch of different values to input. The first is going to be the property that you want to, well, transition, because remember, the property is basically going to smooth it out and move the property on one hand or from the base class slowly to the other in a nice, clean, animated way. So if you want to select all of your properties, you can just hit all, but I wouldn't recommend that unless you, unless you want to shorten things or smooth over time because sometimes your classes can change and it can cause errors in the long run. So what I would do is for now, I'm just going to select the specific property that I want. Next thing I want to talk about is the duration. So this is pretty much the time it's going to take to move from one property or one value to the other. Now this can be anything. Now you would specify this in seconds or milliseconds, depending on what you want to choose. I'm going to go ahead and use seconds. So I'm going to say two seconds and S by the way, is the um, unit for seconds in case you didn't know. The next we want to go is talk about 
the sort of transition style. So this is probably the most complicated thing to work with because there's a lot of different styles and we haven't really used them in daily life, but it's pretty easy. Pretty much what you're gonna do is decide what kind of a change do you want it? Do you want it to go uh, straight from A to B? Do you want it to be smooth or speedy? And what I'm gonna do is just run through uh, some of the main ones you have here. So the first one and uh, the most common one is going to be ease. Oh, whoops, I'm not typing ease and pretty much what this does is it's kind of the standard transition it goes is it goes straight from a to b then you have linear which is not very commonly used especially in transitions but it just goes straight from a to b without any um you know speed changes or anything like that and you also have a couple more there is one called ease in out like this and you can pretty much just read this in name. It goes, it eases using the previous one that I just talked about, but of course in that order. So those are pretty much the three, uh, or sorry, the four common ones that you would use. And of course there's a bunch more, but these are really the main ones uh, that you would work with here. So pretty much let's start working with um, our transition property here. So I'm actually gonna go with ease in out just to um, spice it up a little bit, not use the basic ones. And then the last property that we're going to select is the delay. So pretty much what's gonna happen is when you hover over it right now, there's no delay. It's zero seconds, the animation plays instantly. But what you can actually do is set a delay uh, that you can use to, let's just say after you hover, to wait two seconds and then play the animation. So let's just go ahead and set a delay of one second. And that off of the semicolon. Lot to digest there, I know, but um, don't worry about. Uh, just leave. It's just keep it there for now. And if you don't understand it, we'll break it down and do some more examples. Let's go ahead and refresh the page. So what I'm going to do is hover over my button here. You can see that it's going to wait. Oh, whoops. So I'm going to hover over. And now we're going to wait, and you can see after one second, it turns into. Um, that kind of shade that we wanted. Now I feel like we are going to remove that one second delay because we don't need it. And I'm actually gonna shorten this down to 0.5 seconds. Now what I'm gonna do is refresh the page and now you can see it's a lot faster. Now once you get into this range, you wanna, you wanna start using milliseconds. So I'm gonna go 300 ms, which is milliseconds. Let's refresh the page. And like I said, just play around with this, tinker with it and see how it works. So you can see when we do this, that it changes the color and when we hover over, it changes back. So now you can see the difference between not having a transition and having it. Let's comment this out for a second. And you can see how that works. Without the transition, it looks kind of jarring and quick and sharp. It doesn't really look appealing. But when you add that transition, it just completely changes everything. Now, why don't we go ahead and try out some of the other styles because it's much easier to show you uh, how these styles works rather than just explaining them. So let's go ahead and see linear. So pretty much what's gonna happen, it just goes straight from A to B, no speed changes or anything. Of course, with something this small, it's not very noticeable, but when you have translations and all these different changes, then it will definitely be noticeable. So there you go, you have a linear um, uh, transition there. Now let's go ahead and try our ease transition. Refresh it, and you can see that it is a lot faster and like I said, not very noticeable, but we can see a clear difference in the uh, speed and uh, agility, or well, not agility, but the kind of curves of the transition. It starts out very fast, it, towards the middle it gets a little bit slower, and then towards the end it's much faster. Now of course it would be easier to demonstrate if it wasn't 300 milliseconds. Let's go ahead and see this um, when it is on a higher time. So you can see kind of how that works there. So there we go. Those are the different types of transition types. That's probably the hardest um, property to, or sorry, value to work with. And then after that everything becomes a lot simpler. So now let's go ahead and start adding some more properties here to make this a little bit more interesting. I'm gonna go ahead and add some padding. So I'm going to say when it's hovered over, pretty much double the padding. So 20 pixels, 30 pixels. 
Now here what we're going to do is either use a comma to separate the different um, properties that we want to use or we can just erase all of this and say all. Now we refresh it and you can see that that gets a lot bigger. Let's change that back to about 500 milliseconds. Make that a lot shorter and now you can see it gets bigger on top of that the um, sorry the uh, background changes. Now of course you can do so many different changes with this. You can maybe change the color, the font size, even the weight. And once we learn some of the translation or sorry transformation functions, we can do a lot more with it. But for now, we need to stick with the basics of the transition concept. So before we move on, there's one thing I need to talk about and those are the prefixes that we need to use for browser support. So the thing is with much newer CSS versions is that not all browsers support them. They all compile in a different way and some of them don't support these newer properties, especially in the older versions. So for example, Internet Explorer 7, um, Internet Explorer 8, all of those very old browsers which people still use um, won't be able to see this property. Now you have two solutions to this. Either use a fallback, uh, which is, you know, if the transition doesn't work, just maybe have a fallback image or don't play it at all or you can use a browser support prefix. So each one or each type of browser has a different um, uh, prefix, but the main ones are for uh, Chrome and Safari, we need to use WebKit like this. And remember, you need to start it with a dash and end it with a dash like this. Then the one for um, Mozilla Firefox is going to be dash MOZ. And then of course, um, for some of the other browsers like Opera, you would use O. Oh, whoops, wrong line. You would use O for that. And those are pretty much the three main ones. Now, WebKit is pretty much an essential. It covers two browsers at once. Now, of course, and Mozilla is also still important. Opera is important, but not as important as these other two. Now, one thing you need to note is you can't just string these together. You can't go dash WebKit, dash malls, uh, dash O. You have to use separate properties. So you have to go and copy each one and it is a pain, but if you want the maximum browser support, you need to do this. So of course, if we refresh the page, nothing's going to happen here, but anybody who's using an older browser, if I was testing this on maybe Internet Explorer 7, would see a clear difference between um, before and after we added these browser support prefixes. So that's pretty much it for um, transitions. Now, there is a lot to cover and we will work with them uh, throughout the future. But all you need to do is go ahead, select pretty much any element you want and start playing around with it. Add some different properties, uh, maybe go and change the pseudo selector. So for example, if you want it to be uh, active or something like that, or if you click it, you want to uh, change some of these properties. There's a bunch of pseudo selectors out there and combining that with the transition property and the skills you've learned in CSS, you can really make this website or whatever website you're working on interactive without even having to learn any animation or proper transformation properties. All right, let's move on. So in this video, we are going to be covering different transform properties, and this is gonna be quite a long video. Just like the transition video, we do have a lot to cover. There's many different uh, values and functions that we need to use to complete this, but it is a pretty essential step of this section. So let's just get straight into it. So firstly, what we're gonna be using in this video are actually not values, they're functions. Now, just like this um, RGB thing is a function that takes a bunch of inputs and gets a value out, or maybe something else. Well, it seems like this is the only one on the page, but what we're gonna be doing is using a bunch of functions that take in inputs and actually uh, physically change what this uh, is on the page. Now, obviously all of these do physically change what they are on the page, but instead of inputting absolute or direct values, this kind of processes in a different way behind the scenes. So let's just jump straight into it. First thing we need to learn is the property. Now we're going to use our button again, and I'm going to be using a value called transform. So what we're going to do is plug in a bunch of different values in here and see how it affects this. 
So pretty much we have two different sections of this video. We have our physical change properties or our um, movement, so our translation and our scaling. And then we also have our different rotation properties or, um, well, I should say functions, but um, there we go. So we're going to have our translation and our scale, so our physical changes, and then our rotation. And at the end, I'm going to throw in um, a nice shorthand function that summarizes all of it. So let's start with our physical changes. So the first thing we need to learn about is translate. So we're only going to be covering 2D translations for today because 3D can get very uh, complicated very quick and it's not really uh, useful in day-to-day -day life or developer life uh, unless you're making something that specifically needs it. So we're just going to cover 2D translations um, and other function transformation functions for today. So pretty much what this is going to do is take in two different values. One of them is going to be the Y shift and the X shift, and it's going to actually shift, physically shift the element uh, to that position. So for example, if you said, I want to move um, this button or this image a little bit to the left, and I wanted to move, or let's just say 10 pixels to the left, and I wanted to move it 10 pixels up, it would do that. And of course, there are many different ways to do it. But what we're going to do is use this translate method to um, really change the way that uh, this whole thing works. So what we're going to do is, or we're going to use an alternative method to, you know, something like margin or grid or all of those. So the first thing you want to do is specify the x-axis value. Now, in case you haven't, you know, learned about graphs or you maybe forgot it, pretty much what happens is the x-axis is going to be your left and your right shift. Right is going to be your positive value, so anything above zero. And if you want to shift it left, you use negative values. And then, of course, the second value is the y-axis. So up is positive and down is negative. So let's start with our X shift. I'm going to just go ahead and say 50 pixels here. So I want to shift it 50 pixels to the right. Now remember, we don't need, we need to, we don't need to say anything like to right or anything like that. We just need to specify the value. Then we throw in a comma. And here, what we're going to do is add our Y axis shift. So here, I'm also going to say, let's just go with 30 pixels. We'll refresh the page, see what happens. Now, we can see here that it's actually staying exactly the same. It's not moving, uh, it's not changing anything here, but you can see that when we hover over it, it does actually move. So what's going on here? Now, here's where you have to be careful about where you add your properties. You can see that I added it to our um, pseudo selector instead of our base class. And that's one thing or one point I just wanted to make about these pseudo selectors is that if you add them on maybe the, here, it's not just going to inherit it magically and put it on the base class. You do need to be specific. Remember, these two are completely different classes. It's just that some of them are being overridden. So for example, our background and our padding already exist. So what happens is that all of these uh, styles are already applied and then the new um, styles here are overridden, but this is a completely new property. It doesn't actually exist on our base class. So just make sure that you don't make that mistake. Let's go ahead and paste that on the base class. I'll do it just above the transitions. Now we refresh the page and it's translated perfectly. So now that we've done that, I want to talk about browser support for a second. Now, all of these are very new features to CSS. You do need to make sure that you add your browser prefixes. So WebKit, Moz, and O. Now, I'm not going to go through and add it for all of them. I'm just going to leave it blank for now. But you need to keep in mind that if you want the maximum support um, on, your, on your page or on your site, you want to make sure you include those prefixes. So there we go. We've covered translate. Now let's work with our next value, which is going to be scale. So scale works in a similar way to how maybe increasing the padding would work. What's going to happen is you're going to go and you're going to type in scale, which is the name of the function. And then you're going to pass in a decimal value. It doesn't have to be a decimal, but pretty much what you're going to do is just say, let's say I want to scale this up by two and a half times. What's going to happen is this is going to well, size up by two and a half. We refresh and you can see that it's gotten a lot bigger and padding and all of that 
it doesn't really apply or change anything here. It just scales everything up by two and a half. So you can obviously see some of the issues here with margin and padding and all sorts of things like this. So be pretty careful when you do this. You don't want to mess up your page or change your style uh, or anything like that. You just want to make sure that you can scale without having to mess with um, the layout of your page. So that's for scale and all of the physical properties. Now let's move on to some of the rotation uh, properties. So the first two we're going to cover, or sorry, the first one I'm going to cover is pretty simple. Um, it's just a standard rotate. But then after that, I'm going to cover two really special ones, which are actually um, uh, skewing on different axes. So we'll get to that in just a second. Let's refresh the page. So the first one we want to use is rotate, and this takes one value. Obviously, it's going to be our degree value. So if you don't remember from our gradient section, uh, what happens pretty much here is we rotate it kind of circularly. Um, well, not for this one, but we can use degrees to actually change the angle or direction of our um, gradient. So for example, 90 degrees would be a 90 degree shift. So it would go to the right. And then um, the negative 90 degrees would go the other way. So it would go to the left. So if you just remember that, you'd be uh, doing great here. So let's just say I wanted to use minus 45 degrees and remember the symbol for it. So what's going to happen pretty much is this is going to shift slightly or well not shift, but it's going to rotate and you can see what happens there. Now, if this was minus 90, it would pretty much flip. Um, so it was facing up vertically and I'll actually show you that now. Um, but pretty much what you're doing here is just rotating it uh, around its center and uh, changing the rotation of it. Pretty simple, uh, pretty easy to use. So now let's talk about the two special ones. So pretty much what's going to happen here is they're going to skew them along certain axes. Now this is really hard to explain um, and most likely nobody will get it if it's explained. So the only real way to show it or the only real way to teach it is by showing it. So what I'm going to do is use skew and you can see we have our shorthand and we also have skew X and skew Y. So what I'm going to select is skew X first. And pretty much this is going to shift it or rotate it along the X axis instead of its center. So remember the X is kind of um, uh, a, a horizontal rod. So just kind of imagine a stick or a paper attached to a rod and you're rotating it around that rod. So now let's go ahead and input our value. Just like before, we're going to use degree values. So I'm going to go 45 degrees positive. We refresh the page and obviously it looks quite weird. Um, because it's pretty hard to simulate these kind of things, but you can see that pretty much what this has happened is rotated um, along that axis. So if I go negative 45, it's going to go the other way, just like that. And you can kind of see um, how that works. Now, if we change this to skew Y, it's going to go, it's going to do this exact same thing, but it's going to be on the opposite axis. So it's going to be on a vertical rod. So just imagine that. Refresh the page and you can see how that is working. Now, obviously it is very hard to see and visualize. So I wouldn't encourage you to use skew X or Y. If you want to rotate something, you should most likely stick or you should try and stick to the three I just covered. So the last value we're going to be talking about or the last function is going to be our matrix function. So this is going to be a shorthand to summarize everything into one go. And pretty much from here, what we're going to do is um, pretty much just summarize everything in one clean swoop. So pretty much uh, this takes six arguments. And one thing you do have to note is it doesn't take rotation into account it only works with skews. So you just have to keep that in mind. If you're planning to rotate it, you should probably add that as a, as another function. So let's get started. What we're going to do is go ahead and um, work with our matrix function. So we're going to erase this and we're going to go ahead and add our matrix. Now these six arguments do follow a very, very specific um, pattern or a order. So we're going to have to go through it slowly so that you can understand it. And it is a little bit out of order um, logically. So we're just going to take our time with this. Now, the first value is going to be your X scale. Now, one thing I forgot to mention is that we were actually using shorthand, um, 
shorthand functions to avoid all the mess with scale x and scale y and just shorten things up. So one thing you do need to keep in mind is that every scale component or function like this will have an x and a y value. And what we pretty much did is um, summarize them down into one um, or into those shorthand functions so we can just uh, do it really easily. But here it's actually split up into different functions. So let's start with our scale x. Now one thing to note is that if you want to keep it the same, all you have to do is input 1. Pretty much this is, oh, whoops, not typing. Uh, pretty much what this is going to happen or what this is going to do is say set this uh, button or object or element uh, one times as big as itself, which is of course just going to result in the same. So the next is your skew y and your skew x. Now if you don't want to do anything, you set it to zero, but if you do want to skew it along the axes, you do have to use decimal um, decimal um, values here. And one thing also to note is that you don't have to include the units like we did before, so no px or mm or uh, dag or deg or anything like that, you just include the numbers. So you do include decimal points here. So uh, I'm just going to go 0.45 on both of these. And remember, this is actually 45 degrees, so keep that in mind. Next thing we're going to do is input our scale y. So again, um, you do have scale x and scale y. If you want to keep it the same, set it to 1. And then you have your translate x and translate y. So I'm going to say 100 pixels, and, oh, whoops, 150. Remember, pixels, pixels. So this is a little bit confusing, but it's don't try not to use it that much. Only use it if you really have to, or if you want to shorten code down. Uh, but I would recommend not using this function very often. It's quite clunky and ordered, and it doesn't really allow for freedom. So just keep that in mind when you're using it. Let's refresh, and you can see our new item here. Scaling is, of course, uh, the same. It's shifted on the x and y axes, so you can see that here. It doesn't create that rotation that you may be expecting because remember, it is a skew on individual axes. Uh, just remember that. And of course, our scale on the x and y is 1. Our translation of x is 100, so it's about this much. And then our translation of y is 50. So there we go. We have everything set up, and now it's pretty much just all working. We have um, our shifts, our uh, movements here, and we also have our scaling. So go ahead and try these out on different elements. It doesn't just have to be with a button. You can use this on grid elements, um, although some of them may not work. You can use this on images, text, all sorts of things. These work on any, any element, and they can really help you to style your website without having to use some of the traditional methods that we've learned. All right, let's move on. So in this video, we are going to be looking at CSS animations. So we've looked at transitions and some of the different um, transformation functions that we can use to um, sort of work with our elements in a different way. But now we're going to be learning another essential component, which are animations. So we're going to be covering this over the next few videos. And uh, for the first one, we're going to be creating the animation. So first of all, what are the advantages of using an animation? Well, firstly, when you're using a transition, you have to apply those specific styles to everything you want to perform a transition with. But with an animation, you can define the changes once and then apply them to anything. So for example, let's just say I wanted to create an animation that turns something from red to black, or sorry, turns the background from red to black. Then you can apply it to any item. Whereas if you use transitions, you'd have to go through and go through every single element, change the pseudo selectors, and do all sorts of things. On top of that, when you're using animations, you can play something at the start instead of having, or with a delay, instead of having to wait for some event to happen with a pseudo selector. So pretty much what happens here is you can say, um, we can pretty much just remove this image completely from the page or translate it at the start when the page is first um, refreshed. We can also use this to really make our website interactive and change the way um, this website looks completely. So let's get started. Now first thing you need to realize is that these animations are completely custom. Uh, custom. You can name them whatever you want and do whatever you want inside them. 
but there are a few um, keywords that we need to use to get this set up. Now, an animation is split up into something called keyframes. Now, pretty much each animation has at least one, at least two keyframes. So you have the starting and the ending, and then you can add keyframes in between to decide the different stages of the animation. So to define an animation, all you have to do is go at keyframes. So at, in this case, is the prefix, and um, keyframes is going to be our keyword. And then you name the animation. I'm just going to say um, translate elements, just like that. Now you can name this whatever you want. Remember, it's completely up to you. Then you're going to open it up with brackets. So now it's a little bit different to how we've been using CSS. We can't just define styles and expect it to work perfectly. There are two different ways or two different main ways that we can define our keyframes. So pretty much the kind of standard way of writing one of these keyframes is typing out the, um, the keyword. So for example, um, I'm just going to type example here. Now, of course, it, if in a real world scenario it wouldn't be like this, it would be a number or a percentage um, or an actual keyword, but it wouldn't just say example. Then you're going to create these curly braces again inside of our keyframes. And here you would type the styles at this stage. So for example, if I wanted a red background, you would type it here. So what I'm going to do is talk about the first two um, keywords, which are to and from. So first of all, let's start with from. So this is pretty much going to be your initial starting point. And then to, which is going to be your ending starting or, or ending point, sorry. Here, what you're going to do is type in whatever you want. So for example, let's just say our, um, oh, I'm actually going to change this black to red, since that's what the, uh, or sorry, red to black, red to black. Now here, I would say start from when the background is red. Now there doesn't have to be anything here, but it would be recommended that you do start with something um, unless you're going for something specific after that. And then here to, I'm going to say at the end of it, make sure the background is black. Now, of course, we don't have to work with timings or anything here because that's all decided when we add and work with the animation on our element. So there we go. We have it defined. Now, these are the first, this is the first way to do something. But what if you wanted more than one background? You can't just add two background properties in one go. So instead of this, what we use is percentages. So you can say at 0%, you want to have uh, some special properties. So I'm going to say background is red. And then you can say at 100%. So at the end of the animation, this is when it's 100% complete the background would be black. Now the direct advantage to using this is you can actually add more than um, more than two stops. So for example, I can go at 50%. I want the background to be um, yellow. Now realistically, you can add as many um, properties here as you want. It doesn't really change anything. Um, but of course, you want to try and limit the amount of properties you add or sorry, stops or keyframes to maybe six or seven at the max. Now, unless you're doing something very specific, maybe you want strobe lights or something like that, you're going to want to keep it limited. So there we go. We have these steps here. But the last thing I want to cover is that you don't just have to work with one property. What if we wanted to translate something? So what I can do is actually set the transform. Remember, it is a property. And then I can say translate this so by zero pixels and zero pixels. So of course, we don't actually have to type out this property. But what I'm going to do is now copy this over. And so 50% of the way, we want it to translate by 10 pixels and 10 pixels. And at the end of it, we want to translate by 20 pixels and 20 pixels. So you can see how this works. So for example, let's just say we wanted to enlarge something and change the color from red to black. We could do it just like this, except maybe using scale or padding or any other way that you choose, whichever you, whichever one you think is best um, for the specific website you're developing. Now, one thing I'm going to mention is that the kind of convention is to keep these curly brackets on the same line. But if it is getting a little bit long like this one, you can definitely um, open and close them just like I'm doing here. Um, 
don't be limited by the white space. It's not really a defining factor. You can space these however you want. Um, but usually you're not going to use more than one property on a keyframe like this. Um, if you do have a giant animation, something with, you know, backgrounds, transforms and margins, you're going to want to, you know, space it out, make it easy for people to read. So this doesn't just have to be in multiples of 10. This could be 37% way, 37% of the way through. This could be 25. You could split it into quarters. You could do pretty much anything you want with this. But the key thing you have to remember is you're designing your own animation. You're going to want to fit it to how you want. So for example, if you just wanted to enlarge something, you didn't really, you don't really have to use these percentages. You can just use to and from or from and to since you only have two stops. But if you want to do something like a multiple color change, then you most likely want to switch to percentages. So you want to go from 0% uh, to 33%, 66%, you know, work with it, just kind of uh, see how everything works together and design the animation based on what you need. So this is the video based on designing the animation. Now, in the next video, uh, we're actually going to be adding our animation and start working with it um, to change it based on what we need for each element. All right, let's move on. So in this video, we are going to be adding the animation that we created in the previous video to one of our elements. And then we're actually going to be going through and working with it in the next video. So first of all, let's just recap what we've done so far. In the previous video, we created some keyframes for our animation. I talked about all the different units and how you can actually set these values, and we covered all of that. But now that we've actually created our animation, it's time to go through and add them to some of our elements. So this is going to be quite a short video because it is quite easy to just go ahead and add the animation. But there is a lot to cover about the different properties of animations, which we're going to be talking about in the next video. So let's get started. The first thing is to find a suitable item that we can apply this to. So obviously this is used with translation and background color. So we can pretty much apply it to anything on this page. For now, I'm just going to go with our about me text right there. So the first thing I'm going to do is go ahead and select it by adding a class. Oh, it looks like, uh, where is it? Hold on. Let's see. Seems to be have lost in all this. Uh, it's, it has to be somewhere here. There we go. About me. So, it already has a class uh, subtitle. So what we're going to do is, um, well, actually, there's already stuff applied there. So it would be much better if we actually added an ID to it using specificity. And we're just going to say about me, just like that. Now, what I would recommend is you keep your animations and keyframes at the bottom so that if you ever need to reference them, you can just scroll down and see all of them there. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and select this. So I'm going to go hash and then about me open up the curly braces. And now what we're going to do is go and start adding our animation. So this is pretty easy to do. All you have to do is use one property animation name, and you can see a little shorthand there, but we're going to be covering that a little bit later. Let's go ahead and add that. And here we're going to put the name of our animation. So this would be red to black. And remember, it's going to be the exact name of the animation that we specified here. So let's go ahead and refresh the page, see how this works. And you can see that nothing's happening. So this is something that I want to cover in the next video because we're actually going to be working with some of the properties. But for now, all you need to know is that we do need to apply some special properties for the animation to start running. So for now, all we've done is taken the keyframes, just slap them on to the about me title. And in the next video, we're going to go and actually set this up so that we can start seeing it moving, changing the times and actually making the animation come to life. All right, let's move on. So now we're actually going to be going ahead and covering the different properties that we can do in our little um, CSS style sheet here. We're going to go through, we're going to add some of these different animation properties, and we're actually going to start working with it so that we can really get into how the animation works and how we can work with it. So let's get started. 
Now, I'm only going to be covering some of the basic uh, properties here, but there are many, many more out there. There are so many different ways that you can um, work with these animations and change their um, properties or how they work. But what we're going to do is go ahead and use some of these basic functions so we can get this up and running and working. So let's get started. The first one I want to talk about is animation duration, and this is probably the best or well, not really the best, but it's the most important one because pretty much what happens is the animation duration is going to actually allow your animation to run. So what I'm going to do here is first of all set up this um, function here and pretty much the default value of this um, property here is actually zero and that's why in the last video this wasn't running at all. We added the animation but because the default value is zero pretty much the animation starts and finishes at the exact same time. Um, well not really but we can't see it at all the time is zero. So what you're going to do here is specify a second uh, value here. So I'm going to go ahead and say two seconds, which is quite fast. So I'm actually going to go ahead with four seconds. Now, if we refresh the page, you can see that that animation does play and you can see it kind of works like that. It goes from red to yellow to black. So that's the first thing about the animation that you'll notice. It goes, it stops, and then it finishes. And we're going to be using some of the other properties to actually uh, change how this work and maybe, you know, repeat it over and over again and do all sorts of things with them. So the next property I'm going to be covering is the sort of style of how the property works. So we've already covered the name of the property which is obviously applying the property or the animation itself. We've also talked about the duration, but now we're going to be talking about the style. So pretty much the style is probably the hardest uh, property to learn about, kind of how you know we looked at transition properties or um, styles and those were the hardest. This is pretty much the exact same. So pretty much what happens here is that the style is going to define the speeds or how the animation works out. So all we have to do is go ahead and type out animation, animation dash, sorry, timing function. There we go. And now from here, we can apply the different um, speeds or styles. So I'm going to be talking about the main ones and you can probably recognize these from the transitions video. So we have ease which is the uh, normal one you can see there. And then we also have a few more. So let's go ahead and check it out. We have linear, of course, which is just straight. There's no speed changes or weird, anything like that. You can see it just goes straight down. So you can see a very clear difference there, especially um, here, unlike the transition, um, whereas with ease, it would stop in the middle and then speed back up, whereas linear, it just goes straight. Of course, we also have ease in and ease out and ease in out, just like we covered before. So there we go. I'm going to leave it at linear because I think it looks the best. There we go. And you can see we set that speed curve there. So now let's talk about the next property, which is going to be the animation delay. So the delay is a little bit of a weird case here because you can use positive values, but you can also use negative values, which is a little bit confusing, but let's talk about it here. So I'm going to go ahead and add an animation delay, just like that. And here I'm going to specify um, a delay time. So for example, two seconds. Now, of course, this works perfectly. We refresh, waits two seconds, and then the animation plays just like it would normally. But what if we added a negative two here? What do you think would happen? If we refreshed, you can see it's already at yellow. So what's pretty much happening here is that it starts when the animation is zero, which is the default, it starts right as the page loads. But if you go negative two, it's pretty much acting as if you're already two seconds into the animation. That's kind of how negative values work here. Now, obviously, there's no real application for this unless you're looking for something really, really niche that you need it. Um, but this isn't really widespread or used uh, very commonly. It's just a really cool thing to know about animation delays. So the next thing we're going to cover is the iteration count. And I talked about this a little bit when we started the duration, and it's pretty much going to say how many times this thing is going to loop over. So we can use the property animation iteration count. And here, what we're going to do is apply our, the number of times we want it to iterate. So for example, if I wanted to, to iterate or loop over two times, 
I could refresh. Of course, it starts a little bit early and it goes another time. And there we go. After that, it's finished. So it went over two times. Now there's also a really special value you can use here, which is infinite. And then this means that this is just going to keep going over and over pretty much forever until you terminate the page or close it or even change something. But when this is set, it's going to keep looping over and over again pretty much forever. So there we go. Now let's go ahead and talk about the shorthand property. And pretty much what we're going to do here, oh, whoops, actually we need to cover one more value before we use that shorthand, and that's going to be our animation direction. So this is the final value, just like you were seeing here before we started, but it's actually pretty useful, unlike something like the negative animation delay value here. Pretty much what this is going to say is the starting and ending points of the animation. So for example, let's go ahead and add that property there, animation direction. And now we're going to talk about the four um, main values for this function. Of course, the default value is going to be normal, which is just like that. And that, of course, plays from 0% to 100%, just like normal. And I'm actually going to set this iteration to two times and remove the delay, just like that, so that we can get the full picture here. So if we refresh the page, you can see that it's just normal. It goes from start to finish. And then you have your opposite way, which is reverse. So pretty much what happens here is it goes from 100% to 0%. And the properties aren't flipped. They stay exactly the same. So if you look at this, it goes back in time all the way to its starting position. So the other two, which are a little bit more complicated to understand, are alternate. So just like this. So alternate pretty much means it's going to go forward and then go backward. So it kind of bounced back, you can see there. So it goes from zero to 100, and then in the same animation, well, not the same, it goes from 100 to zero. And then of course, just like with our first two, you have alternate reverse, which does still the alternation, but it starts at 100 instead of at zero. So it's kind of going to start here and then go back to its starting and bounce back to 100. Let's look at that here. You can see it goes up and then it bounces all the way back to its starting position. So there we go. That's pretty much how this whole thing works. And those are the, well, four, uh, or actually here it's five main, um, main functions and, or sorry, properties. But what we're gonna have to do here is summarize all of them because there is a lot to cover and you're not gonna add five animations every time, especially when you have to use all of the different browser support tools and prefixes and it gets really complicated after some time. So what I'm gonna do is use a very cool shorthand that just summarizes everything for us. So we don't even have to use our animation name here. We can just cover it all once in our animation shorthand. So I'm going to do it here, animation. So the first, uh, this takes of course five values. Your first value is going to be your animation name, which is red to black. Your next value is going to be the duration, which is a pretty important one. So we're going to set it the same at four seconds. Your next value is going to be your timing function or your speed. So we're going to set it linear here. And then next is going to be your delay. Now we removed that there, but we do have to put that delay. So I'm just going to say zero. Next, I'm going to put the iteration count, which is two. And finally, the direction, which is alternate, oh, whoops, alternate reverse. Now you can see that does get a little bit long there. So I'm going to leave both of these versions on, in the project file for you to decide for yourself. Now let's refresh the page, see what happens. Oh, whoops, forgot the pixels, uh, sorry, forgot the second value there. Let's refresh, and now you can see that it goes from the back to the start, just like we had here. So, like I said, that shorthand is a little bit, um, hectic to memorize and, you know, learn all of the different values, but there is always Google if you forget the order or anything like that. And what makes this really useful is if you want to add any browser free bit, uh, prefixes like this, you can easily do that and then just copy this over for the different prefixes. So you can go here, 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 and um, put your different prefixes. So I have uh, for Mozilla, we have for Microsoft, so Internet Explorer, and then of course we have our Opera. 
So we have four different prefixes here and five values. For one element, you'd have to put 20 properties just to get this all covered. Now, you can probably see the advantage of using something like this with that shorthand over all of those really clunky properties. All right, so that's pretty much it for animation um, properties or the different types of animations or ways you can manipulate these animations. Of course, there is, once you learn this, there's a lot of power that can go into it. You can create all sorts of different animations, grow styles, and then you can really manipulate them just by using these five values. We didn't, have, we didn't even have to touch the animation to make it look completely different. So that's pretty much it. Now we've covered a lot of features in CSS and in the next section, we're actually going to be going through and styling a website from scratch as a challenge. So you're going to have a challenge to style a website and then the solution is the video I'm going to show you and that's where you're really going to get challenged to use all of the skills you've learned in this section and maybe touch up on some things that you may not have been comfortable with or you may have been fuzzy on. All right, let's move on. So now that you've learned pretty much all of the basic skills or some of the more advanced skills as well in CSS, it's time to move on and start working on a challenge. So pretty much in this challenge, you are given an unstyled website, which by the way, a zip or a packaged file of all of the files that you can use to get started is available for download um, on this Udemy lecture. So what you can do is just go ahead and uh, download that and it's going to prompt you and bring up this page. So you can see we have a lot of uh, stuff to see here. And I'm actually going to zoom out uh, just to get a better view of it. But there's a lot of raw images, raw HTML. There's no, um, there's no styling on it at all. And what your job is to do is to follow these objectives here, uh, given here. Just follow them and obviously don't follow them to the core or to the bone. You can, you know, make any appended, appended, you know, um, Amendment, sorry, um, to to these uh, list of tasks as you like, but pretty much you're just gonna have to style this website from scratch using the techniques that we've learned: coloring, layout, grid, flexbox, animations. Just completely revamp this website. Now, one note is I do have my own solution video posted in uh, on the next lecture, but it is quite long, so you don't have to watch that. Um, but if you want to see how I did it, maybe you want to, you know, review everything or get a little view on some of the topics, you can always watch that, but don't feel forced or um, don't feel like you have to watch that lecture. If you don't want to watch it, all you have to do is click on the bulleted list icon and just tick off the lecture. Just make sure that um, if you want it to mark as complete, just tick off the lecture, make sure that it is finished. Um, and then you don't have to watch it. But other than that, we have this website that is just completely unstyled and we have to go and style it. Now, just to show you, this is what our website here looks like. I'm gonna actually refresh the page so you can see that nice fade in. We have a sidebar, which we styled and created borders for, and we also have a nice image grid. So you can see there that is responsive. So if I go and actually uh, resize the window, you can see there that it is responsive. We have a little bit of image. Uh, changing there and it is just overall a responsive website. So this is how it looks and there you go. You can see we changed the background, we've uh, imported our own custom fonts and we used Flexbox and Grid to set up this website along with animations. You can see a nice transition in color there. So we're going to be doing all of this in the solution video. Again, you don't have to watch it. You can either copy what it looks like on this page or instead you can just go and do whatever you want. Pretty much just take the content I give you and style it however way. And I would encourage you to either go on the Video Lab website or the Q&A section of this course and post what you've got, you know, uh, show off your skills and show off what you can create out of this website. It's really encouraged to, you know, share it with the community and everyone can learn from each other and the skills. So don't feel limited by anything you've learned in this course. If you want to do something very specific that you haven't learned or you forgot how to do, just feel, feel free to use Google. This isn't a test. It's more of a fun activity to see how far you've gotten in CSS. So that's just one thing to keep in mind. All right, I will see you in the solution video. So in this video, we are going to get started and start finishing up this website. We're going to, you know, do all of the skills and use everything we've learned over the course to get this all set up and running. 
All right, let's get started. So the first thing I want to do is just split the page over here with my HTML, and then we're gonna get started straight away. So before we start anything, I think we need to link a CSS style sheet. I'm actually just gonna go ahead and close off our previous site because what's happening here is we have our uh, actual site set up, but we need to start working on our CSS through an external style sheet as we've been doing for the last, um, well, for most of this course. So we're gonna get started with that. I'm gonna use Control or Command N to create a new file, and then I'm going to save it in my CSS folder here, and I'm going to call it style.css. All right, there we go. So the next thing I wanna do is start laying out what we need for the website. And what I like to do before I start is just kind of get myself in the right mind frame by setting out the kind of fonts I wanna use, um, the different colors, everything like that. So what I'm gonna do is just create a comment up here using this notation. Um, I've used it a couple times throughout the course. And what we're gonna do is in here, we're gonna type out all of the stuff we need. So I'm going to say primary font, Oh, whoops. So we have our primary font here. We have our secondary font. And now we have our different colors. So what I like to do for my colors is have my RGB code uh, do whatever here. And then you have the name of the color. So this would be, for example, um, black, pretty much. So we're gonna do that in just a second, but first of all, let's just go and find the fonts that we wanna use. We're not gonna import them yet, but we just wanna look and see what kind of fonts we need. So what I'm gonna do is just choose two here uh, pretty randomly. Again, usually most websites will use at maximum three fonts, but you should use or maybe two fonts, one for headers and one for normal text. So I'm gonna go ahead and use Leto. We used it previously, it's a pretty nice font. And we're also gonna go ahead and for our um, headers, we're gonna use Roboto Condensed. So we have normal Roboto here, but we're gonna use the condensed version. So for the primary font, it's gonna be Leto. And for our um, secondary, which is for pretty much headers and subtitles, things like that, it's going to be Roboto Condensed. All right, there we go. Let's go ahead and check out the website and uh, the color scheme is blue and orange. So if you made your website using a different color scheme, don't worry about it, it doesn't really matter. But what we're gonna do is go ahead and try and find some blues and oranges. So I'm gonna find for each color a main color, so a pretty dark, bold color, and then one that's a little bit lighter and easier on the eyes. So let's start off with blue here. I'm gonna go with quite a um, dark kind of blue, something around here, and I'm gonna copy that in. And I'm going to say dark blue, although it's not really dark, dark blue, but I'm gonna say that and paste in the code. Now let's go with a lighter blue. Now we can always use RGBA color codes, but again, doing this allows us more freedom in the long run when we start working with everything. So let's go ahead and just copy that. And this is gonna be our light blue. Now let's move on to orange. So again, these are very um, opposing colors. That's why I chose them. So we're gonna go again with quite a striking, um, you know, very bold orange. So something like this would be good. So I'm just going to say the bold orange. And again, it doesn't really matter what you give these, uh, your names, as long as you kind of understand them, you can name them whatever you want. And then we're gonna go with a lighter orange. So something around here. Now what I like to do if you're trying to create a lighter color is just look for something on the, uh, this side of the spectrum, closer towards the higher values of the RGB. So if it's low, it's most likely going to be dark. You can see that in effect here. So I'm gonna go ahead and say a light orange is just like that. All right, so we've set up our color schemes now. So we have everything written down and ready to go, but next thing we need to do is actually link the style sheet because we haven't linked it yet. So what I'm gonna do in my head here is create a link tag hit tab, and now we're going to reference it. Just like before, we need to go back one directory. So we use dot dot. Now we're up here in our challenge directory. So previously we were here, now we jump back up to challenge. Now we need to jump back forward one into the CSS directory. And then from there, we need to reference the file, which is style.css. Just like that, refresh the page, and of course, um, nothing's gonna visibly change because we haven't written anything down yet, but 
that's a pretty good first task. So again, none of these have to be in order, as I said in the last video. So we're just going to go ahead and fix up these images because they are quite big. So that's what I'm going to do first. I'm going to go ahead and reference all the images for now. Now we can go and change the classes and do specificity later, but for now I'm just going to specify them and group them all at once. So I'm going to set their width to 400 pixels and their height to 200 pixels. Now, obviously I've kind of created a, um, a, I really don't like absolute values, but for something like this, it is, it's kind of necessary and we can work with, um, the, relativeness or the responsiveness of these images later. So let's go ahead and refresh, see how it looks. So now we know for sure that our images are working fine. And of course you can see how the absolute values are kind of stretching this out. They're not kept in proportion, but for now we don't need to worry about that. So there we go. We've resized our images and now we can see everything a lot more clearly. So we have our images set up. The next thing I want to do is actually set up our page to have two uh, sections. We want to have our content section and we want to have our sidebar. So we have our sidebar section. I'm actually going to create a divider there, our sidebar section and our main section. So that's what we're going to do. So, uh, oh, sorry, our content section. So we have a main uh, div here, which groups everything together. So in my eyes, the best way to do this would be using a grid. So what I'm going to do is select the class main, although now that I'm looking at it, we could probably just use an ID instead. So I'm going to go ahead and change the ID to main. Remember, there's only one main on the whole page, so it's not like we need to use a class. And from here, we'll get started. So the first thing I want to do is set the display type to grid. Right, So this is going to obviously set up our grid. Now, we won't be able to see anything here, pretty obviously, um, but now we're going to start working with it. So pretty much what I have vision for the change is we have our content section, which is taking up the majority of the page, and then we have our post section. So our post section is going to be um, much smaller. It's going to be, well, a sidebar. That's kind of the definition of it, and it's going to take up a small portion on the side of the page. So that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to create two columns. So I'm going to go grid template columns, just like that. And I'm going to set them to 70% and 30%. Now, instead of using auto auto, which would just change them to the exact same height, we're now giving the first column a preference. So it's going to be a little bit bigger than the second one. We refresh and it's working great. Now, what I recommend that you do while you're doing this is always try and go and see how your page looks in different viewpoints. So if you go ahead and you click on inspect anywhere on your page, you can actually go and use your um, Chrome responsiveness kind of thing here to check out how your page would look on different um, devices. So I would recommend using this over resizing the browser because uh, resizing the browser actually shows some inaccuracies. So you can really see how it would look like on your phone or, you know, maybe an iPad or a tablet or something like that without having to actually go on those tablets. So there we go. Now what I'm going to do is go ahead and manipulate this a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and create a grid gap to separate the two. I'm going to say it's about 50 pixels. There we go. And yeah, that's, you can see now that that gap has been created. And if we go ahead and inspect the page, you can see, oh, well, let me go to a phone actually. Uh, you can see that there's a gap there, a clear gap. And at least for now, it's not very, um, evident. But once we start, you know, creating borders and things like that, we could really, uh, see this in a much better way. So there we go. That's great. And it's working fine. So now that we've set up, set that up, I want to do something that we actually should have done at the beginning, which is add classes here, because you can see that although I've added the main classes myself, we still want to be able to, you know, group subtitles together or paragraph text so that when, once we start doing all of the important stuff, like importing images and all sorts of things like that, we want to be able to group all of them or style all of them together at the same time. So that's what I'm going to do here. First thing I want to do is add a class of subtitle to all of the subtitles, which is pretty obvious. Now again, some of them are H1s, some of them are H2s, and all sorts of things like that. So I'm going to go class is subtitle, and here as well, class is subtitle. Now we kind of want all of the subtitles to be relatively the same size, but you can see here that there's actually a mini topic which we want to be smaller. So what I'm going to do is change the class and change this actually to topic subtitle. 
So now we can specify this um, in a more specific way. So instead of having to use the subtitle class, we can actually go and um, talk about this in a different way. So there we go. Now let's go ahead and start looking at some of the other parts of the site. Oh, we actually still have more. Um, you can see we have a lot of stuff here. So what I'm going to do is actually add classes to each of these posts because they are going to be a little bit different considering uh, the grid situation that we have here. So I have six posts. So I'm going to set their class to uh, post title like that. And what I want to do is also set some of the uh, other stuff. So here, for example, our paragraphs or kind of our descriptions in our posts. I want to also create a class for those. So I'm going to say class. I'm going to say post text or post description. It doesn't really matter, whichever one you are comfortable with. And we're going to leave uh, these blank for now. And actually, I'll also go ahead and add a class to these divs. Because remember, the more we can specify, the better our page is going to look. Now, obviously, we're just doing baseline kind of stuff here. If we ever need to specify something in the future, you just go and add a class, uh, a class to that. So there we go. We have everything set up now. We've added our classes. So the next thing I want to do is go ahead and import my different fonts. So firstly, let's go ahead and check out our little documentation, mini documentation there. And we're going to start selecting some of these fonts. So first thing I want to do is download or import in Lato. So I'm going to go and select Lato. And here I'm going to go ahead and just copy that link. Or actually before that, let's go ahead and add some more families so that we can uh, import it all at the same time. So we have our Roboto condensed. There we go. Add that. Now what we're going to do is go ahead. Oh, whoops. Didn't mean to do that. Now we're going to go ahead and select some other um, uh, fonts here, or sorry, weights here. So I'm going to select bold 700. And for Lato, I'm going to also select bold 700. And we're also going to go with a light. So the load time is moderate. It's not going to, you know, be very easy on the site, but it is worth it because these are all the fonts that we need. And without them, the site would look completely different. So let's go ahead and import those. I'm going to go into my index and insert the link right um, below here. So I'm going to do that. Oh, oops, actually, we need to put the style sheet below the um, below the fonts. Remember, because we need the fonts to load in first. So there we go. We have that imported. Now what we're going to do is just go ahead and copy these onto our um, onto here just for reference. Now we are going to, um, you know, put these and specify these in different selectors, obviously. But for now, I just want to leave them in there. So if just in case we forget some of these fallbacks or anything like that, we're just going to keep that there for reference. I'm going to actually put that in our little notepad there. So now let's go ahead and refresh the page. And obviously, we won't see much of a change since we just add uh, added classes. But there we go. We have our kind of hierarchy set up to start working with our website. So let's go ahead and start using these fonts. Now, what I'm going to do first is select everything that has a class of subtitle right here. And what I'm going to do is paste in this font family. Or actually, before we do that, why don't we use the CSS specificity chart? We're going to start by selecting everything that has the class of P, so all paragraphs. So I'm going to do that. Oh, whoops. I'm going to select all classes, uh, all, all paragraph elements, and I'm going to give them that Lato font family. So what this is going to do is style everything. And if we don't like that, what we can do instead is just go and um, change the font family so that, for example, if maybe we want to have a different font, maybe it's a subtitle or some special text, we can just easily specify it without having to go through and, you know, specify each one every single time. So it's a much easier way. So now that we are starting to do this, we can actually start to see flaws here. So for example, we also want the list items to be styled. So what I'm going to do is select all LIs. LIs. And now I'm going to paste in that same font family and refresh. And you can see that that is now working. We have everything uh, set up here. And you can see there's also a little bit of text here. So you can kind of um, start to notice bugs in, uh, you know, maybe HTML that you've written or anything like that. You can easily start to notice bugs in it 
um, once you start styling it. So this is most likely an indentation error. Maybe this text ended up outside the paragraph tag, so I'm going to look for it. Um, it is next to our LIs. And you can see it is right there. So what I'm going to do is just erase that. We start our up, we start up our p tag, and I'm going to create a new one under it just to make things a little cleaner. Now I refresh, and that is working. This is most likely an error with um, indentation, things like that. So now we have our paragraph text, everything like that set up. What I'm going to do is now work on our headers. So I'm going to start off with our h1s. And I'm going to give it that uh, header font family. So I'm going to control X, which is cut or command X if you're on Mac. And I'm going to paste that in, refresh. And you can see that that has worked on our heading here. Now we're going to do it on all of our H2s, which remember if you've uh, kind of looked at the code are our subtitles. Do that. And now those have also been styled. So just by doing that, our page has been completely transformed. We've, you know, imported this custom font and laid out our site in a way that just makes it look a lot better. So that is working fine. So there we go. We have this set up and it is working fine. Now what I want to do is go ahead and start working on some of the other layout features on this page. Once we get into that, we can start tackling coloring and formatting and all the other things after we've used the fonts. So let's get started. What I want to do first is work on our little image grid here. So we don't actually have a proper grid set up, which is what I'm looking to fix in this, um, in this part of the video. So I'm going to go ahead and do that now. I'm going to first of all select it. So uh, we're going to look for the class that we used, which is image grid. So I'm going to go into here and select it using dot image dash grid. And there are many different ways to create a grid these days, but the way I'm going to use to make it a lot easier is just use Flexbox. So we've already used grid once. Flexbox would be a great way to solve this. So let's go ahead and refresh the page. And now you can see that we have created a little Flexbox here. So we have that set up. And obviously you can see that it is pretty badly laid out uh, right after creating the Flexbox. So we're going to tackle that problem now. Now, there are actually only two commands that we need to fix this. We could go and set up our uh, flex grow and shrink to make it uh, just how we like it, but there is an easy workaround to it. The first thing we want to do is turn wrapping on. So we're going to say flex wrap, wrap, and this is just going to move everything onto a new line, which is pretty easy. You can see there that that is working fine now. And when I uh, resize the page or turn it into full width, you can see that that creates a nice three by three image grid. But even if we go into our inspector or change the responsiveness, it also resizes accordingly. The last thing I want to do is change it so that it's not kind of, you know, uh, placed like this. I want to kind of make it in the center of the page. So what I'm going to do is just use the simple justify content property and set that to center. Now we refresh and you can see that this has been realigned to the center of the page. And remember, we do have a sidebar here, which is kind of, uh, you know, giving us the illusion that it's not um, taking up the space it, it actually should be, uh, but it is centered. So it's centered to that 80% of the page. You do need to keep that in mind when you're working with this. Once we start working with coloring, you'll really start to see the page come together. So the last thing I want to do is kind of create a gap between some of these images because they don't look that good when they're just slammed together. You want to create some kind of contrast between colors. So we're going to use a nice special selector to do this. We're going to select every single image inside of the grid instead of having to place new classes on them. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and select dot image grid and then this symbol, which is the greater than symbol and then image. So this is every image inside of our image grid. Open that up and we're just going to give it a margin of 10 pixels. Very easy. We don't need to work with anything else. Refresh the page and that margin has been added. So you can see how that looks a lot better now that we've done it. And it's still responsive when we, you know, change the display, maybe to iPad, anything like that. You can see it is still responsive. It's not uh, changing it. at. It's not changing it at all. So that's really good. So there we go. I'm going to uh, set that up. So now that we have our image grid set up, the last thing I want to work with is this right here. So it says in our objective list, we want to move this image onto the side. So there you could use Flexbox or Grid, but this is a pretty simple scenario. So what I'm going to do instead of doing that is just use a simple float. 
So I'm going to give this an ID since we only need to do this as a one time thing. So I'm going to go ahead and look for that image, give it an ID of image one because it is the first image on the page. You could name this anything you want depending on the purpose of the element, uh, but I'm going to give it that uh, class there. So I'm going to set it as image one, uh, just like this. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and give that a float of right, just like that. And oh, whoops, forgot the um, ID selector there. We refresh the page and now that is working fine. Now, obviously you can see there is a little bit of an issue with the spacing. So we're going to use a quick fix for this and give it a margin of about 15 pixels. So this is going to kind of push everything to the side. And obviously you can see there are still issues with um, positioning and everything, but that's kind of the uh, you know issue with using floats and um, things like that, you can't really control where the spacing is gonna go. So what I'm gonna do to fix this is just increase the height a little bit. So instead of setting a height of 200 pixels, I'm gonna go ahead and set it to maybe 250. Now we're gonna refresh and it's almost there. We're gonna actually uh, use 300 pixels. Now, of course, in a normal scenario, you, you wouldn't have to use this, you know, maybe you would wanna um, use a grid or a flex box like I specified here, but like I said, you can pretty much use whatever creative methods you deem necessary. And this is much easier because, again, there are only three items and using something like a grid or a flex box wouldn't really be practical in this situation. So there we go. We have this, this, and this laid out just perfectly. Now we're going to go ahead and tackle some of the other parts um, of this site. So we have our little image grid here. We have things like this. Let's go ahead and check out our um, uh, item list here. So we do have animations, which we're gonna leave for last. We have our image grid and there we go. So our next task is going to be creating those borders. So we did create our um, post here. So remember we have our post class. So let's go ahead and select that. I'm gonna go ahead and say dot post. So first thing I'm going to do is go ahead and set a border. So this is going to be our first use of the color scheme that we created. So I'm going to say two pixels because we want it that big, uh, solid. And now we're going to go ahead and copy a color from up here. So I'm going to go ahead and use a dark blue, um, just like that. Copy it in, just like an RGB color code. We've done it many times before. Refresh, and we have our borders. Now, obviously there are some issues with margining. So what I'm gonna do is give each of those a margin of about 10 pixels, just like our images. Refresh the page and it's working. So there we go, we have our posts and they are separated. Now, pretty much we do have some internal padding issues, which is um, normal. We'll go ahead and style those in just a second. But first of all, you can start to see our sidebar working here. We have that little grid gap and we have our uh, the start of our second column there. So it's working great. Let's go ahead and start working with our um, margins here. So first thing I wanna select is our post title. So I'm gonna go ahead and say post title. Now you could do this in two ways. Since there's only one H2 in every um, post, you could go and say it like this. Um, or you could use this class that we created. So we're gonna actually just go ahead and use that. So what I'm gonna say is give it a margin on the left of maybe five pixels. And now what that's gonna do is push that inside. And we're gonna have to do the same for our paragraph text. So I'm gonna uh, go ahead and add our post text class here. I must have forgotten it. So we're gonna go on dot post text and give that the same margin. There we go. And now we have everything pushed in. So there are still margining issues there. Uh, you can see that with some of these here. So I'm actually gonna go ahead and also give our text a um, right margin. And again, this is all about experimentation. So go ahead and you know play around with this and see what really works for you. And you can see that now that's really fixed that up and um, we have our post sorted. So there we go, we have everything working. Now let's go ahead and try and work with more of our color scheme because right now uh, it's, it's pretty blank here. So what I'm gonna do is go ahead and just you know use this color scheme in a better way. So firstly, I'm gonna give the page a background. So what I'm gonna do is give um, the whole page, so I'm gonna use the body selector. 
Oh, I'm actually going to do that at the top. So I'm going to use the body selector. Oops, body. And I'm going to give it a color or sorry, background, a background. And I'm going to give it our light blue color, just like that. Oh, whoops, I copied the name as well. You just want to copy the color code, remember. And there we go. Our whole page now has a light blue color. Now, I'm actually going to go ahead and use an RGBA because this isn't light enough. So that's what I meant about flexibility at the beginning of the video. Uh, you can go ahead and change the colors based on your main four here. So I'm going to give this about 0.5, just to make it a little bit lighter on the eyes. You can see that looks a lot better now. So now that we've done that, I'm actually considering changing the border color here. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and find it. And instead of using our blue, I'm going to use a, a bold orange. So it's going to be quite uh, striking on the eyes there. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And there we go. We have our dark orange there. Now what I'm going to do is specify this and select our um, sidebar class. So I'm going to go ahead and do that right below all of these. So I'm going to go dot sidebar and I'm going to give it a background of a light orange. So it's going to create a, ni a nice contrasting effect. Tab in and again, I copied the, um, uh, the name. So I'm going to go ahead and give it that background that we need, which is our light orange. Now I refresh the page and oh, something must oh I, I selected subtitle went on to the wrong uh one so i'm going to paste that in here and there we go now refresh the page and we have that orange background color there so we could you know do some color changes and mess around with these but for now i think this is fine we don't really need to uh, change these in any way uh, for now. So we have our orange background. We've kind of incorporated this color scheme uh, very well. So now we're going to do a little checkup of our um, sections here. So we've laid out our content. We've created our margins or spacing, things like that. Uh, we pretty much have everything set up here except for our um, links and our hovers and our transitions. So this is going to be the final part of the video. We're going to go, we're going to set up our, um, you know, maybe our changes, our uh, resizes, things like that. And then we're going to finish off the solution. It is getting quite long and I want to keep this short. So let's get started. So first thing I'm going to do is work with our um, links. Now we haven't actually added anything to the links. So that's what I'm going to do first of all. Now I kind of left it up to you what you want to add to the links, but what I'm going to do is just go and check out each of these. So I'm going to go click on all of them. And I'm just going, oh, whoops, I went into the href. And here I'm just going to add lorem ipsum and some dummy text like that. So now we're going to use, because I don't really feel like going and adding a, a whole bunch of classes and selectors, I'm going to use our special advanced selector there. So inside of our um, sidebar here, or actually inside of our post, sorry, we're going to go post and then our A or our anchor tag. Now we're going to go ahead and work with these. So I'm going to refresh the page, make sure they're there. So first thing we need to do is give it that left, right margin that we need. Remember because um, to space it out a little bit. Then what I'm going to do is say text decoration none. So pretty much what this is going to do. Oh, oops, didn't mean to add that to the text. What I'm going to do is give it a text decoration uh, property of none. So pretty much what this is going to do is um, change this so that pretty much instead of having uh, this underline, it's just going to be blank text. So this looks a lot cleaner, especially when we go ahead and add our, um, um, our fonts. So I'm going to do that next. So remember we have it added to our paragraphs or LIs, and I think it only makes sense if we add it to our anchor tags um, as well. So I'm going to go ahead and add that. Oops. <clears throat> so I'm going to add that there. And now we have that font. So it's looking great again. So now let's go ahead and start adding some pseudo selectors. So we have our basic colors. Now all of these are already clicked, but pretty much we have our post color. So I'm going to say the post color is going to be our, that dark blue that we had. So this is before it's clicked, remember. So dark blue, copy that in and set this as the main color. 
And now we're going to combine our special selectors with a pseudo selector. Now we haven't actually seen this before, but it's pretty easy to do. You just add it onto the element. And the only thing that we're going to change, remember, is going to be the color of the text there. So I'm going to go and find our light blue. And I'm going to paste that in. So now when we hover over it, it should change the color to a light blue. That's working great. Now let's add our transition. So I'm going to use the transition property. Now I'm not going to use any of the prefixes, um, but if you're using an older browser, you want to support or you want browser support, you should always use this. So now I'm going to specify, specify what I want in the transition. So I'm only going to use the basic properties. So I'm going to say maybe 0.5 seconds hover. Oh, sorry. Uh, 0.5 seconds color. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it. So let's go ahead and refresh. Now we hover over it and it takes 0.5 seconds to change color. Now we could of course go and you know add our special styles for our transition, but I'm only going to use the two basic ones here, which is the time and the property. So we've changed that. Now we have our link color change. The last thing we need or the last two things is the image grow and the page animation sequence, which is going to be our sidebar and our um, uh, our main section here kind of fading in if if it makes sense. So that's what we're going to do here. First thing I'm going to do is go and uh, set the image grow. So what I'm going to do is go somewhere where's my image. I'm selecting my images. If there's none here, I can just go and uh, change that. Now, what I'm going to do is first create our image hover just like that. And I'm, oh yeah, I forgot I put that up at the top here. So I'm going to create my image hover and here I'm going to put in uh, what I need. So I want to, you know, increase the height. So I'm going to say uh, the height is going to be 250 pixels and the width is going to be 500 pixels because we want that two to one aspect ratio. So now we refresh, hover over an image, it becomes bigger. We hover over an image, becomes bigger. So now what we want to do is add that transition property. So we're going to go again, 0.5 seconds, and we're going to add two properties. So we're going to go height and width separated by a comma. Refresh. And of course, it seems to be a little problem there. Oh, whoops, I forgot to um, add that image spelling error. Now we do that and it changes it. Now you can see that there is a little bit of a weird uh, kind of transition effect there. So it increases the width fully and then it increases the height. So what I'm going to do to fix that is um, just use the all property. So what this is going to do is transition the height and the width together. When I refresh, you can see that that styles or moves everything together because pretty much what's happening is it's overriding our um, our width property. It's just setting it instantly and then it's changing the height, which we don't want. So I'm going to set that there. You can see that's working great. So what we're going to do now is go ahead and create that fade in effect that we needed for our content and sidebar. So first thing I want to do is go ahead and select both of them. So I'm going to select our content and I'm going to select our sidebar. And now what I'm going to do is start creating our animation. So the first thing we need to do is create keyframes. So I'm going to go at keyframes and then the name of our animation. Let's just call it fade in for now. So the next thing I need to do is select my uh, the different timestamps I want. So I'm going to use the from and to keywords to do this from and to. Now we're going to use a property that we haven't actually learned before. And hopefully you Googled this and tried to find it um, when doing the challenge. And it's actually called opacity. So this allows us to go from opacity of zero, no percents, no pixels, just straight number to opacity one, just like our RGBA color code. Now we're going to do is just refresh the page. Obviously, we're not going to see anything. Just make sure that everything is still running the same. So I'm going to go ahead and now add our uh, animations to both of these sections or both of these um, block here. Sorry, blocks. So I'm going to go ahead and say the animation name is going to be uh, fade in. And we're also going to set the duration. Remember, we always need a duration to two seconds. Refresh the page. Hopefully this works. And you can see that it now fades in. So there we go. We have our page set up and working. 
we refresh here, we can hover over images, and make them look better, and it just looks really cool overall. So, you know, we pretty much set up this page from scratch, and now we have it all working, we have our fonts, and everything seems to be looking great. All right, let's move on. So, you've reached the end of the course now. So, before we move on, I want to congratulate you. It very few people who end up starting the course make it to the end, and it does take a lot of discipline to learn everything and stick to it throughout the course. So I'd just like to say well done, and it's great that you're here with me. But now that you've learned CSS, what, what is there to do next? I mean, should I just stop and use my skills, or are there other things that I need to learn? So I'm going to give you this helpful guide to maybe get you off your feet and start learning new skills, progressing your careers. So. I'm going to talk about it. Now before we move on, let's just take a second and recap what position uh, we're in right now. So by now you should have pretty good proficiency in both HTML5 and CSS3, which are just the latest versions of the two. So you should know all of the concepts and inner workings uh, behind CSS and how it works, so you can really see how a page is fit together using everything. So box models, flexbox, responsive this, things like that. By now, you should have the skills to style your website in pretty much any way that you want. If you want to make it, you know, a very rustic or vintage feel, or if you want to lay it out in a nice modern design, you should be able to lay out your website with as much creative freedom as you want. But here are some skills that you should learn, learn next. So there are three main front end technologies that are called the big three. So you've already covered two of them, which are HTML and CSS, but the third one, and arguably the most important, is JavaScript. Now, JavaScript is the programming language. It's kind of what makes a website come to life. It gives it that interactive feel, and you can also change things in a much easier way. And without JavaScript, you can't really grab the essence of web development as a whole. You need it to be able to bring your website together and really take it to the next level. So that's one skill that you should definitely learn next if you're planning on continuing. Now, once you've learned JavaScript, then you have to go on and choose what kind of career path you wanna go down. If you're planning to go down a front end route, so you're only developing uh, things that, you know, you're only changing the look and feel of the website on the main mainframe, then you should start learning some more advanced skills um, on either of the big three. So I've let, I've left some examples there. So there are lots of libraries, frameworks, um, that things people have created. So you can go and research some of these. Um, some of them I would recommend for CSS are some of the preprocessors, which are SAS and uh, less, so I would recommend you go and uh, check those out. You can also look at some JavaScript uh, frameworks, so things like React, ES6, and also some other uh, libraries, so Bootstrap, Font Awesome, and Semantic UI. So again, don't take all of those as, you know, you're trying to rack your brain and keep all those in your memory. Just go and do some research on what where you want to go and what kind of skills you should learn next. Those who are looking to go into server architecture, so more backend development, people who are looking to fix up the processing of a website, saving users or, you know, delivering specified content should look into some backend architecture and programming languages. So for example, Django would be one for uh, web development or server development for the web, and it is made or powered by Python. You also have PHP and a JavaScript, which is a uh, JavaScript, uh, web server, which is called Node.js, uh, and then you have some others like Ruby and uh, .NET. So there are so many out there. You can always go and research and you'll find tons of options. So there you go. So that's pretty much it. We've covered everything on CSS. We've talked about grids, flexbox, and pretty much everything there is to know about the basic concepts behind CSS. Well, you can start specializing and going into very specific details, and obviously it's ever expansive. You're never going to have to stop learning. So by the time you're watching this, there could be an entirely new version of CSS out with ton of new features. So never stop learning and always keep, you know, uh, taking up new skills and trying to learn more about the skills that you already have. So that's one thing I would recommend to keep in mind and just continue down this path and you will eventually end up as a web developer that can really create things to his or her creative freedom. All right. Thanks for taking the course.